Chapter Seventeen of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. The Capture of Garia. After having sat for an hour under the shade of some trees and partaken of luncheon, the party again moved forward on their elephants to the jungle. The watchers declared that no sound whatever had been heard during their absence, nor did the discharge of fireworks, which at once recommenced, elicit the slightest response. After this had gone on for half an hour, Charlie, convinced that the animal was dead, dismounted from his elephant. He had with him a heavy double barrel rifle of the Rajas, and Hussein carrying a similar weapon and a curved Tulwar, which was sharpened almost to a razor edge, prepared to follow immediately behind him. These three or four of the most courageous shikaris with cocked guns followed in Hussein's steps. Holding his gun advanced before him in readiness to fire instantly, Charlie entered the jungle at the point where the tiger had retreated into it. Drops of blood spotted the grass and the bent and twisted brushwood showed the path that the tiger had taken. Charlie moved as noiselessly as possible. The path led straight forward towards the rocks behind, but it was not until within four or five yards of this that any sound of the tiger could be seen. Then the brushes were burst asunder, and the great yellow body hurled itself forward upon Charlie. The attack was so sudden and instantaneous that the latter had not even time to raise his rifle to his shoulder. Almost instinctively, however, he discharged both of the barrels, but was at the same moment hurled to the ground where he lay crushed down by the weight of the tiger, whose hot breath he could feel on his face. He closed his eyes, only to open them again at the sound of a heavy blow while a deluge of hot blood flowed over him. He heard Husan's voice and then became insensible. When he recovered, he found himself lying with his head supported by Hussein outside the jungle. Is he dead? he asked faintly. He is dead, Sahib, Hussein replied. Let the Sahib drink some brandy and he will be strong again. Charlie drank some brandy and water, which Hussein held to his lips. Then the latter raised him to his feet Charlie felt his limbs and his ribs. He was bruised all over, but otherwise unhurt. The blood which covered him having flowed from the tiger. One of the balls which he had fired had entered the tiger's neck. The other had broken one of its forelegs, and Charlie had been knocked down by the weight of the animal, not by the blow of its formidable paw. Hossein had sprung forward on the instant, and with one blow of his sharp tulwar had shorn clear through skin and muscle and bone and had almost severed the tiger's head from its body it was the weight upon him which had crushed charlie into a state of insensibility here he had lain for four or five minutes before hussein could get the frightened natives to return and assist him to lift the great carcass from his master's body upon examination it was found that two of the three bullets first fire to take an effect. One had broken the tiger's shoulder and lodged in his body. The other had struck him fairly on the chest and had passed within an inch or two of his heart. I thought, Ramajee Punt said, as he viewed the body, that one of his legs must have been rendered useless. That was why he lay quiet so long, in spite of our efforts to turn him out. Charlie was too much hurt to walk, and a litter was speedily formed, and he was carried back to the camp where his arrival in that state excited the most lively lamentations on the part of Tim. The next morning he was much recovered and was able, in the cool of the evening, to take his place in the howdah and to return to the camp before Garia. A few days later, the fleet made its appearance off the town and the same evening Tulagi and Giria rode up to Ramajay Punt's camp. Charlie was present at the interview, at which Angria endeavored to prevail on Ramajay Punt, 
and Charlie to accept a large ransom for his fort, offering them each great presents, if they would do their utmost to prevail on Admiral Watson and Colonel Clive to agree to accept it. Charlie said at once that he was sure it was useless, that the English had now made a great effort to put a stop to the ravages which he and his father before him had for so many years inflicted upon their commerce, and that he was sure that nothing short of the total destruction of the fort and fleet would satisfy them. The meeting then broke up and charlie supposing that angria would return immediately went back to his tent where he directed hossein at once to mingle with the men who had accompanied angria and to find out anything that he could concerning the state of things in the fort hussein returned an hour later sahib he said ramajee punt is thinking of cheating the english he is keeping angria a prisoner he says that he came into his camp without asking for his safe conduct and that therefore he shall detain him but this is not all angria has left his brother in command of the fort and ramajee by threatening angria with instant execution has induced him to send an order to deliver the fort at once to him ramajee wants you see sahib to get all the plunder of the fort for himself and his mahrattas this is very serious charlie said and i must let the admiral know at once what is taking place when it became dark charlie with tim and hussein made his way through the mahratta camp down to the shore of the river here were numbers of boats hauled up on the sand one of the lightest of these was soon got into the water and rowed gently out into the force of the stream then the oars were shipped and they lay down perfectly quiet in the boat and drifted past the fort without being observed when they once gained the open sea the oars were placed in the rowlocks and half an hour's rowing brought them alongside the fleet charlie was soon on board the flagship and informed the admiral and colonel clive what hossein had heard it was at once resolved to attack upon the following day the two officers did not think it was likely that the pirates would even in obedience to their chief's orders surrender the place until it had been battered by the fleet the next morning the fort was summoned to surrender no answer was received and as soon as the sea breeze set in in the afternoon the fleet weighed anchor and proceeded towards the mouth of the river the men of war were in line on the side nearest to the fort to protect the mortar vessel and smaller ships from its fire passing the point of the promontory they stood into the river and anchored at a distance of fifty yards from the north face of the fort a gun from the admiral's ship gave the signal and a hundred and fifty pieces of cannon at once opened fire while the mortar vessels threw shell into the fort and town in ten minutes after the fire began a shell fell into one of angria's large ships and set her on fire the flames soon spread to the others fastened together on either side of her and in less than an hour this fleet which had for fifty years been the terror of the malabar coast was utterly destroyed in the meantime the fleet kept up their fire with the greatest vigor upon the enemy's works and before nightfall the enemy fire was completely silenced no white flag however was hung up and the admiral had little doubt that it was intended to surrender the place to the maharatas as soon therefore as it became quite dark colonel clive landed with the troops and took up a position between the mahrattas and the fort where to his great disappointment and disgust rama j punt found him in the morning the admiral again summoned the fort declaring that he would renew the attack and give no quarter unless it was surrendered immediately the governor sent back to beg the admiral to cease from hostilities until next day as he was only waiting for orders from angria to surrender angria declared that he had already sent 
the orders. At four in the afternoon, therefore, the bombardment was renewed, and in less than half an hour a white flag appeared above the wall. As, however, the garrison made no further sign of surrender, and refused to admit Colonel Clive with his troops when he advanced to take possession, the bombardment was again renewed, more vigorously than ever. The enemy was unable to support the violence of the fire and soon shouted over the walls to Clive that they surrender and he might enter and take possession. He at once marched in and the pirates laid down their arms and surrendered themselves prisoners. It was found that a great part of the fortifications had been destroyed by the fire, but a resolute garrison might have held the fort itself against a long siege. Two hundred guns fell into the hands of the captors, together with great quantities of ammunition and stores of all kinds. The money and effects amounted to a hundred and twenty thousand pounds, which was divided among the captors. The rest of Angria's fleet, among them two large ships on the stocks, were destroyed. Ramage Punt sent parties of his troops to attack the other forts held by the pirates. These, however, surrendered without resistance, and thus the whole country, which the pirates had held for seventy years, fell again into the hands of the Mahrattas, from whom they had wrested it. Admiral Watson and the fleet then returned to Bombay, in order to repair the damages which had been inflicted upon them during the bombardment. There were great rejoicings upon their arrival there, the joy of the inhabitants, both European and native, being immense at the destruction of the formidable private colonies, which had so long ravaged the seas. After the repairs were completed, the fleet with the troops which had formed the expedition were to sail for Madras. Charlie, however, did not wait for this, but finding that one of the company's ships would sail in the course of a few days after the return to Bombay, he obtained leave from Colonel Clyde to take a passage in her and to proceed immediately to Madras. Tim and Hussein, of course, accompanied him, and the voyage down the west coast of India and round Ceylon was performed without any marked incidents. When within but a few hours of Madras, the barometer fell rapidly. Great clouds rose up upon the horizon, and the captain ordered all hands aloft to reduce sail. We are in, he said, for a furious tempest. It is the breaking up of the monsoon. It is a fortnight earlier than usual. I had hoped that we should have got safely up the Hoogly before it began. Half an hour later, the hurricane struck them, and for the next three days, the tempest was terrible. Great waves swept over the ships, and every time that the captain attempted to show a rag of canvas, it was blown from the boat ropes. The ship, however, was a stout one and weathered the gale. Upon the fourth morning, the passengers, who had, during the tempest, been battened below, came on deck. The sky was bright and clear, and the waves were fast going down. A good deal of sail was already set, and the hands were at work to repair the damages. Well, Captain Charlie said to that officer, I congratulate you on the behavior of the ship. It has been a tremendous gale, and she has weathered it stoutly. Yes, Captain Marriott, she has done well. I have only once or twice been out in so severe a storm since I came to sea. And where are we now? Charlie asked, looking round the horizon. When shall we be at Madras? Well, the captain said with a smile, I am afraid that you must give up all idea of seeing Madras just at present. We have been blown right up the bay and are only a few hours' sail from the mouth of the Hoogly. I have a far larger cargo for that place than the Madras, and it would be a pure waste of time for me to put back now. I intend, therefore, to go to Calcutta first, discharge and fill up there, and then touch at Madras on my way back. I suppose it makes no great difference to you. No, indeed, Charlie said, and I am by no means sorry of the opportunity of getting a glimpse of Calcutta. 
which I might never otherwise have done. I believe things are pretty quiet at the Madras at present, and I have been so long away now that a month or two sooner or later will make but little difference. A few hours later, Charlie noticed a change in the color of the sea, the mud-stained water of the Hooghly discoloring the Bay of Bengal, far out from its mouth. The voyage up was a tedious one. At times the wind fell altogether, and, unable to stem the stream, the ship lay for days at anchor, the yellow tide running swiftly by it. The saints preserve us, Mr. Charles. Did you ever see the like? Tim Kelly exclaimed. There's another dead body floating down towards us, and that is the eighth I've seen this morning. Are the poor heathen creatures all committing suicide together? Not at all, Tim, Charlie said. The Hooghly is one of the sacred rivers of India, and the people on its banks insist instead of burying their dead put them into the river and let them drift away i calls it a bastardly custom your honor and i wonder it is allowed one got a thought the cable this morning and it frightened me right out of my senses when i happened to look over the bow and saw the thing bobbing up and down in the water this is tedious work, Your Honor, and I'll be glad when we're at the end of the voyage. I shall be glad, too, Tim. We have been a fortnight in the river already, but I think there is a breeze getting up, and there is the captain on deck giving orders. In a few minutes, the ship was under way again, and the same night dropped her anchor in the stream abreast of calcutta charlie shortly after landed and proceeded to the company's offices reported his arrival and that of the four sepoy officers who seen who was not in the company's service was with him merely in the character of a surgeon as the news of the share charlie had had in the captain of suwandrug had reached calcutta he was well received and one of the leading merchants of the town. Mr. Haynes, who happened to be pressed when Charlie called upon the governor, at once invited him warmly to take up his residence with him during his stay. Hospitality in India was profuse and general hotels were unknown and a stranger was always treated as a honorable guest. Charlie, therefore, had no hesitation whatever in accepting the offer. The four native officers were quartered in the barracks and returning on board ship, Charlie followed by Tim and Hossein, and by some coolies bearing his luggage, was soon on his way to the bungalow of Mr. Haynes. On his way, he was surprised at the number and size of the dwellings of the merchants and officials which offered a very strong contrast to the quiet and unpretending buildings round the fort of madras the house of mr haynes was a large one and stood in a large and carefully kept garden mr haynes received him at the door and at once led him to his room which was spacious cool and airy Outside was a wide veranda upon which, in accordance with the customs of the country, servants would sleep. Here is your bathroom, Mr. Haynes said, pointing to an adjoining room. I think you will find everything ready. We dine in half an hour. Charlie was soon in his bath, a luxury which in India every European indulged in at least twice a day. Then in his cool white suit, which at that time formed the regular evening dress, he found his way to the drawing room. Here he was introduced to the merchant's wife and to his daughter, a girl of some thirteen years old, as well as to several guests who had arrived for dinner. The meal was a pleasant one, and Charlie, after being cooped up for some weeks on board ship, enjoyed it much. A dinner in India is, to one unaccustomed to it, a striking sight. The puka, waving slowly, to and fro overhead drives the cool air which comes in through the open window down into the table 
Each guest brings his own servant, who, either in white or colored robes, and in turbans of many different hues and shapes, according to the wearer's caste, stands behind his master's chair. The light is always a soft one, and the table richly garnished with bright colored tropical flowers. Charlie was the hero of the hour and was asked many questions concerning the capture of Suwarnadrug, drug and also about the defense of ambor which though now an old story had excited the greatest interest through india presently however the conversation turned to local topics and charlie learned from the anxious looks and earnest tones of the speakers that the situation was considered a very serious one. He asked but few questions then, but after the guests had retired, Mr. Haynes proposed to him to smoke one more quiet cigar in the cool of the veranda before retiring to bed. He took the opportunity of asking his hosts to explain to him the situation with which he had no previous acquaintance. Up to the death of Alec Curdie, the old viceroy of Bengal, on the ninth April, we were on good terms with our native neighbors. Calcutta had not been, like Madras, threatened by the rivalry of a European neighbor. The French and Dutch, indeed, have both trading stations like our own, but none of us had taken part in native affairs. Alec Curdie had been all-powerful. There have been no native troubles, and therefore no reason for our interference. We have just gone on, as for many years previously, as a purely trading company. At his death, he was succeeded in the government by Suraja Dowla, his grandson. I suppose in all India there is no prince with a worse reputation than this young scoundrel has gained for himself for profligacy and cruelty. He is constantly drunk and is surrounded by a crew and reprobates, as wicked as himself. At the death of Ali Kurdi, Sokut Jung, another grandson of Ali, set up in opposition to him and the new viceroy raised a large force to march against him, as the reputation of the Sukkot Jung was as infamous as that of his cousin. It would have made little difference to us which of the two obtained the mastery. Within the last few days, however, circumstances have occurred which have completely altered the situation the town of Dhaka was, about a year ago, placed under the governorship of Raja Ragbulibub, a Hindu officer in high favor with Ali Kurdi. His predecessor had been assassinated and plundered by order of, of Suraja Daula, and when he heard of the ascension of that prince, he determined at once to fly, as he knew that his great wealth would speedily cause him to be marked out as a victim. He therefore obtained a letter of recommendation from Mr. Watts, the agent of the company at their factory at Kosim Bazaar, and sent his son Kissendas with a large retinue, his family and treasures, to Calcutta. Two or three days after his exception, Suraja Dawla dispatched a letter to Mr. Drake, our governor, ordering him to surrender Kissendas and the treasures immediately. The man whom he sent down arrived in a small boat without any state or retinue, and Mr. Drake, believing that he was an impostor, paid no attention to the demand but expelled him from the settlement. Two days ago, a letter came from the Viceroy, or as we generally call him, the Nabob, to Mr. Drake, ordering him instantly to demolish all the fortifications, which he understood he had been erecting. Mr. Drake had sent word back, assuring the Nabob that he is erecting no new fortifications, but simply executing some repairs in the ramparts facing the river in view of the expected war between England and France. That is all that has been done at present, 
but seeing the passionate and overbearing disposition of this young scoundrel there is no saying what will come of it but how do we stand here charlie asked what are the means of defence supposing he should take it into his head to march with the army which he has raised to fight against his cousin to the attack of calcutta that is all that has been done at present but seeing the passionate and overbearing disposition of this young scoundrel there is no saying what will come of it but how do we stand here charlie asked what are the means of defence supposing he should take it into his head to march with the army nothing could be worse than our position mr haines said ever since the capture of madras nine years ago the directors have been sending out orders that this place should be put in a state of defence during the fifty years which have passed peacefully here the fortification have been entirely neglected instead of the space around them being kept clear warehouses have been built close against them and the fort is wholly unable to resist any attack the authorities of the company here have done absolutely nothing to carry out the orders from home they think i am sorry to say only of making money with their own trading ventures and although several petitions have been presented to them by the merchants here urging upon them the dangers which might arise at the death of ali they have taken no steps whatever and indeed have treated all warnings with scorn and derision what force have we here charlie asked only a hundred and seventy-four men of whom the greater portion are natives what sort of man is your commander we have no means of knowing mr haines said his name is minch chin he is a great friend of the governor's and has certainly done nothing to counteract the apathy of the authorities altogether to my mind things look as bad as they possibly can a week later on the sixteenth of june a messenger arrived with news that the nabob with fifty thousand men was advancing against the town and that in two days he would appear before it all was confusion and alarm charlie at once proceeded to the fort and placed his services at the disposal of captain minchin he found that officer fussy and unalarmed if i might be permitted to advise charlie said every available man in town should be set to work at once pulling down all the buildings around the walls it would be clearly impossible to defend the place when the ramparts are on all sides commanded by the musketry fire of surrounding buildings i know what my duty is sir captain minchin said and do not require to be taught it by so very young an officer as yourself very well sir charlie replied calmly i have seen a great deal of service and have taken part in the defence of two besieged towns while you i believe have never seen a shot fired however as you are in command you will of course take what steps you think fit but i warn you that unless these buildings are destroyed the fort cannot resist an assault for twenty-four hours then bowing quietly he retired and returned to mr haines's house that gentleman was absent having gone to the governor's he did not come back until late in the evening charlie passed the time in endeavouring to cheer up mrs haines and her daughter assuring them that if the worst came to the worst there could be no difficulty in their getting on board ship mrs haines was a woman of much common sense and presence of mind and under the influence of charlie's quiet chat she speedily recovered her tranquillity her daughter ada who was a very bright and pretty girl was even sooner at her ease and they were laughing and chatting brightly when mr haines arrived he looked fagged and dispirited drake is a fool he said just as hitherto he has scoffed at all thought of danger now he is 
prostrated at the news that danger is at hand he can decide on nothing at one moment he talks of sending messengers to suraja dowla to offer to pay any sum he may demand in order to induce him to retire the next he talks of defending the fort to the last we can get him to give no orders to decide on nothing and the other officials are equally impotent and imbecile on the eighteenth the army of the nabob approached captain minchin took his guns and troops a considerable distance beyond the walls and opened fire upon the enemy charlie enraged and disgusted at the folly of conduct which could only lead to defeat marched with them as a simple volunteer the result was what he had anticipated the enemy opened fire with an immensely superior force of artillery his infantry advanced and clouds of horsemen swept around the flanks and menaced the retreat in a very few minutes captain minchin gave the order to retire and abandoning the guns the english force retreated in all haste to the town charlie had on setting out told mr haines what was certain to occur and had implored him to send all his valuables at once on board ship and to retire instantly into the fort upon the arrival of the troops at the gate they found it almost blocked with the throng of frightened europeans and natives flying from their houses beyond it to its protection scarcely were all the fugitives within and the gates closed when the guns of suraja dowla opened upon the fort and his infantry taking possession of the houses around it began a galling musketry fire upon the ramparts captain michigan remained closeted with the governor and charlie finding the troops bewildered and dismayed without leading or orders assumed the command placed them upon the walls and kept up a vigorous musketry fire in reply to that of the enemy within all was confusion and dismay in every spot sheltered from the enemy's fire europeans and natives were huddled together there was neither head nor direction with nightfall the fire ceased but still mr drake and captain minchigan were undecided what steps to take at two o'clock in the morning they summoned a council of war at which charlie was present and it was decided that the women and children should at once be sent on board they should have been no difficulty in carrying this into effect a large number of merchantmen were lying in the stream opposite the fort capable of conveying away in safety the whole of the occupants two of the members of the council had early in the evening been dispatched on board ship to make arrangements for the boats being sent on shore but these cowardly wrenches instead of doing so ordered the ships to raise their anchors and drop two miles further down the stream the boats however were set up the river to the fort the same helpless imbecility which had characterized every movement again showed itself there was no attempt whatever at establishing anything like order or method the water gate was opened and a wild rush of men women and children took place down to the boats charlie was on duty on the walls he had already said good-bye to mrs haines and her daughter and though he heard shouts and screams coming from the water gate he had no idea what had taken place until mr haines joined him have you seen them safely off charlie asked my wife is gone mr haines my daughter is still here there has been a terrible scene of confusion although the boats were amply sufficient to carry all no steps whatever has been taken to secure order the consequence was there was a wild rush 
Women and children were knocked down and trampled upon. They leaped into the boats in such wild haste that several of these were capsized and numbers of people drowned. I kept close to my wife and child till we reached the side of the stream. I managed to get my wife into a boat, and then a rush of people separated me from my daughter, and before I could find her again, the remaining boats had all pushed off. Many of the men had gone with them, and among them, I am ashamed to say, several of the officers. However, I trust the boats will come up again tomorrow and take away the rest. Two have remained, a guard having been placed over them, and I hope to get Ada off to her mother in the morning. Towards morning, Mr. Haynes again joined Charlie. What do you think, he said, those cowardly villains, Drake and Minchin, have taken the two boats and gone off on board ship? Impossible, Charlie exclaimed. It is too true, Mr. Haynes said. The names of these cowards should be held as infamous as long as the English nation exists. Come now. We are just assembling to choose a commander. Mr. Peaks is the senior agent, but I think we shall elect Mr. Holwell, who is an energetic and vigorous man. It was as Mr. Haynes had expected. Mr. Holwell was elected and at once took the lead. He immediately assigned to Charlie, the commander of the troops. Little was done at the council, beyond speaker after speaker, raising to express his excreation of the conduct of the governor and Captain Minchin. With daybreak, the enemy's fire recommenced. All day long, Charlie hurried from post to post, encouraging his men and aiding in working the guns. Two or three times when the enemy showed in masses as if intending to assault, the fire of the artillery drove them back, and up to nightfall they had gained but little success. The civilians as well as the soldiers had done their duty nobly, but the loss had been heavy. From the fire of the enemy sharpshooters in the surrounding buildings, and it was evident that, however gallant a defense, the fort could not much longer resist. All day long, signals had been kept flying for the fleet, two miles below, to come up to the fort. But although these could be plainly seen, not a ship weighed anchor. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of With Clive in India」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman The Black Hole of Calcutta When the fire of the enemy slackened, Charlie went to Mr. Howell. It is impossible, sir, he said, that the fort can hold out, for in another three or four days the whole of the garrison will be killed. The only hope of safety is for the ships to come up and remove the garrison, which they can do without the slightest damage to themselves. If you will allow me, sir, I will swim down to the ships and represent our situation. Cowardly and inhuman as Mr. Drake has proved himself, he can hardly refuse to give orders for the fleet to move. I don't know, said Mr. Holwell. After the way in which he has behaved, there are no depths of infamy of which I believe him incapable. But you are my right hand here. Supposing Mr. Drake refuses, you could not return. I will come back, sir, Charlie answered. I will, if there be no other way. Make my way along by the river bank. It is comparatively free of the enemy, as our guns commanded. If you will place Mr. Haynes at the corner bastion with a rope, he will recognize my voice, and I can regain the fort. Mr. Holwell consented, and as soon as it was perfectly dark, Charlie issued out at the water gate, took off his coat, waistcoat, and boots, and entered the stream. The current was slack, but he had no difficulty in keeping himself afloat until he saw close ahead of him the lights of the ships. He hailed that 
nearest him. A rope was thrown, and he was soon on board. Upon stating who he was, a boat was at once lowered, and he was taken to the ship upon which Mr. Drake and Captain Minchin had taken refuge. Upon saying that he was the bearer of a message from the gentleman now commanding the fort, he was conducted to the cabin, where Mr. Drake and Captain Minchin, having finished their dinner, were sitting comfortably over their wine with Captain Young, the senior captain of the company's ships there. I have come, sir, Charlie said to Mr. Drake, for Mr. Howell, who has, in your absence, been elected to the command of the fort. He bids me tell you that our losses have already been very heavy, and that it is impossible that the fort can hold out for more than twenty-four hours longer. He begs you, therefore, to order up the ships tonight, in order that the garrison may embark. It is quite out of the question, Mr. Drake said coldly. Quite. It would be extremely dangerous. You agree with me, Captain Young, that it would be most dangerous. I consider that it would be dangerous, Captain Young said. And you call yourself, Charlie exclaimed indignantly, a British sailor. You talk of danger and would desert a thousand men, women, and children, including two hundred of your own countrymen, and leave them at the mercy of an enemy. You forget whom you are speaking to, sir, Mr. Jake said angrily. I forget nothing, sir, Charlie replied, trying to speak calmly. Then, sir, Mr. Howell has charged me that if, however, he could not believe for a moment to be possible, you refuse to move up the ships to receive the garrison on board, then you would at least order all the boats up, as these would be amply sufficient to carry them away. Even in the daytime there would be no danger for the ships, and at night at least boats might come up without being exposed to any risk whatever. I shall certainly do nothing of the sort, Mr. Drake said. The danger is even greater for the boats than for the ships. And am I, sir, to return to the garrison of that fort with the news that you utterly desert them, that you intend to remain quietly here while they are sacrificed before your eyes? Is it possible that you are capable of such infamy as this? Infamy! exclaimed the three men, rising to their feet. I place you in arrest at once for your insolence, Mr. Drake said. I despise your arrest as I do yourself. I do not believe it possible, Charlie said, at last giving vent to his anger and scorn. And England will not believe that three Englishmen, so cowardly, so infamous as yourselves, are to be found. As for you, Captain Minchin, if ever... After this, I come across you, I will flog you publicly first and shoot you afterwards like a dog, if you dare to meet me. As for you, Captain Young, you will be doomed to infamy by the contempt and loathing which Englishmen will feel when this deed is known. Cowards, base, infamous cowards, Charlie stepped back to go. Seize him, Mr. Drake said, himself rushing forward. Charlie drew back a step, and then with all his strength, smote the governor between the eyes, and he fell in a heap beneath the table. Then Charlie grasped a decanter. Now, he said, if either of you hounds move a finger, I'll brain you. The two officers stood paralyzed. Charlie walked to the door and sprung up the cabin stairs, and as he did so, heard shouts for assistance from behind. He gained the deck, walked quietly to the bulwark, and placing his hand upon it, sprang over the side into the river. He swam to the shore and, climbing up the bank, made his way along it back to the fort, where he arrived without any misadventure. A fury of indignation seized all in the fort when the result of Charlie's mission became known. With daybreak, the attack recommenced, but the garrison all day bravely repulsed every attempt of the enemy to gain a footing. The fire from the houses was, however, so severe that by nightfall nearly half the garrison were killed or wounded. All day the signals to the fleet were kept flying, but not a ship moved. All night an anxious watch was kept in hopes that at the last moment some returning feeling of shame might induce the re recreants to send up the boats of the ships, but the night passed without a movement on the river, and in the morning the fleet was seen still lying at anchor. 
The enemy recommenced the attack, even more vigorously than before. The men fell fast, and to Charlie's great grief, his friend Mr. Haines was shot by a bullet as he was standing next to him. Charlie anxiously knelt beside him. It's all over with me, he murmured. Poor little lady, do all you can for her, Mariette. God knows what fate is in store for her. I will protect her with my life, sir, Charlie said earnestly. Mr. Haynes pressed his hand feebly in a token of gratitude, and two or three minutes later breathed his last. By midday, the loss had been so heavy that the men could no longer stand to their guns. Many of the European soldiers broke open the spirit stores and soon drank to intoxication. After a consultation with his officers, Mr. Holwell agreed that further resistance was hopeless. The flag of truce was therefore hoisted, and one of the officers at once started for the nabob's camp with instructions to make the best terms he could for the garrison. When the gates were opened, the enemy seized the opportunity, rushed in in great numbers, and as resistance was impossible, the garrison laid down their arms. Charlie at once hurried to the spot where Ada and the only other European lady who had not escaped were anxiously awaiting news. Both were exhausted with weeping. Where is Papa, Captain Marriott? Ada asked. Charlie knew that the poor girl would need all her strength for what she might have to undergo, and at once resolved that, for the present at least, it would be better that she could be in ignorance of the fate of her father. He therefore said that, for the present, Mr. Haynes was unable to come and had asked him to look after her. It was not until five o'clock that the nabob entered the fort. He was furious at hearing that only five lakhs of rupees had been found in the treasury as he had expected to become possessed of a vastly larger sum. Kissendas, the first cause of the present calamities, was brought before him, but the capricious tyrant, contrary to expectations, received him courteously and told him he might return to Dhaka. The whole of the Eurasians, or half the castes and natives found in the fort, were also allowed to return to their homes. Mr. Holwell was then sent for, and after the nabob had expressed his resentment at the small amount found in the treasury, he was dismissed, the nabob assuring him of his protection. Mr. Holwell returned to his English companions, who, 146 in number, including the two ladies, were drawn up under the veranda in front of the prison. The nabob then returned to his camp. Some native officers went in search of some building where the prisoners could be confined, but every room in the fort had already been taken possession of by the nabob's soldiers and officers. At eight o'clock they returned with the news that they could find no place vacant, and the officer in command at once ordered the prisoners into a small room used as a guard room for insubordinate soldiers, eighteen feet square in vain implored the officer to allow some of them to be confined in an adjoining cell the wretch was deaf to their entreaties he ordered his soldiers to charge the prisoners and these with blows of the butt ends of the musket and prods of the bayonets were driven into the narrow cell tim kelly had kept close to his master during the preceding days the whole of the four native officers who had so distinguished themselves under Charlie, would kill during the siege. Hosan, who would fain have shared his master's fortune, was forcibly torn from him when the English prisoners were separated from the natives. The day had been unusually hot. The night was close and sultry, and the arched veranda outside further hindered the circulation of the air. This was still heavy with the fumes of powder, creating an intolerable thirst. Scarcely were the prisoners driven into their narrow cell, where, even standing wedged closely together, there was barely room for them. Then cries for water were raised. Tim, my boy, Charlie said to his companion, we may say goodbye to each other now, for I doubt if one will be alive when the door is opened in the morning. On entering 
Charlie, always keeping Ada Hines by his side, had taken his place against the wall farthest from the window, which was closed with iron bars. I think, Your Honor, Tim said, that if we could get nearer to the window, we might breathe a little more easy. Aye, Tim, but there will be a fight for life round that window before long. You and I might hold our own if we could get there, though it would be no easy matter where all are struggling for life. But this poor little girl would be crushed to death. Besides, I believe that what chance there is, faint as it may be, is greater for us here than there. The rush towards the window, which is beginning already, as you see, will grow greater and greater, and the more men struggle and strive, the more air they require. Let us remain where we are. Strip off your coat and waistcoat, and breathe as quietly and easy as you can. Every hour the crowd will thin, and we may yet hold on till morning. This conversation had been held in a low voice. Charlie then turned to the girl. How are you feeling, Ader? He asked cheerfully. It's hot, isn't it? It is dreadful, the girl panted. And I seem choking from want of air. And, oh, Captain Marriott, I am so thirsty. It is hot, my dear, terribly hot. But we must make the best of it, and I hope in a few days you will join your mamma on board ship. That will be pleasant, won't it? Where is Papa, the girl will? I don't know where he is now, my child. At any rate, we must feel very glad that he's not shut up in here with us. Now take your bonnet off and your shawl, undo the hooks of your dress, and loosen everything you can. We must be as quiet and cheerful as possible. I'm afraid, Ada, we have a bad time before us tonight. But try to keep cheerful and quiet, and above all, dear, pray God to give you strength to carry you through it and to restore you safe to your mamma in a few days. As time went on, the scene in the dungeon became terrible. Shouts, oaths, cries of all kinds rose in the air. Round the window, men fought like wild beasts, tearing each other down or clinging to the bars for dear life, for a breath of the air without. Panting, struggling, crying, men sank exhausted upon the floor, and the last remnants of life were trodden out of them by those who surged forward to get near the window. In vain, Mr. Howell implored them to keep quiet for their own sake. His voice was lost in the terrible den. Men a few hours ago rich and respected matrons now fought like maddened beats for a breath of fresh air. In vain, those at the window screamed to the gods without, imploring them to bring water. Their prayers and entreaties were replied to only with brutal scoffs. Several times Charlie and Tim, standing together against the wall behind, where there was now room to move, lifted Ada between them and sat her on their shoulders, in order that, raised above the crowd, she might breathe more freely. Each time, after sitting there for a while, the poor girl begged to come down again. The sight of the terrible struggle ever going on at the window being too much for her, and when released, leaning against Charlie, supported by his arm and with her head against his shoulder and her hands over her ears, to shut out the dreadful sound which filled the cell. Hour passed after hour. There were more room now, for already half the inmates of the place had succumbed. The noises, too, had lessened, for no longer could the parched lips and throats utter articulate sounds. Charlie and Tim, strong men as they were, leaned utterly exhausted against the wall, bathed in perspiration, gasping for air. Half the night may be gone, Charlie said, and I think, with God's help, we shall live through it. The numbers are lessening fast, and every one who goes leaves more air for the rest of us. Cheer up, Ada, dear. It will not be very long till morning. I think I shall die soon, the girl gasped. I shall never see Papa or Mama again. You have been very kind, Captain Marriott, but it is no use. Oh, but it is of use, Charlie said cheerfully. I don't mean to let you die at all, but to hand you over to your Mama, safe and sound. There, lay your head against me, dear. Say your prayers and try to go off to sleep. 
Presently, however, Ada's figure drooped more and more until her whole weight leaned upon Charlie's arm. She has fainted, Tim, he said. Help me to raise her well in my arms and lay her head on my shoulder. That's right. Now you'll find a shawl somewhere under my feet. Hold it up and make a fan out of it. Now try to send some of the air into her face. By this time, not more than fifty out of the hundred and forty-six who entered the cell were alive. Suddenly a scream of joy from those near the window proclaimed that a native was approaching with some water. The struggle at the window was fiercer than ever. The bowl was too wide to pass through the bars, and the water was being spilt in Maine. Each man who strove to get his face far enough through to touch the bowl being torn back by his eager comrades behind. Tim, Charlie said, you are now much stronger than most of them. They are faint from their struggle. Make a charge to the window, take that little shawl and dip it in the bowl or whatever they have there, and then fight your way back with it. I will do it, Your Honor, said Tim, and he rushed into the struggling group. Weak as he was from exhaustion and thirst, he was as a giant to most of the poor wrenches who had been struggling and crying all night, and in spite of their cries and curses, he broke through them and forced his way to the window. The man with the bowl was on the point of turning away, the water being spilt in the vain attempts of those within to obtain it. By the light of the fire which the guard had lit without, Tim saw his face. Hussein, he explained, more water, for God's sake. The master's alive yet. Hossein at once withdrew, but soon again approached with the bowl. The officer in charge angrily ordered him to draw back. Let the infidel dogs howl, he said. They shall have no more. Regardless of the order, Hussein ran to the window, and Tim thrust the shawl into the water at the moment when the officer, rushing forward, struck Hossein to the ground, a cry of anguish rising from the prisoners as they saw the water being dashed from their lips. Tim made his way back to the side of his master. Had those who still remained alive been aware of the supply of water which he carried in the shawl, they would have torn it from him, but none save those just at the window had noticed the act, and inside it was still entirely dark. Thank God, Your Honor, here it is, Tim said, and who should have brought it but Hossein? Sure, Your Honor, we both owe our lives to him this time, for I'm sure I should have been choked by thirst before morning. Ada was now lowered to the ground, and forcing her teeth asunder, a corner of the folded shawl was placed between her lips, and the water allowed to trickle down with a gasping sigh. She presently recovered. That is delicious, she murmured. That is delicious. Raising her to her feet, Charlie and Tim both sucked the dripping shawl until the first agonies of the thirst were relieved. Then, tearing off a portion in case Ada should again require it, Charlie passed the shawl to Mr. Howell, who, after sucking it for a moment, again passed it on to several standing round, and in this way many of those who would otherwise have succumbed were enabled to hold on until morning. Presently the first dawn of daylight appeared, giving fresh hopes to the few survivors. There were now only six or eight standing by the window, and a few standing or leaning against the walls around. The room itself was heaped high with the dead. It was not until two hours later that the doors were opened and the guard entered, and it was found that of the hundred and forty-six Englishmen enclosed there the night before, but twenty-three still breathed. Of these, very few retained strength to stagger out through the door. The rest were carried out and laid in the veranda. When the nabob came into the fort in the morning, he ordered Mr. Howell to be brought before him. He was unable to walk, but was carried to his presence. The brutal nabob expressed no regret for what had happened, but loaded him with abuse on account of the paucity of the treasure and ordered him to be placed in confinement. The other prisoners were also confined in a cell. Ada, the only English female who had, who had survived the siege, was torn, weeping from Charlie's arms, and conveyed to the Zenana, or ladies' apartments, of one of the nabob's generals. 
A few days later, the English captives were all conveyed to Morshedabad, where the Rajah also returned. After having extorted large sums from the French and Dutch and confiscated the whole of the property of the English in Bengal, the prospect was a gloomy one for the captives, that the English would, in time, return and extort a heavy reckoning from the nabob, they did not doubt for a moment. But nothing was more likely than that, at the news of the first disaster which befell his troops, the nabob would order his captives to be put to death. Upon the march up the country, Charlie had, by its cheerfulness and good temper, gained the goodwill of the officer commanding the guard, and upon arriving at their destination, he recommended him so strongly to the commander of the prison that the latter, instead of placing him in the apartment allotted to the remainder of the prisoners, assigned a separate room to him, permitting Tim, at his request, to occupy it with him. It was a room of fair size and a tower on one of the angles of the walls. It had bars, but these did not prevent those behind them looking out at the country which stretched around. The governor of the prison finding that charlie spoke the language fluently often came up to sit with him conversing with him on the affairs of that unknown country england altogether they were fairly treated their food was plentiful and beyond their captivity they had little to complain of over and over again they talked about the possibilities of effecting an escape but on entering the prison they had noticed how good was the watch, how many and strong the doors through which they had passed. They had meditated upon making a rope and escaping from the window, but they slept on the divan, each with a rug to cover them, and these, torn into strips and twisted, would not reach a quarter of the way from their window to the ground, and there was no other material of which a rope could possibly have been formed our only hope charlie said one day is in hosan i am sure he will follow us to the death and if he did not know where we are confined he would riot he would not i am certain rest day or night till he had opened a communication with us see tim there is my regimental cap with its gold lace let us fasten it outside the bars with a thread from that rug of course we must remove it when we hear anyone coming this was speedily done and for the next few days one or the other remained constantly at the window mr charles tim exclaimed in great excitement one day there is a man i've been watching for the last half hour he seems to be picking up sticks but all the while he keeps getting nearer and nearer and two or three times it seemed to me that he has looked up in this direction. Charlie joined Tim at the window. Yes, Tim, you are right. That's Hossein, I'm pretty sure. The man had now approached within two or three hundred yards of the corner of the wall. He was apparently collecting pieces of dried brushwood for firing. Presently he glanced in the direction of the window. Charlie thrust his arm through the bar and waved his hand. The man threw up his hands with a gesture which, to a casual observer, would have appeared accidental, but which the watchers had no doubt whatever was intended for them. He was still too far off from them to be able to distinguish his features, but they had not the least doubt that it was Hussein. End of chapter 18Chapter 19 of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. A Daring Escape. And what's to be done next, Mr. Charles? That's Hossein, sure enough, but it don't bring us much nearer to getting out. The first thing is to communicate with him in some way, Tim. If he'd come up to the side of the moat, Your Honor might speak to him. That would never do, Tim. There are sure to be sentries on the walls of the prison. We must trust to him. He can see the sentries and will know best what he can do. 
It was evident that Hossein did not intend doing anything at present, for still stooping and gathering brushwood, he gradually withdrew further and further from the wall. Then they saw him make his sticks into a bundle, put them on his shoulder, and walk away. During the rest of the day, they saw no more of Hussein. I will write, Charlie said. Fortunately, I have a pencil, telling him that we can lower a light string down to the moat if he can manage to get underneath with a cord which we can hoist up and that he must have two disguises in readiness. I don't think Hussein can read, Tib said, any more than I can myself. I dare say not, Tim, but he will probably have friends in the town. There are men who were employed in the English factory at Kosum Bazaar, hard by. These will be out of employment and will regret the expulsion of the English. We can trust Hussein. At any rate, I will get it ready. Now the first thing we have to do is to loosen one of these bars. I wish we had thought of doing it before. However, the stonework is pretty rotten, and we shall have no difficulty about that. The first thing is to get a tool of some sort. They looked round the room and for some time saw nothing which could in any way serve. The walls, floor, and wide bench running round, upon which the cushions which served as their beds were laid, were all stone. There was no other furniture of any kind. Devil a bit of iron do I see in the place, Mr. Charles, Tim said. They don't even give us a knife for dinner, but stew all their meats into a smash. There is something, Tim, Charlie said, looking at the door. Look at those long hinges. The hinges were of ornamented ironwork, extending half across the door. Upon one of the scrolls of this ironwork they set to work, chipping a small piece of stone off an angle of the wall. Outside the window, with great difficulty, they thrust this under the end of the scroll as a wedge. Another piece, slightly larger, was then pushed under it. The gain was almost imperceptible. But at last the piece of iron was raised from the woodwork sufficiently to allow them to get a hold of it with their thumbs. Then, little by little, they bent it upward until at last they could obtain a firm hold of it. The rest was comparatively easy. The iron was tough and strong, but by bending it up and down, they succeeded at last in breaking it off. It was the lower hinge of the door upon which they had operated as the loss of a piece of iron there would be less likely to catch the eye of anyone coming in. They collected some dust from the corner of the room, moistened it, and rubbed it on to the wood so as to take away its freshness of appearance, and they then set to work with the piece of iron, which was of a curved shape, about three inches long, an inch wide, and an eighth of an inch thick. Taking it by turns, they ground away the stone round the bottom of one of the bars. For the first inch, the stone yielded readily to the iron, but below that it became harder, and their progress was slow. They filled the hole which they had made with water to soften the stone and worked steadily away till night, when, to their great joy, they found that they had reached the bottom of the bar. They then enlarged the hole inwards, in order that the bar might be pulled back. Fortunately, it was much decayed by age, and they had no doubt that, by exerting all their strength, together they can bend it sufficiently to enable them to get through. At the hour when their dinner was brought, they had ceased their work, filled up the hole with dust collected, from the floor, put some dust of the stone over it and smoothed it down, so that it would not have been noticed by anyone casually looking from the window. It was late at night before they finished their work. Their hands were sore and bleeding, and they were completely worn out with fatigue. They had saved from their dinner a good-sized piece of bread. They folded up into a small compass the leaf from his pocketbook, upon which Charlie had written in Hindustani his letter to Hossein, and thrust this into the center of the piece of bread. Then Charlie told Tim to lie down and rest for three hours, while he kept watch, as they must take it in turns all night to listen in case Hussein should come outside. The lamp was kept burning. Just as Charlie's watch was over, he thought he heard a very faint splash in the water below. 
Two or three minutes later, he again thought he heard the sound. He peered out of the window anxiously, but the night was dark, and he could see nothing. Listening intently, it seemed to him several times that he heard the same faint sound. Presently, something whizzed by him, and looking round to his delight, he saw a small arrow with a piece of very thin string attached. The arrow was made of a very light wood, Round the iron point was a thick wrapping of cotton, which would entirely deaden its sound as it struck a wall. It was soaked in water, and Charlie had no doubt that the sound he heard was caused by its fall into the moat. After ineffectual trials to shoot through the window, round the center of the arrow a piece of greased silk was wrapped. Charlie took this off and found underneath it a piece of paper on which was written in Hindustani, If you have a bar loosened, pull the string and haul up a rope. If not, throw the arrow down. I will come again tomorrow night. Tim had by this time joined Charlie, and they speedily began to pull in the string. Presently, a thicker string came up into their hands they continued to pull and soon the end of a stout rope in which knots were tied every two feet came up to them they fastened this to one of the bars and then took hold of that which they had loosened and putting their feet against the wall exerted themselves to the utmost the iron was tougher than they had expected but they were striving for liberty and with desperate exertions they bent it inward until at last there was room enough for them to creep through can you swim tim not a stroke your honor sure you should know that when you fished me out of the water very well tim as i kept you up then it will be easy enough for me now to take you across the moat i will go first and when i get into the water We'll keep hold of the rope till you come down. Take off your boots, for they would be heard scraping against the wall. Be sure you make as little noise as possible and lower yourself quietly into the water. Charlie then removed his own boots, squeezed himself through the bars, and, grasping the rope tightly, begun to descend. He found the knots of immense assistance, for had it not been for them, unaccustomed as he was to to the work he would have been unable to prevent himself from sliding down too rapidly the window was fully sixty feet above the moat and he was very thankful when at last he felt the water touch his feet lowering himself quietly into it he shook the rope to let tim know that he could begin his descent before tim was halfway down charlie could hear his hard breathing and muttered ejaculations to himself sure i'll never get to the bottom at all my arms are fairly breaking i shall squash mr charles if i fall on him hold your tongue tim charlie said in a loud whisper tim was silent but the panting and puffing increased and charlie swam a stroke or two away expecting every moment that tim would fall the irishman however held on but let himself into the water with a splash which aroused the attention of the sentry above, who instantly challenged. Tim and Charlie remained perfectly quiet. Again the sentry challenged. Then there was a long silence. The sentry probably was unwilling to rouse the place by a false alarm, and the splash might have been caused by the fall of a piece of decayed stone from the face of the wall. Tim, you clumsy fellow, whispered Charlie, you nearly spoiled all sure your honor i was kilt entirely and my arms were pulled out of my sockets holy mother who'd have thought to would be so difficult to come down a rope the sailors are great men entirely now timmy lie quiet i will turn you on your back and swim across with you the moat was some twenty yards wide charlie swam across towing tim after him and taking the greatest pains to avoid making the slightest splash the opposite side was of stonework and rose six feet above the water as soon as they touched the wall a stout rope was lowered to them now tim you climb up first is it climb up your honor i couldn't do it for it was to save my soul my arms are gone altogether and i'm as weak as a child you go mr Childs. i'll hold on by the rope till morning they can but shoot me 
Nonsense, Tim. Here, I will fasten a rope around your body, and then I will climb up, and we will pull you up after me. In another minute, Charlie stood on the bank and grasped the hand of his faithful follower, Hussein threw himself on his knees and pressed his master to him. Then he rose, and, at a word from Charlie, they hauled Tim to the top. The rope was taken off him, and noiselessly they made their way across the country. Not a word was spoken till they were at a considerable distance from the fort. Where are you taking us, Hossein? Charlie asked at last. I have two peasant dresses in a deserted college a quarter of a mile away. Not another word was spoken until they reached the hut, which stood at the end of a small village. When they had entered this, Charlie first thanked, in the warmest terms, his follower for having rescued them. My life is my lord's, Hussein answered simply. He gave it to me, it is his again, wherever it is useful to him. No, Hussein, the balance is all on your side now. You saved my life that night at Ambor, you saved it that night at Calcutta, for without water you brought us. I question whether we could have lived till morning. Now you have procured our freedom. The debt is all on my side now, my friend. Hussein is glad that his lord is content. The Mohammedan murmured. Now, what will my lord do? Have you any place in town to which we could go, Hussein? Yes, sahib. I hired a little house. I was dressed as a trader. I have been here for two months, but I could not find where you were confined, although I have tried by all means until I saw your cap. It was foolish of me not to have thought of it before, Charlie said. Well, Hussein, for a little time we had better take refuge in your house. They will not think of searching in the city, and as Calcutta is in their hands, there is nowhere we could go. Beside, I must discover, if possible, where Miss Haynes is kept a prisoner and rescue her, if it can be done. The white girl is in the Zenana of Raja Dulab Ram, Hossein replied. Where is the Raja's palace? He has one in the city, one in Ajaram, twenty miles from here. I do not know at which she is lodged. We must find that out presently, Charlie said. It is something to know she is in one of two houses. Now, about getting back into town. I have thought of that, Hussein said. I brought a quantity of plantains and two large baskets. After the gates are open, you will go boldly in with the baskets on your head. No questions are asked of the country people who go in and out. I have some stain here which will darken your skin. I will go in first with my merchant's dress, which I have here. I will stop a little way inside the gate, and when I see you coming, we'll walk on. Do you follow me a little behind? My house is on a quiet street. When I reach the door, do you come up and offer to sell me plantains? If there are people about, I shall bargain with you until I see that no one is noticing us. Then you can enter. If none are about, you can follow me straight in. Hossein now set about the disguises. A light was struck, and both Tim and Charlie were shaved up to the line which the turban would cover. Charlie's whiskers, which were somewhat faint, as he was still under twenty-one years old, gave but little trouble. Tim, however, grumbled at parting with his much more bushy appendages. The shaven part of the heads and necks and faces were then rubbed with a dark fluid, as were the arms and legs. They were next wrapped in a dark blue clothes, in a peasant fashion, and turbans wound round their head. Hussein then, examining them critically, announced that they would pass muster anywhere. I feel mighty queer, Tim exclaimed, and it seems to me downright undecent to be walking about with my naked legs. Charlie laughed. Why, Tim, you are accustomed to see thousands of men every day with nothing on but a loincloth. Yes, your honor, but then they are heathens, and it seems natural for them to do so. But for a decent boy to go walking about in the streets with a thing on which covers no more than his shirt is unnatural altogether. Mother of Moses, what a shindy there would be 
in the streets of Cork if I was to show myself in such a state. Charlie now lay down for a sleep till morning, while Tim, who had had three hours repose, settled himself for a comfortable chat with Hossein, to whom sleep appeared altogether unnecessary. Between Hussein and Tim there was a sort of brotherly attachment, arising from their mutual love of their master. During the two years which Tim had spent apart from all Europeans save Charlie, he had contrived to pick up enough of the language to make himself fairly intelligible. And since the day when Hussein had saved Charlie's life in Ambor, the warmest friendship had sprung up between the good-humoured and warm-hearted Irishman and the silent and de devoted Mohammedan. Tim's friendship even extended so far as to induce a toleration of Hussein's religion. He had come to the conclusion that a man who at stated times in the day would leave his employment, whatever it might be, spread his carpet, and be for some minutes lost in prayer, could not be altogether a heathen, especially when he learned from Charlie that the Mohammedans, like ourselves, worship one God. For the sake of his friend, then, he now generally excluded the Mohammedans from the general designation of heathen, which he still applied to the Hindus. He learned from Hussein that the latter, having observed from a distance the Europeans driven into the cell at Calcutta, perceived at once how fatal the consequences would be. He had, an hour or two after they were confined there, approached with some water, but the officer on guard had refused to let him give it. He had then gone into the native town, but being unable to find any fruit there, had walked out to the gardens, and had picked a large basketful. This he had brought as an offering to the officer, and the latter had it then consented to his giving one bowl of water to the prisoners. Among them, as he told them, was his master. For bringing a second bowl, contrary to his orders, Hossein had, as Tim saw, been struck down, but had the satisfaction of believing that his master and Tim had derived some benefit from his effort. On the following morning, to his delight, he saw them issue among the few survivors from the dungeon, and had, when they were taken up the country, followed close behind them, arriving at the town on the same day as themselves. He had ever since been wandering round the prison. He had taken a house so close to it that he could keep watch on all the windows facing town, and had, day after day, kept his eyes fixed upon these without success he had at last found out from one of the soldiers that the white prisoners were confined on the other side of the prison but until he saw charlie's cap he had been unable to discover the room in which they were confined in the morning they started for the town groups of peasants were already making their way towards the gate with fruit and grain, and keeping near one of these parties while sufficiently distant to prevent the chance of their being addressed, Charlie and Tim made their way to the gate, the latter suffering acutely in his mind from the impropriety of his attire. No questions were asked. As they passed the guard, they at once perceived Hossein standing a little way off and followed him through the busy streets. They soon turned off into a quiet quarter and stopped at a house, in a street in which scarcely anyone was stirring. Hossein glanced around as he opened the door and beckoned for them to answer the house. This they did and were glad indeed to set down the heavy baskets of plantains. My lord's room is upstairs, Hossein said, and led the way to a comfortably furnished apartment. I think that you might stay here for months, unsuspected. A sweeper comes every day to do my rooms downstairs. He believes the rest of the house to be untenanted, and you must remain perfectly quiet during the half an hour he is here. Otherwise, no one enters the house but myself. Hussein soon set to work and prepared an excellent breakfast. Then he left them, saying that he would now devote himself for finding out whether the young white lady was in the town palace of the rajah he returned in the afternoon 
She is here, Sahib, he said. I got into conversation with one of the retainers of the Rajah, and by giving him some wonderful bargains in Delhi jewelry, succeeded in opening his lips. I dare not question him too closely, but I am to meet him tomorrow to show him some more silver bracelets. It is fortunate, Hussein, that you have some money, for neither Tim nor I have a rupee. Thanks to the generosity of my lord, Hussein said, I am well supplied. The next day Hussein discovered that the windows of the Zenana were at the back of the palace, looking into the large garden. I hear, however, he said, that the ladies of the Zenana are next week going to the Raja's other palace. The ladies will, of course, travel in palanquins. But upon the road I must get to talk with one of the waiting women and might bribe her to pass a note into the hands of the white lady. I suppose they will have a guard with them, Hossein. Surely a strong guard, Hossein answered. The time passed until the day came for the departure of the Rajah's Zenata. Charlie wrote a note as follows. My dear Ada, I am free and am on the lookout for an opportunity to rescue you. Contrive to put a little bit of your handkerchief through the lattice of the window of your room as a signal to us which it is. On the second night after your arrival, we will be under it with a ladder. If others, as is probable, sleep in your room, lie down without undressing more than you can help. When they are asleep, get up and go to the window and open the lattice. If any of them wake, say you are hot and cannot sleep, and wait quietly till they are off again. Then stretch out your arm, and we shall know you are ready. Then we will put up the ladder, and you must get out and come to us as quickly as possible. Once with us, you will be safe. The note was wrapped up very small and put into a quill. As soon as the gates were open, Hussein and his companions left the town and proceeded as far as a grove, halfway between the town and the Rajah's country palace. They are sure to stop here for a rest, Hussein said. I will remain here and try to enter into conversations with one of them, and it will be better for you to go on for some distance and then turn aside from the road. When they have all passed, come back into the road again and I will join you. After waiting two hours, Hossein saw two carts full of women approaching and had no doubt that these were the servants of the Zenata. As he had expected, the drivers halted their cattle in the shade of the trees, and the women, delighted to enjoy their liberty, alighted from the carts and scattered in the grove. Presently, one of them, a middle-aged woman, approached the spot where Hussein had seated himself. Hussein drew out a large and beautiful silver breakfast of Delhi workmanship. Would you like to buy this? he asked. How should I buy it, she said. I am only a servant. It is very beautiful, and she looked at it with longing eyes. I have two of them, he said, and they will both be yours if you will do me a service. What is it, she asked. They will be yours if you will give this quill to the little white girl who is in the Zenana. The woman hesitated. It is dangerous, she said. Not at all, Hussein replied. It only gives her news of a friend whom she thought was dead. It will cheer her heart and will be a kind action. None can ever know it. Give them to me, the woman said, holding out her hand. I will do it. No, Hossein replied. I will give you one now, the other when I know that the note is delivered. I shall be watching tomorrow. If she places her handkerchief in her lattice, I shall know that she has got it. When she does that, I will bury the other bracelet a few inches in the ground, just under that window. You can dig it up when you will. I understand, the woman said. You can trust me. We all like the work girl. She is very gentle, but very sad. I would gladly give her pleasure. Hussein handed to her the bracelet and the quill. She hid them in a dress, sauntered away. Hussein lay back as if taking a sleep, and so remained until half an hour later he heard the shouts of the drivers to the women to take their places in the carts. Then the sound of retreating wheels was heard. 
Hussein was about to rise when he heard the clatter of horses' hoofs. Looking round, he saw eight elephants, each carrying a closed pavilion, moving along the road, escorted by a troop of horsemen in the pavilions, as he knew were the ladies of the Rajah's Zenana. End of chapter 19「Of with Clive in India」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman The Rescue of the White Captive After the cavalcade had passed, Hussein rose to his feet and followed them, allowing them to go some distance ahead. Presently he was joined by Charlie and Tim, and the three walked quietly along the road until within sight of the Rajah's palace. In front stood a great courtyard. Behind, also surrounded by a high wall, was the garden. As this was always devoted to the Zenana, they had little doubt that the rooms of the ladies were on this side, and two hours later they were delighted at seeing a small piece of white stuff thrust through one of the lattices. The woman had been faithful to her trust, Ada had received the letter. They then retired to a distance from the palace and at once set to work on the fabrication of a ladder. Hussein, followed by Charlie, who better reenacted the part than Tim, went into a village and purchased four long bamboo poles, saying he wanted them for the carrying of burdens. Charlie placed these on his shoulder and followed Hussein. When they arrived at the grove, they set to work, having bought with them all the necessary materials. The bamboos were spliced together two and two, and while Charlie and Tim set to to bore holes in these, Hussein chopped down a young tree and, cutting it into lengths, prepared the rungs. It took them all that evening and a greater part of the next day before they had satisfactorily accomplished their work. They had then a ladder thirty feet long, the height which they judged the window to be above the terrace below. It was strong and at the same time light. They waited until darkness had completely fallen, and then, and then taking their ladder, went round to the back of the garden. They mounted the wall and, sitting on the top, dragged the ladder after them and lowered it on the other side. It was of equal thickness the whole length, and could therefore be used indifferently either way. They waited patiently until they saw the lights in the Zenana windows extinguished. Then they crept quietly up and placed the ladder under the window at which the signal had been shown, and found that their calculations were correct, and that it reached to a few inches below the sill. Half an hour later, the lattice above opened. They heard a murmur of voices, and then all was quiet again. After a few minutes, Charlie climbed noiselessly up the ladder, and just as he reached the top, an arm was stretched out above him, and a moment afterwards, Ada's face appeared. I am here, dear, he said in a whisper. Lean out, and I will take you. The girl stretched out over the window. Charlie took her in his arms and lifted her lightly out, then slowly descended the ladder. No sooner did he touch the ground than they hurried away, Ada sobbing with excitement and pleasure on Charlie's shoulder. Tim and Hossein bearing the ladder, Hossein having already carried out his promise of concealing the second bracelet under the window. In a few minutes they had safely surmounted the wall and hurried across the country with all speed before leaving the town. Hossein had purchased a cart with two bullocks and had hired a man who was recommended to him by one of his co-religionists there, as one upon whose fidelity he could rely. This cart was awaiting them at a grove. Paying them the amount stipulated, Hussein took the ox goad and started the bullocks, Tim walking beside him, while Charlie and Ada took their places in the cart. They were sure that a hot pursuit would be set up. The rage of the nabob at the escape of Charlie and his servant 
had been extreme and the whole country had been scoured by parties of horsemen and they were sure that the rajah would use every possible means to discover ada before he ventured to report to the nabob that the prisoner committed to his charge had escaped of course i can't see you very well ada said but i should not have known you in the least no i am got up like a peasant charlie answered we shall have to dress you so before morning we have got things here for you oh how delightful i was ada exclaimed when i got your note i found it so difficult to keep on looking sad and hopeless when i could have sung for joy i have been so miserable there seemed no help and they said some day i should be sent to the nabob's zenana wretches how poor mamma will be grieving for me and papa ah captain marion he is dead is he not yes my dear charlie said gently he was killed by my side that afternoon with his last breath he asked me to take care of you i thought so ada said crying quietly i did not think of it at the time everything was so strange so dreadful that i scarcely thought at all but afterwards on the way here when i turned it all over it seemed to me that it must be so he did not come to me all that afternoon he was not shut up with us in that dreadful place and everyone else was there so it seemed to me that he must have been killed but that you did not like to tell me it was better for him dear than to have died in that terrible cell thank god your mamma is safe and some day you will join her again we have news that the english are coming up to attack calcutta a party are already in the hogley and the nabob is going to start in a few days to his army there i hope in a very short time you will be safe among your friends after traveling for several hours they stopped charlie gave ada some native clothes and ornaments and told her to stain her face arms and legs to put on the bangles and bracelets and then to rejoin them half an hour later ada took her seat in the cart this time transformed into a hindu girl and the party again proceeded they felt sure that ada's flight would not be discovered until daybreak it would be some little time before horsemen could be sent off in all directions in pursuit and they could not be overtaken until between eleven and twelve the wagon was filled with grain on the top of which charlie and ada were seated when daylight came charlie alighted and walked by the cot unquestioned they passed through several villages at eleven o'clock hossein pointed to a large grove at some little distance from the road go in there he said and stay till nightfall do you then come out and follow me i shall go into the next village and remain there till after dark i shall then start and wait for you half a mile beyond the village an hour after the wagon had disappeared from sight the party in the grove saw ten or twelve horsemen galloping rapidly along the road an hour passed and the same party returned at an equal speed they saw no more of them and after it became dark they continued their way passed through the village which was three miles ahead and found hussein waiting a short distance beyond ada climbed into the cart and they again went forward did you put the rajah's men on the wrong track hossein we guessed that you had done so when we saw them going back yes hussein said i had unyoked the bullocks and had lain down in the caravansary when they arrived they came in and their leader asked who i was i said that i was taking down a load of grain for the use of the army at calcutta he asked where were the two men and the women who were with me i replied that i knew nothing of them i had overtaken them on the road and they had asked leave for the woman to ride in the cart they said they were going to visit their mother who was sick he asked if i was sure they were natives and i counterfeited surprise 
and said that certainly they were for which lie allah will i trust be merciful since it was told to an enemy i said that they had left me just when we had passed the last village and had turned off by the road to the right saying they had many miles to go they talked together and decided that as you were the only people who had been seen along the road they must follow and find you and so started at once and i dare say they are searching for you now miles away their journey continued without any adventure until within a few miles of calcutta hossein then advised them to take up their abode in a ruined mud hut at a distance from the road he had brought at the last village a supply of provisions sufficient to last them for some days i shall now he said go into the town sell my grain bullocks and cart and find out where the soldiers are as soon as the news of the nabob's advance against calcutta reached madras mr pigot who was now governor there dispatched a force of two hundred and thirty men under the orders of major kilpatrick the party reached falta on the hoogly on the second of august and there heard of the capture of calcutta by detachments who came down from some of the company's minor posts the force was increased to nearly four hundred but sickness broke out among them and finding himself unable to advance against so powerful an army as that of the nabob major kilpatrick sent to madras for further assistance when the news reached that place clive had recently arrived with a strong force which was destined to operate against the french at hyderabad the news however of the catastrophe at calcutta at once altered the destination of the force and on the sixteenth of october the expedition sailed for calcutta the force consisted of two hundred and fifty men of the thirty ninth foot the first regiment of the regular english army which had been sent out to india five hundred and seventy men of the madras european force eighty artillerymen and twelve hundred sepoys of the nine hundred europeans only six hundred arrived at that time at the mouth of the hoogly the largest ship the cumberland with three hundred men on board having grounded on the way the remainder of the fleet consisted of three ships of war five transports and a fire ship reached falter between the eleventh and twentieth of december hussein had returned from calcutta with the news that the party commanded by major kilpatrick had been for some weeks at falta and the party at once set off towards that place which was but forty miles distance travelling by night and sleeping by day in the woods they reached falta without difficulty and learning that the force was still on board ship they took possession of a boat moored by the banks of miles higher up and rowed down great was their happiness indeed at finding themselves once more among friends here were assembled many of the ships which had been at calcutta at the time it was taken and to ada's delight she learned that her mother was on board one of these they were soon rowed there in a boat from the ship which they had first boarded and ada on gaining the deck saw her mother sitting among some other ladies fugitives like herself with a scream of joy she rushed forward and with a cry of mamma mamma threw herself into her mother's arms it was a moment or two before mrs haynes could realize that this dark-skinned hindu girl was her child and then her joy equaled that of a daughter it was some time before any coherent conversation could take place and then ada running back to charlie drew him forward to her mother and presented him to her as her preserver the captain marriott who had stayed with them at calcutta mrs haynes's 
gratitude was extreme and charlie was soon surrounded and congratulated by the officers on board to many of whom belonging as they did to the madras army he was well known foremost among them and loudest in his expressions of delight was his friend peters you know charlie i suppose he said presently that you are a major now no indeed charlie said how is that when the directors at home received the report of commodore james that the fort of Suwandrug had been captured entirely through you they at once sent out your appointment as major you are lucky old fellow here are you a major while i'm a lieutenant still however don't think i'm jealous for i'm not a bit and you thoroughly deserve all and more than you got and this is tim charlie said he has shared all my adventures with me tim was standing disconsolately by the bulwark shifting uneasily from foot to foot with the feeling of the extreme shortness of his garments stronger upon him than ever peters seized him heartily by the hand i am glad to see you tim very glad and so you've been with major marriott ever since for the lord's sake mr peters tim said in an earnest whisper get me a pair of trousers i'm that ashamed of myself in the presence of the ladies that i'm, <laughs> I'm likely to drop come along below tim come along charlie there are lots of poor fellows have gone down and uniforms are plentiful will soon rig you out again there is one more introduction peters this is my man hussein he calls himself my servant i call him my friend he has saved my life twice and has been of inestimable service had it not been for him i should still be in prison at moore's shatterbard peters said a few hearty words to hussein and then they went below returning on deck in half an hour charlie in the dress uniform of an officer tim in that of a private in the madras infantry mrs haines and ada had gone below where they could chat unrestrained by the presence of others and where an attempt could be made to restore ada to her former appearance mrs haines had heard of her husband's death on the day after the capture of calcutta mr holwell having been permitted to send on board the ships a list of those who had fallen she had learned that ada had survived the terrible night in the dungeon and that she had been sent up country a captive she almost despaired of ever hearing of her again but had resolved to wait and see the issue of the approaching campaign now that ada was restored to her she determined to leave for england in a vessel which was to sail in the course of a week with a large number of fugitives mr haines was a very wealthy man and had intended retiring altogether in the course of a few months she would therefore be in the enjoyment of an ample fortune in england among those on board the ships of the falter was mr drake who at once upon hearing of charlie's arrival ordered him to be arrested major kilpatrick however firmly refused to allow the order to be carried out saying that as charlie was under his orders as an officer in the madras army mr drake had no control or authority over him he could however upon clive's arrival lay the case before him a week later mrs haines and ada sailed for england the latter weeping bitterly at parting from charlie who promised them that when he came home to england on leave he would pay them a visit he gave them his mother's address and mrs haines promised to call upon her as soon as she reached england and give her full news of him adding that she hoped that his sisters the youngest of whom was little older than ada would be great friends with her very slowly and wearily the time passed at falter the mists from the river were deadly 
and of the two hundred and thirty men whom kilpatrick brought with him from madras in july only about thirty remained alive and of these but ten were fit for duty when clive at last arrived the fleet left falter on the twenty seventh of december and anchored off Mullapair on the following day the fort of Bajbaj, near this place was the first object of attack and it was arranged that while admiral watson should bombard with the fleet clive should attack it on the land side clive who now held the rank of lieutenant colonel in the army had manifested great pleasure at again meeting the young officer who had served under him at arcot and who had in his absence obtained a fame scarcely inferior to his own by the defence of ambor and the capture of suwandrug a few hours after clive's arrival mr drake had made a formal complaint of the assault which charlie had committed but after hearing from charlie an account of the circumstances clive sent a contemptuous message to mr drake to the effect that charlie had only acted as he should himself have done under the same circumstances and that at the present time he should not think of depriving himself of the services of one gallant soldier even if he had maltreated a dozen civilians as clive had been given paramount authority in bengal and as mr drake had every reason to suppose that he himself would be recalled as soon as the circumstances attending the capture of calcutta were known in england he was unable to do anything further in the matter and charlie landed with clive on the twenty eighth the force consisted of two hundred and fifty europeans and twelve hundred sepoys who were forced to drag with them having no draft animals two field pieces and a wagon of ammunition the march was an exclusively fatiguing one the country was swampy in the extreme and intersected with watercourses and after a terrible fatiguing night march and fifteen hours of unintermittent labor they arrived at eight o'clock in the morning at the hollow bed of a lake now perfectly dry it lay some ten feet below the surrounding country and was bordered with jungle in the wet season it was full of water on the eastern and southern banks lay an abandoned village and it was situated about a mile and a half from the fort of Bajabaj. clive was ill and unable to see matters himself indeed accustomed only to the feeble forces of southern india who had never stood for a moment against him in battle he had no thought of danger upon the other hand the troops of the nabob who had had no experience whatever of the superior fighting power of the europeans and who had effected so easy a conquest at calcutta flushed with victory regarded their european foes with contempt and were preparing to annihilate them at a blow manik chan the gov the general commanding the nabob's forces informed by spies of the movements of the english troops moved out with fifteen hundred horses and two thousand foot so worn out were the british upon their arrival at the dried bed of the lake that after detaching a small body to occupy a village near the enemy's fort from which alone danger was expected while another took up the post in some jungles by the side of the main road the rest threw themselves down to sleep some lay in the village some in the shade of the bushes along the sides of the hollow their arms were all piled in a heap sixty yards from the eastern bank the two field pieces stood deserted on the north side of the village not a single sentry was posted manak chan knowing that after marching all night they would be exhausted now stole upon them and surrounded the tank on three sides 
Happily, he did not perceive that the arms were piled at a distance of sixty yards from the nearest man. Had he done so, the English would have been helpless in his hands after waiting an hour to be sure that the last of the English were sound asleep. He ordered a tremendous fire to be opened on the hollow and village. Astounded at this sudden attack, the men sprang up from their deep sleep, and a rush was instantly made to their arms. Clive, ever coolest in danger, shouted to them to be steady, and his officers well seconded his attempts. Unfortunately, the artillerymen, in their sudden surprise, instead of rushing to their cannon, joined the rest of the troops as they ran back to their arms, and the guns at once fell into the hands of the enemy. These had now climbed the eastern bank, and a fire from all sides was poured upon the troops, huddled together in a mass. Major Marriott, Clive said, if we fall back now, fatigued as the men are, and shaken by this surprise, we are lost. Do you take a wing of the Sepoy Battalion and clear the right bank? I will advance with the main body directly on the village. Come on, my lads, Charlie shouted in Hindustani. Show them how the men of Madras can fight. The Sepoys replied with a cheer, advanced with a rush against the bank, drove the defenders at once from the point where they charged, and then swept round the tank towards the village, which Clyde had already attacked in front. The loss of Charlie's battalion was small, but the main body, exposed to the concentrated fire, suffered more heavily. They would not, however, be denied. Reaching the bank, they poured a volley into the village and charged with the bayonet just as Charlie's men dashed in at the side. The enemy fled from the village and, taking shelter in the jungles around, opened fire. The shouts of their officers could be heard urging them again and again to sally out and fall upon the British. But at this moment, the party which had been sent forward along the road, hearing the fray, came hurrying up and poured their fire into the jungle. Surprised at this reinforcement, the enemy paused as they were issuing from the wood and then fell back upon their cavalry. The British artillerymen ran out and seized the guns and opened with them upon the retiring infantry. Clive now formed up his troops in line and advanced against the enemy's cavalry, behind which their infantry had massed for shelter. Manik Chand ordered his cavalry to charge, but just as he did so, a cannonball from one of Clive's field pieces passed close to his head. The sensation was so unpleasant that he at once changed his mind. The order for retreat was given and the beaten army fell back in disorder to Calcutta. End of chapter 20。21 of With Clive in India。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Gary Allman。The Battle Outside Calcutta after the defeat of the enemy who had surprised and so nearly annihilated him clive marched at once towards the foot of bajabaj on the way he met major kilpatrick who was advancing with a force which had been landed from the ships when the sound of firing was heard to his assistance the fleet had at daybreak opened a heavy fire upon the ramparts and by the afternoon effected a breach as his men were greatly fatigued and had had but an hour's sleep, Clive determined upon delaying the attack until the morning, and a party of 250 sailors with two guns were landed to take part in the storming. Many of these sailors had drunk freely before landing, and as night fell, some of them strolled towards the fort, 
one of the number named strahan moved along unobserved by the enemy to the foot of the breach climbed up it and came suddenly upon a party of its defenders sitting round the fire smoking strahan immediately fired his pistol among them with a shout of the fort is mine and then gave three rousing cheers the enemy leaped to their feet ran off for a little way then seeing strahan was alone they rushed back and attacked him firing as they came strahan drawing his cutlass defended himself vigorously for some time but his weapon broke off at the hilt just as a number of sepoys and men of the thirty ninth who had been awakened from their sleep by the shouting and firing came running up reinforcements of the garrison also joined their friends but these were dispirited by the sudden and unexpected attack and as the troops continued to stream up the breach the garrison was pressed and losing heart fled through the opposite gate of the fort the only casualty on the british side was that captain campbell marching up at the head of the sepoys was mistaken for an enemy by the sailors and shot dead strahan was in the morning severely reprimanded by the admiral for his breach of discipline and retiring from the cabin said to his comrades well if i am flogged for this here action i will never take another fort by myself as long as i live manek chan was so alarmed at the fighting power shown by the english in these two affairs that leaving only a garrison of five hundred men at calcutta he retired with his army to join the nabob at morshedabad when the fleet arrived before the town the enemy surrendered the port at the first shot and it was again taken possession of by the english major kilpatrick was at once sent up with five ships and a few hundred men to capture the town of hoogly twenty miles further up the defences of the place were strong it was held by two thousand men and three thousand horsemen lay around it the ships however at once opened the cannonade upon it and effected a breach before night and at daybreak the place was taken by storm two days after the capture of calcutta the news arrived that war had again been declared between england and france it was fortunate that this was not known a little earlier for had the french forces been joined to those under manak shand the greek conquest of calcutta would not have been so easily achieved the nabob furious at the loss of calcutta and the capture and sack of hoogly at once dispatched a messenger to the governor of the french colony of chandranagore to join him in crushing the english the governor however had received orders that in the event of war being declared between england and france he was if possible to arrange with the english that neutrality should be observed between them he therefore refused the nabob's request and then sent messengers to calcutta to treat the nabob had gathered an army of ten thousand foot and fifteen thousand horse and advanced against calcutta arriving before the town on the second february seventeen fifty seven clive's force had now owing to the arrival of some reinforcements from europe and the enlisting of french sepoys been raised to seven hundred european infantry a hundred artillerymen and fifteen hundred sepoys with fourteen light field pieces the whole of the town of calcutta was surrounded by a deep cut with a bank behind called the Mahratta ditch a mile beyond this was a large salt water lake so that an enemy advancing from the north would have to pass within a short distance of clive's entrenched position outside town affording him great opportunities for a flank attack on the day of their arrival clive marched out but the enemy opened a heavy fire and he retired clive determined to attack the enemy next morning admiral watson at his request at once landed five hundred and sixty sailors 
under the command of Captain Warwick of the Thunderer. A considerable portion of the enemy had crossed the Maratha ditch and encamped within it. The Nabob himself pitched his tent in the garden of Amichabud, a native Calcutta matron who, though in the Nabob's camps from motives of policy, sympathized entirely with the English, which occupied an advanced bastion within the Maratha ditch. The rest of the army were encamped between the ditch and the saltwater lake. Clive's intentions were to march first against the battery, which had played on him so effectively the day before, and having carried this to march directly against the garden in which the nabob was encamped. The force with which he started at three o'clock in the morning of the third consisted of the five hundred and sixty sailors who drew with them six guns six hundred and fifty european infantry a hundred european artillery and eight hundred sepoys half the sepoys led the advance the remainder covered the rear soon after daybreak the sepoys came in contact with the enemy's advance guard placed in ditches along a road leading from the head of the lake to the Maharaja ditch. These discharged their muskets and some rockets and took to flight. One of the rockets caused a serious disaster. The sepoys had their ammunition pouches open, and the contents of one of these were fired by the rocket. The flash of the flame communicated the fire to the pouch of the next sepoy, and so the flan ran along the line killing, wounding, and scorching many, and causing the greatest confusion. Fortunately, the enemy were not near, and Captain Erie Coote, who led the British infantry behind them, aided Charlie, who led the advance in restoring order, and the forward movement again went on. A new obstacle had, however, arisen. With the morning, a dense fog had set in, rendering it impossible for the troops to see even a few yards in advance of them. Still they pushed on and, unopposed, reached a point opposite Omichun's garden, but divided from it by the Maharati ditch. Presently they heard the thunder of a great body of approaching cavalry. They waited quietly until the unseen horse had approached within a few yards of them, and then poured a mighty volley into the fog. The noise ceased abruptly and was followed by that of the enemy's cavalry in retreat. The fog was now so dense that it was impossible even to judge of the direction in which the troops were moving. Clive knew, however, that the Maratha ditch was on his right and moving a portion of his troops till they touched this he again advanced his object being to gain a causeway which raised several feet above the country led from calcutta across the maharada ditch into the country beyond towards this clive now advanced his troops fired as they marched into the fog ahead of them and the guns fired from the flanks obliquely to the right and left without experiencing any opposition clive reached the causeway and the sepoys turning to their right advanced along this towards the ditch as they crossed this however they came in the line of fire of their own guns the officer commanding them being ignorant of what was taking place in front and unable to see a foot before him charlie closely accompanied always by tim was at the head of his troop when the iron hail of the english guns struck the head of the column mowing down numbers of men a panic ensued and the sepoys terror-stricken at this discharge from a direction in which they considered themselves secure leaped from the causeway into the dry ditch and sheltered themselves there. Charlie and his companion 
was saved by the fact that they were a few paces ahead of the column. Run back, Tim, Charlie said. Find Colonel Clive and tell him that we are being mowed down by our own artillery. If you can't find him, hurry back to the guns and tell the officer what he is doing. Charlie then leaped down into the ditch and endeavored to rally the sepoys. A few minutes later, Clive himself arrived and the sepoys were induced to leave the ditch and to form again by the side of the causeway along which the British troops were by now marching. Suddenly, however, from the fog burst out the discharge of two heavy guns, which the enemy had mounted on a bastion flanking the ditch. The shouts of the officers and the firing of the men indicated precisely the position of the column. The grape shock tore through it, and 22 of the English troops fell dead and wounded. Immediately afterwards, another discharge followed, and the column, broken and confused, bewildered by the dense fog, and dismayed by the fire of these unseen guns, fell back. Clive now determined to push on to the main road, which he knew crossed the field half a mile in front of him. The country was, however, here laid out in rice fields, each enclosed by banks and ditches. Over these banks it was impossible to drag the guns, and the sailors could only get them along by descending into the ditches and using these as roads. The labor was prodigious, and the men, fatigued and harassed by the battle in darkness and by the fire from the unseen guns, which the enemy continued to pour in their direction from either flank, began to lose heart. Happily, however, the fog began to lift. The flanks of the columns were covered by bodies of troops, thrown out on either side, and after more than an hour's hard work, and abandoning two of the guns which had broken down, Clive reached the main road, again formed his men in column, and advanced towards the city. The odds were overwhelmingly against him. There were guns, infantry, and cavalry, both in front and behind him. The column pressed on, in spite of the heavy fire, crossed the ditch, and attacked a strong body of the enemy drawn up on the opposite side. While it did so, a great force of the nabob's cavalry swung down on the rear and for a moment captured the guns. Ensign York of the 39th foot faced the rear company about and made a gallant charge upon the horsemen, drove them back, and recaptured the guns. Clive's whole army was now across the ditch and it was open to him either to carry out his original plan of attacking Omichion's garden or of marching forward into the fort of Calcutta. Seeing that his men were fatigued and worn out with six hours of labor and marching under the most difficult circumstances, he took the latter alternative, entered Calcutta, and then, following the stream, marched back to the camp he had left in the morning. His loss amounted to 39 Europeans killed and 18 sepoys, 82 Europeans wounded and 35 sepoys. The casualties being caused almost entirely by the enemy's cannon. The expedition, from a military point of view, had been an entire failure. He had carried neither the battery nor Amichun's garden. Had it not been for the fog, he might have succeeded in both these objects. But upon the other hand, the enemy were as much disconcerted by the fog as he was, and were unable to use their forces with any effect. Military critics have decided that the whole operation was a mistake. But although a mistake and a failure, its consequences were no less decisive. The nabob struck with astonishment at the daring and dash of the English in venturing with so small a force to attack him, 
and to march through the very heart of his camp was seized with terror he had lost thirteen hundred men in the fight among whom were twenty-four rajas and lesser chiefs and the next morning he sent in a proposal for peace a less determined man than clive would no doubt have accepted the proposal calcutta was still besieged by a vastly superior force supplies of all kinds were running short the attack of the previous day had been a failure he knew however the character of asiatics and determined to play the game of bounce the very offer of the nabob showed him that the latter was alarmed he therefore wrote to him saying that he had simply marched his troops through his highness's camps to show him of what british soldiers were capable but that he had been careful to avoid hurting anyone except those who actually opposed his progress he concluded by expressing his willingness to accede to the nabob's proposal and to negotiate the nabob took it all in if all this destruction and confusion had been wrought by a simple march through his camp what would be the result if clive were to take it into his head to attack him in earnest he therefore at once withdrew his army three miles to the rear and opened negotiations he granted all that the english asked that all the property and privileges of the company should be restored that all their goods should pass into the country free of tax that all the company's factories and all monies and properties belonging to it or its servants should be restored and made good and that permission should be given to them to fortify calcutta as they pleased having agreed to these conditions the nabob upon the eleventh of february retired with his army to his capital leaving omich hund with a commission to propose to the english a treaty of alliance offensive and defensive against all enemies this proposal was a most acceptable one and clive determined to seize the opportunity to crush the french his previous experiences around madras had taught him that the french were the most formidable rivals of england in india he knew that large reinforcements were on their way to pondicherry and he feared that the nabob when he recovered from his panic might regret the conditions which he had granted and might ally himself with the french in an effort again to expel the english he therefore determined at once to attack the french the deputy sent by monsieur renault the governor of chandranagore had been kept waiting from day to day under one pretense or another and they now wrote to the governor that they believed that there was no real intention on the part of the english to sign an agreement of neutrality with him and that they would be the next objects of attack monsieur renault immediately sent messages to the nabob urging upon him that if the english were allowed to annihilate the french they would be more dangerous enemies than ever and suraja u dawa having now recovered from the terror wrote at once to calcutta peremptorily forbidding any hostilities against the french to show his determination he dispatched fifteen hundred men to hooghly which the english had abandoned after capturing it with instructions to help the french if attacked and he sent a lakh of rupees to monsieur renault to aid him in preparing for the defence clive unwilling to face a coalition between the french and the nabob was in favour of acceding to the nabob's orders the treaty of neutrality with the french was drawn up and would have been signed 
had it not been for the obstinate refusal of admiral watson to agree to it between that officer and clyde there had never been any cordial feelings and from the time of their first connection at the siege of garia differences of opinion frequently leading to angry disputes had taken place between them nor was it strange that this should be so both were grave and gallant men but while watson had the punctiliousness sense of honor which naturally belongs to an english gentleman clive was wholly unscrupulous as to the means which he employed to gain his ends between two such men it is not singular that disagreements arose admiral watson impelled by feeling of personal dislike to clive often allowed himself to be carried to unwarrantable lengths on the occasion of the capture of calcutta he ordered captain erie coote who first entered it to hold it in the king's name and to disobey clive's orders although the latter had been granted a commission in the royal army as lieutenant colonel and was moreover the chief authority of the company in all affairs on land upon clive's asserting himself admiral watson absolutely threatened to open fire upon his troops apparently from a sheer feeling of opposition he now opposed the signing of the treaty with the french and several days were spent in stormy altercations circumstances occurred during this time which strengthened the view he took and changed those of clive and his colleagues of the council just then the news reached suraja u dowla that delhi had been captured by the afghans and terrified at the thought that the victorious northern enemy might next turn their arms against him he wrote to clive begging him to march to his assistance and offering a tack of rubies a month towards the expense of his army on the same day that clive received the letter he heard that commodore james and three ships with reinforcements from bombay had arrived at the mouth of the hooghly and that the cumberland with three hundred troops which had grounded on her way from madras was now coming up the river almost at the same moment he heard from Amichabad, who had accompanied the nabob to Morshedabad, that he had bribed the governor of Hooghly to offer no opposition to the passage of the troops up the river. Clive was now ready to agree to Admiral Watson's views and to advance at once against Chandranagor. But the admiral again veered round and refused to agree to the measure unless the consent of the nabob was obtained he wrote however himself a threatening and indeed violent letter to the nabob ordering him to give his consent the nabob still under the influence of his fears from the afghans replied in terms which amounted to consent but the very next day having received news which calmed his fears as to the afghans he wrote preemptory forbidding the expedition against the french this letter however was disregarded and the expedition prepared to start it consisted of seven hundred europeans and fifteen hundred native infantry who started by land a hundred and fifty artillery proceeding in boats escorted by three ships of war and several smaller vessels under admiral watson the french garrison consisted only of a hundred and forty six french and three hundred sepoys beside these were three hundred of the european population and sailors of the merchant ships in port who had been hastily formed into a militia the governor indignant at the duplicity to which he had been treated had worked vigorously at his defences the settlement extended along the river banks for two miles in the centre stood the fort which was a hundred and twenty yards square 
mounting ten thirty-two pounder guns on each of its four bastions twenty-four pounder guns were placed on the rampart facing the river on the south on an outlying work commanding the water gate eight thirty-two pounders were mounted monsieur renault set to work to demolish all the houses within a hundred yards of the fort and to erect batteries commanding the approaches he ordered an officer to sink several ships in the only navigable channel about a hundred and fifty yards to the south of the fort at a point commanded by the guns of one of the batteries the officer was a traitor he purposely sank the ships in such a position as to leave a channel through which the english ships might pass and then seizing his opportunity deserted to them on approaching the town clive knowing that charlie could speak the native language fluently asked him whether he would undertake to reconnoitre the position of the enemy with which he was entirely unacquainted charlie willingly agreed when on the night of the thirteenth of march the army halted a few miles from town charlie distinguishing himself in a native dress and accompanied by hossein left the camp and made his way to the town this he had no difficulty in entering it extended a mile and a half back from the river and consisted of houses standing in large gardens and enclosures the whole of the europeans were laboring at the erection of the batteries and the destruction of the houses surrounding them and charlie and his companion approaching closely to one of these were pounced upon by the french officer in command of a working party and set to work with a number of natives in demolishing the houses charlie with his usual energy threw himself into the work and would speedily have called attention to himself by the strength and activity which he displayed had not hossein begged him to moderate his efforts native men never work like that sahib not when he is paid ever so much work still less no pay the french would soon notice the sahib if he labored like that thus admonished charlie adapted his actions to those of his companions and after working until dawn approached he managed with hossein to evade the attention of the officer and drawing off hurried away to rejoin clive the latter was moving from the west by a road leading to the northern face of the fort it was at the battery which renault was erecting upon this road that charlie had been laboring the latter informed clive of the exact position of the work and also that although strong by itself it was commanded by many adjoining houses which the french in spite of their effort had not time to destroy the news decided clive to advance immediately without giving the enemy further time to complete their operations end of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. As the English troops advanced, they were met on the outskirts of the settlement by the enemy, who contested bravely every garden and enclosure with them. The British force was, however, too strong to be resisted, and gradually the French were driven back until they formed in rear of the battery clive at once took possession of the houses surrounding it and from them kept up all day a heavy fire upon the defenders until at nightfall these fell back upon the fort after spiking their guns the loss of this position compelled the french to abandon the other outlying batteries from which during the night they withdrew their guns into the fort the next four days clive spent in bringing up the guns landed from the fleet and establishing batteries round the fort and on the nineteenth he opened fire against it on the same day the three men of war 
the kent of sixty-four guns the tiger of sixty and the salisbury of fifty anchored just below the channel which the governor believed he had blocked up the next four days were spent by the fleet in sounding to discover whether the statements of the french deserter were correct during this time a heavy cannonade was kept up unceasingly between clive and the fort in this garrison had the best of it silenced some of the english guns killed many of the assailants and would certainly have beaten off the land attack had the fleet not been able to interfere in the struggle all this time the governor was hoping that aid would arrive from the nabob the latter indeed did send a force under rajah dulab ram but the governor of hooghly bribed by omichud sent messages to the officer urging him to halt as chandrangador was about to surrender and he would only incur the anguish of the english uselessly on the morning of the twenty third having ascertained that a channel was free the fleet advanced the tiger leading made her way through the passage and taking up a position abreast of the northeast bastion of the fort opened a heavy fire upon it with her guns and harassed the besieged with a musketry fire from her tops the kent was on the point of anchoring opposite the water gate when so heavy a fire was poured upon her that in the confusion the cable ran out and the ship dropped down till she anchored at a point exposed to a heavy cross-fire from the southeast and southwest bastions owing to this accident the salisbury was forced to anchor a hundred and fifty yards below the fort the french fought with extreme bravery vastly superior as were the english force and guns the french fire was maintained with the greatest energy and spirit the gunners being directed and animated by monsieur de Vazdi, captain of one of the ships which had been sunk no advantage was gained by the tiger in her struggle with the northeast bastion and the guns of the southwest bastion galled the kent so severely that the admiral neglecting the southeast bastion was forced to turn the whole of his guns upon it the vagonies concentrated his fire against one point of the kent and presently succeeded in setting her on fire the conflagration spread a panic ensued and some seventy or eighty men jumped into the boats alongside the officers however rallied the rest of the crew the fire was extinguished and the men returned to their duty and the cannonade was recommenced after the battle had ranged for two hours the fire of the fort began to slacken as one after another of the guns was dismounted monsieur renault saw that the place could be no longer defended of his hundred and forty six soldiers over ninety had been killed and wounded collecting the remainder in their offices with twenty sepoys the governor ordered them to leave the fort immediately making a detour to avoid the english who were aiding the fleet by attacking the land side and to march to Kusum Bazaar to join Monsieur Law, who commanded there. Then, there remaining in the fort only the clerks, women, and wounded, they, he hoisted a flag of truce. Terms were speedily arranged. The governor and all the civilians and natives were allowed to go where they choose with their clothes and linen. The wounded French soldiers were to remain as prisoners of war. Chen Dranagor cost the English two hundred and six men. The attack upon the French colony was blamed by many at the time, for in the hour of English distress they had offered to remain neutral instead of joining the nabob in crushing us. Upon the other hand, there was force in the arguments with which Admiral Watson had defended his refusal to sign the Treaty of Neutrality that treaty would not be binding unless ratified by Pondicherry, and to Pondicherry it was known that the most powerful fleet and army france had ever sent to india was on its way it was also known that bussy at the court of nizam 
of the Deccan was in communication with the Nabob. Thus, then, in a short time, England's interests in India might be menaced more formidably than ever before, and the crushing out of the French colony almost at the gates of Calcutta was a measure of extreme importance. It was hard upon the gallant governor of Chandranagore, but public opinion generally agreed that the urgency of the case justified the course adopted by the English authorities at Calcutta. Suraja U. Dowla was filled with fury at the news of the capture of the Chandranagore, but hearing a rumor two days later that the Afghans were upon their march to attack him, he wrote letters to Clive and Watson, congratulating them upon their success and offering to them the territory of Chan Dranagor on the same terms upon which it had been held by the French. But the young tyrant of Moors Hedabob was swayed by constantly fluctuating feelings. At one moment his fears were uppermost, the next his anger and hate of the English. Instead of recalling the army of Raja Dulab Ram, as he had promised, he ordered it to halt at Plassey, a large village twenty-two miles south of Moors Hedabad. The English were represented at his court by Mr. Watts, who had the greatest difficulty in maintaining his position in the constantly changing moods of the Nabob. One day the latter would threatened to order him to be led to the instant execution. The next he would load him with presents. Besides Mr. Watts, the English affairs were conducted by Omichion, who, aided by the sets or native bankers, whom Suraja Udala had plundered and despoiled, got up a conspiracy among the nabob's most intimate followers. The history of these intrigues is the most unpleasant feature in the life of Clive. Mir Jaffna, the nabob's general, himself offered to Mr. Watts to turn traitor if the succession to the kingdom was bestowed upon him. This was agreed to upon his promise to pay not only immense sums to the company, but enormous amounts to the principal persons on the English side. So enormous, indeed, were these demands that even Mir Jaffia, anxious as he was to conclude the alliance, was aghast. The squadron was to have two million and a half rubies, and the same amount was to be paid for the army. Presents amounted to six millions of rupees were to be distributed between Clive, Major Kirkpatrick, and the governor, the governor and the members of the council. Clive's share of these was enormous sums amounted to two million, eighty thousand rupees. In those days, a rupee was worth half a crown. Never did an English officer make such a bargain for himself. But even this is not the most dishonorable feature of the transaction. Omichion had, for some time, been kept in the dark as to what was going forward but obtaining information through his agents, he questioned Mr. Watts concerning it. The latter then informed him of the whole state of affairs, and Omichon, whose services to the English had been immense, naturally demanded a share of the plunder. Whether or not he threatened to diverge the plot to the nabob, unless his demands were satisfied, is doubtful. At any rate, it was considered prudent to pacify him, and he was accordingly told that he should receive the sum he named. Clive and the members of the council, however, although willing to gratify their own extortionate greed at the expense of Mir Jaffia, determined to rob Omichion of his share. In order to do this, two copies of the treaty with Mir Jaffia were drawn up, on different colored papers. They were exactly alike, except that in one the amount to be given to the Amitian was entirely omitted. This was the real treaty. The other was intended to be destroyed after being shown to a friend of Omitian in order to convince 
the latter that all was straight and honorable all the english authorities placed their signatures to the real treaty but admiral watson indignantly refused to have anything to do with the fictitious one or to be a party in any way to the deceit practiced on omichun in order to get out of the difficulty clive himself forged admiral watson's signature to the fictitious treaty a more disgraceful transaction was never entered into by a body of english gentlemen that mr drake and the members of his council the pitiful cowards who fled from calcutta and refused to allow the ships to draw off its brave garrison should consent to such a transaction was but natural but that clive the gallant and dashing commander should have stooped to it is sad indeed it may be said that to the end of his life clive defended his conduct in this transaction under the excuse that amichan was a scoundrel the indian was not indeed an estimable character openly he was the friend and confidant of the nabob while all the time he was engaged in bribing and corrupting his officers and in plotting with his enemies this however in no way alters the facts that he rendered inestimable service to the english and that the men who deceived and cheated him were to the full as greedy and grasping as himself without in the case of the governor and his council having rendered any service whatever to the cause at last the negotiations were complete more and more severely did clive press upon the nabob having compelled him to expel law and the french first from the moors hedabad and then from his dominions he pressed fresh demands upon him until the unfortunate prince driven to despair and buoyed up with the hope that he should receive assistance from Busi, who had just expelled the english from their factory at visapatam ordered mir jaffe to advance with fifteen thousand men to reinforce rajah dulab ram at plassey clive in fact forced on hostilities his presence with that of a considerable portion of his army was urgently required at madras he was sure however that the instant he had gone and the english force was greatly weakened the nabob would again commence hostilities and the belief was shared by all in india he was therefore determined to force on the crisis as soon as possible in order that the nabob being disposed of he should be able to send reinforcements to madras while these negotiations had been going on charlie marriott had remained in calcutta he had been severely wounded in the attack on chandranagor and was carried down to calcutta in a boat on arriving there he heard that the lizzie anderson had just cast anchor off the fort he caused himself at once to be conveyed on board and was received with the greatest heartiness and pleasure by his old friend the captain and assiduously attended by the doctor of the ship in order that he might have as much air as possible the captain had a sort of tent with a double covering erected on deck during the daytime the sides of this were lifted so that the air could pass freely across the bed charlie's wound was a severe one and had he been nursed in a hospital on shore it is probable that it would have been fatal thanks however to the comforts on board ship the freshness and coolness of the situation and the care of all surrounding him he was after some weeks illness pronounced convalescent and was sufficiently recovered to join the force with which clive marched against plassey this force consisted of nine hundred and fifty european infantry a hundred artillerymen fifty sailors and two thousand one hundred supports the artillery consisted of eight six-pounders and two small howitzers the army of the nabob was fifty thousand strong and against such a force it was indeed an adventurous task for an army of three thousand men of whom only one-third 
for Europeans to advance to the attack. Everything depended, in fact, upon the Mir Jaffier and his two colleagues in treachery, Raja Dulab Ram and Yar Luft Khan. The Nabob, on hearing of Clive's advance, had sent to Monsieur Law, who was with a hundred and fifty men at a place over a hundred miles distant, to which he had, in accordance with the orders of Clyde, been obliged to retire, and begged him to advance to join him with all speed. The Nabob had with him forty or fifty Frenchmen, commanded by Monsieur St. Fraz, formerly one of the Council of Chadranagor. These had some field pieces of their own, and also directed the native artillery of fifty-three guns, principally thirty-two, twenty-four, and eighteen pounders. Had Clive been sure of the cooperation of Mir Jaffia and his confederates, who commanded three out of the four divisions of the Nabob's army, he need not have hesitated. But he was, till the last moment, in ignorance whether to rely upon them. The Nabob, having become suspicious of Mir Jaffia, had obtained from him an oath, sworn on the Koran, of fidelity, and although the traitor continued his correspondence with Clive, his letters were of very dubious character, and Clive was in total ignorance as to his real intentions. So doubtful, indeed, was he that, when only a few miles of ground and the river Bagirathi lay between him and the enemy, Clive felt the position so serious that he called a council of war and put to them the question whether they should attack the Nabob or fortify themselves at Katwar and hold that place until the rainy season which had just set in with great violence, should abate. All the officers above the rank of subalterns, twenty in number, were present. Clive himself, contrary to custom, gave his vote first in favor of halting at Katwa, Major King Patrick, who commanded the company's troops, Major Grant of the 37th, and ten other officers voted the same way. Major Erie Coots declared in favor of an immediate advance. He argued that the troops were in high spirits and had hitherto too, been everywhere successful and that a delay would allow Monsieur Law and his troops to arrive. He considered that if they determined not to fight, they should fall back upon Calcutta. Charlie Marriott supported him, as did five other officers, all belonging to the Indian service. The decision taken, the council separated, and Clive strolled away to a grove and sat down by himself. There he thought over, in his mind, the arguments which had been advanced by both sides. He saw the force of the arguments which had been adduced by Major Eric Coote and Charlie Marriott, and his own experience showed him that the daring course is always the most prudent one in fighting Asiatics. At last, he came to a conclusion. Rising, he returned to the camp, and meeting Major Coote on the way, informed him that he had changed his mind and would fight the next day. Charlie returned to his tent after the council broke up, disheartened at the results. He was greeted by Tim. Sure, Your Honor, Hossein is in despair. The water has filled up the holes where he makes his fires, and the rain has soaked the wood. Your dinner is not near cooked yet, and half the dishes are spoilt. It does not matter a bit, Tim, Charlie said. You know I'm not particular about my eating, though Hossein will always prepare a dinner fit for an alderman. We are going to fight them tomorrow, Your Honor, I hope. Tim said, it's sick to death I am of wading around here in the wet, like a duck. It's as bare as the bogs of Old Island, without the blessings of the pigs and potatoes, to say nothing of the colleens. No, Tim, I'm afraid we're going to stop where we are for a bit. The Council of War have decided not to fight. Sure, then, that's bad news, Tim said. The worst I've heard for many a day. 
what if there be fifty thousand of them master charles haven't we bade em at long odds before and can't we do it again i think we could tim charlie replied but the odds of fifty-three heavy cannon which the spies say they got to our ten popcorns is serious however i'm sorry we're not going to fight and i'm afraid that you must take up your mind to the wet and hussein his to giving me bad dinners for some weeks to come that is to say if the enemy don't turn us out of this a few minutes later lieutenant peters entered the tent is it true charlie that we are not going to fight after all true enough charlie said we are to wait till the rains are over rains peter said in disgust what have the rains got to do with it if we had a six weeks march before us i can understand the wet weather being a hindrance men are not water rats and to watch all day in these heavy downpours and to lie all night in the mud would soon tell upon our strength but here we are within a day's march of the enemy and the men might as well get wet in the field is here every one belongs to be at the enemy and a halt will have a very bad effect what have you got to drink charlie i have some brandy and rum nothing else charlie said what will be better than either for you is a cup of tea hossein makes it as well as ever i suppose you have dined yes half an hour ago just as charlie finished his meal major ear cooled put his head into the tent marriott the chief has changed his mind we cross the river the first thing in the morning and move at once upon plassey hurray charlie shouted clive is himself again that is good news indeed you will move your sepoys down to the river at daybreak and will be the first to cross there is no chance of any opposition as the spies tell us that the nabob has not arrived yet at plassey several other officers afterwards dropped into the tent for the news rapidly spread through the camp there was as had been the case at the council considerable differences of opinion as to the prudence of the measure but among the junior officers and men the news that the enemy were to be attacked at once was received with hearty satisfaction here major a fellow subaltern of peters said as he entered the tent followed by a servant i have brought in a half a dozen bottles of champagne i started with a dozen from calcutta and had intended to keep these to celebrate our victory but as in the first place all heavy baggage is to be left here and in the second it has occurred to me that possibly i may not come back to help to drink it we may as well turn it to the good purpose of drinking success to the expedition some of the bottles were opened and a merry evening was spent but the party broke up early for they had a heavy day's work before them on the morrow at daybreak the troops were in movement towards the banks of the Bagaridi. They had brought boats with them from the Chandranagar, and the work of crossing the river continued, without intermission, until four in the afternoon when the whole force was landed on the left bank. Here Clive received another letter from Mir Jaffier, informing him that the Nabob had halted at Mankara, and intended to entrench himself there he suggested that the english should undertake a circuitous march and attack him in the rear but as this march would have exposed clive to being cut off from his communications and as he was still very doubtful of the good faith of the conspirators he determined to march straight forward and sent word to mir jaffier to that effect from the point where Clive had crossed the Bag Girati, it was fifteen miles to Plassey, following as they did the curves of the river. 
It was necessary to do this, as they had no carriage, and the men were obliged to tow their supplies in boats against the stream. Orders were issued that as soon as the troops were across, they should prepare to eat their dinners, as the march was to be resumed at once. The rain was coming down in a steady pour, as the troops, drenched to the skin, started upon their march. The stream, swollen by the rains, was in full flood, and the work of towing the heavy-laden barges was wearisome in the extreme. All took a share in the toil. In many cases, the river had overflowed its banks, and the troops had to struggle through the water up to their waist while they tugged and strained at the ropes. Charlie, as a mountain officer, rode at the head of his sepoys, who formed the advance of the force. Three hundred men preceded the main body, who were towing the boats, to guard them from any sudden surprise. Tim marched beside him, occasionally falling back and taking a turn at the ropes. This is dog's work, Mr. Charles, he said. It's lucky that it's raining, for the river can't make us wetter than we are. My hands are fairly sore with pulling at the ropes. Ah, Tim, you're not found the ropes, you know. You remember that night at Moore's head of bod? Faith, your honor, and I'll not forget it if I live to be as old as Methuselah. Well, your honor, it will be hard on us if we do not thrash them niggers. Tomorrow, after all the trouble we are taking to be at them. At one o'clock in the morning, the weary troops reached the village of Plassey. They marched through it and halted and bivouacked in a large mango grove short distance beyond. End of chapter 22「Plassey」Scarcely had the soldiers taken off their packs when the sound of martial music was heard. Charlie was speaking at the time to Major Coote. There are the enemy, sure enough, the latter said. The old rascal, Mir Jaffier, must have been deceiving us when he said that the Nabob had halted at Mankara, and I'm afraid he means to play us false. I expect, Charlie remarked, that he does not know what he means himself. These Asiatics are at any time ready to turn traitors and to join the strongest at present, Jaffier does not know what is the stronger, and I think it is likely enough that he will take as little share as he can in the battle tomorrow till he sees which way it is going. Then, if we are getting the best of it, the rascal will join us, for the sake of the advantages which he expects to gain. If the day is going against us, he will do his best to complete his master's victory and showed proofs of his intended treasury ever come to light. He will clear himself by saying that he intended to deceive us all along and merely pretending to treat with us in order to throw us off our guard and so deliver us into the hands of the master. Yes, Major Earcoat replied, these Mohammedan chiefs are indeed crafty and treacherous rascals. The whole story of India shows that gratitude is a feeling altogether unknown to them, and that whatever favors a master may have lavished upon them, they are always ready to betray him, if they think that by so doing they will better their position. Now I shall lie down and try to get a few hours sleep before morning. I am wet to the skin, but fortunately in these sultry nights that matters little. I must go my rounds, Charlie said, and see that the sentries are on the alert. If the men were not so tired, I should have said that the best plan would have been to make a dash straight at the enemy's camp. It would take them quite unprepared, even if they know, as I dare say they do, that we are close at hand and they would lose all the advantage of their artillery. Yes, if we had arrived an hour before sunset, so as to be able to learn something of the nature of the ground, that would be our best course. Major Coote agreed. But even if the troops had been fresh, 
A night attack on an unknown position is a hazardous undertaking. Good night. I must see Clive and take his last orders. At daybreak, the English were astir, and the position of the enemy became visible. He occupied strongly entrenched works, which the Raja Dunlab Ram had thrown up during his stay. The right of these works rested on the river, and extended inland, at a right angle to it, for about two hundred yards, and then swept round to the north, and at obtruse angle, for nearly three miles. At the angle was a redoubt mounted with cannon. In advance of this was a mound covered with jungle. Halfway between the entrenchments and the mango grove were two large tanks near the river, surrounded by high mounds of earth. These tanks were about half a mile from the English position on the river. A little in advance of the grove was a hunting box belonging to the nabob, surrounded by a masonry wall. Clive took possession of this. He immediately he heard the sound of the nabob's music on his arrival. Soon after daylight, the nabob's troops moved out from their entrenchments, and it was evident that he was aware of the position of the English. The French, with their four field guns, took up their post on the mound of the tank nearest to the grove, and about half a mile distant from it and in the narrow space between them and the river two heavy guns under a native officer were placed behind the french guns was the division of mir mudin khan the one faithful general of the nabob it consisted of five thousand horse and seven thousand foot extending in the arc of a circle towards the village of plassey were the troops of the three traitor generals, Raja Dulab Ram, Yar Luft Khan, and Mir Jaffier. Thus the English position was almost surrounded, and in advancing against the camp, they would have to expose themselves to an attack in rear by the troops of the conspirators. These generals had between them nearly 38,000 troops. From the roof of the hunting box, Clive watched the progress of the enemy's movements. He saw at once that the position which they had taken up was one which would entail the absolute destruction of his force should he be defeated, and that this depended entirely upon the course taken by the conspirators. Against such a force as that opposed to him, if these remained faithful to their master, success could hardly be hoped for. However, it was now too late to retreat, and the only course was to show a bold front. Clive accordingly moved his troops out from the mango trees to a line with the hunting box. The Europeans were formed in the center with three field pieces on each side. The native troops were on either flank. Two field guns and the two howitzers were placed a little in advance of the hunting box, facing the fence position on the mound. At eight o'clock in the morning of the 23rd of June, a memorable day in the annals of India, the preparations on both sides were complete, and St. Freas opened the battle by the discharge of one of his guns at the English. At the signal, the whole of the artillery round the long curve opened their fire. The ten little guns replied to this overwhelming discharge, and for half an hour continued to play on the dense masses of the enemy. But however well they might be handled, they could do little against the fire of the fifty pieces of cannon concentrated upon them. Had these been all served by European artillerymen, the British force would have been speedily annihilated as they stood. The natives of India, however, were extremely clumsy gunners. They fired but slowly and had the feeblest idea of elevation. Consequently, their balls, for the most part, went far over the heads of the English, and the four field guns of St. Frias did more execution than the fifty heavy pieces of the nabob. At the end of half an hour, however, Clive had lost thirty of his men and had determined to fall back to the mango grove. 
leaving a party in the hunting box and in the brick kilns in front of it in which the guns had been posted to harass st francis's battery with their musketry fire he withdrew the rest of his force into the grove here they were in shelter for it was surrounded by a high and thick bank behind this the men sat down while parties set to work piercing holes through the banks as embrasures for the guns the enemy on the retreat of the british within the grove advanced with loud shouts of triumph and bringing their guns closer again opened fire the british had by this time pierced the holes for their field pieces and these opened so vigorously that several of the enemy's cannons were disabled numbers of their gunners killed and some ammunition wagons blown up on the other hand the english now in perfect shelter did not suffer at all although the tops of the trees were cut off in all directions by the storm of cannonballs which swept through them although the english fire was producing considerable loss among the enemy this was as nothing in comparison to its enormous number and at eleven o'clock clive summoned his principal officers around him and it was agreed that as mir jaffier and his associates of whose position in the field they were ignorant showed no signs of drawing off or of treachery to their master it was impossible to risk an attack upon the front since they would as they pressed forward be enveloped by the forces in the rear it was determined therefore that unless any unexpected circumstance occurred they should hold their present position till nightfall and should at midnight attack the enemy's camp a quarter of an hour later a tremendous tropical shower commenced and for an hour the rain came down in torrents gradually the enemy's fire slackened the english had tarpaulins to cover their ammunition which therefore suffered no injury the natives had no such covering and their powder was soon completely wetted by the deluge of rain Mir Mudin Khan, knowing that his own guns had been rendered useless, believed that those of the English were in a similar condition, and, leading out his cavalry, made a splendid charge upon the grove. The English were in readiness. As the cavalry swept up, a flash of fire ran from a thousand muskets from the top of the embankments, while each of the field guns sent its load of great shot through the embouchures into the throng of horsemen the effect was decisive the cavalry recoiled before the terrible fire and rode back with their brave leader mortally wounded the blow was fatal to the fortunes of shuraja dalla when the news of the death of his brave and faithful general reached him he was struck with terror he had long suspected mir jaffier of treachery but he had now no one else to rely upon sending for that general he reminded him in touching terms of the benefits which he had received at the hands of his father and conjured to him to be faithful to him throwing his turban upon the ground he said jaffier you must defend that turban jaffier responded with assurances of his loyalty and sincerity and promised to defend his sovereign with his life then riding off he at once dispatched a messenger to clive informing him of what had happened and urging him to attack at once as long as mir mudin khan lived it is probable that mir jaffier was still undecided as to the part he should play while that general lived it was possible even probable that the english would be defeated even should the traders take no part against them his death however left the whole management of affairs in the hands of the three conspirators and their course was now plain scarcely had mir jaffier left the nabob than the unhappy young man who was still under twenty years old turned to rajah dulab ram for counsel and advice the trader gave him counsel that led to his destruction 
He told him that the English could not be attacked in their position, that his troops, exposed to the fire of their guns, were suffering heavily and losing heart, and he advised him at once to issue orders for them to fall back within their entrenchments. He also advised him to leave the field himself and to retire to Mooreshedabad, leaving it to his generals to annihilate the English should they venture to attack them. Suraja Dawla, at no time capable of thinking for himself, and now bewildered by the death of the general he knew to be faithful to him, and by his doubts as to the fidelity of the others, fell into the snare. He at once issued orders for the troops to retire within their entrenchments, and then, mounting a swift camel and accompanied by two thousand horsemen, he left the field and rode off to Mooreshedabad. The movement of retirement at once commenced. The three trader generals drew off their troops, and these of Mir Mudin Khan also obeyed orders and fell back. Saint Franz, however, refused to obey. He saw the ruin which would follow upon the retreat, and he pluckily continued his fire. Clive, after the council had decided that nothing should be done till nightfall, and had laid down in the hunting box to snatch a little repose his thoughts having kept him awake all night major kilpatrick seeing the retirement of the enemy and that the french artillery men remained unsupported on the mound at once advanced with two hundred and fifty europeans and two guns against it sending word to clive what he was doing clive angry that any officer should have taken so important a step without consulting him at once ran after the detachment and severely reprimanded major kilpatrick for moving against the grove without his orders immediately however that he comprehended the whole position he recognized the wisdom of the course kilpatrick had taken and sent him back to the grove to order the whole force to advance. St. Frias, seeing that he was entirely unsupported, fired a last shot, and then, limbering up, fell back in perfect order to the redoubt at the corner of the entrenchment, where he again posted his field pieces in readiness for action. Looking around the field, Clive saw that two of the divisions which formed the arc of the circle were marching back towards the entrenchments, and that the third, that on the left of their line, had wheeled round and was marching towards the rear of the grove, not having received the letter which Mir Jaffia had written to him. He supposed that this movement indicated an intention to attack his baggage, and he therefore detached some European troops with a field gun to check the advance. Upon the gun opening fire, the enemy's division halted. It ceased its advance, but continued apart from the rest of the enemy. In the meantime, Clive had arrived upon the mound which St. Fry's had left, and, planting his guns there, opened fire upon the enemy within their entrenchments. The Indian soldiers and the inferior officers, knowing nothing of the treachery of their chiefs, were indignant at being thus cannonaded in their entrenchments by a foe so inferior in strength and horse foot and artillery poured out again from the entrenchments and attacked the british the battle now raged in earnest clive posted half his infantry and artillery on the mound of the tank nearest to the enemy's entrenchments and the greatest part of the rest of the rising ground, 200 yards to the left of it, while he placed 160 picked shots, Europeans and natives, behind the tank close to the entrenchments, with orders to keep up a continuous musketry fire upon the enemy as they sallied out. The enemy fought bravely. St. Frias worked his guns unflinchingly at the redoubt. The infantry poured in volley after volley. The cavalry made desperate charges right up to the British lines, but they had no leader and were fighting against men well commanded and confident in themselves. Clive observed that the division 
on the enemy's extreme left remained inactive and detached from the army and it for the first time struck him that this enemy's extreme left and it for the first time struck him that this was the division of mir javier relieved for the safety of his baggage and from the attack which had hitherto threatened in his rear he at once determined to carry the hill in advance of saint frere's battery and the redoubt occupied by the french leader strong columns were sent against each position the hill was carried without opposition and then so heavy and searching a fire was poured into the entrenched camp that the enemy began to fall back in utter confusion st frias finding himself isolated and alone in the redoubt as he had before been on the mound was forced to retire at five o'clock the battle was over and the camp of the nabob of bengal in the possession of the english the British loss was trifling. Seven European and sixteen native soldiers were killed, thirteen Europeans, and thirty-six natives wounded. It was one of those decisive battles of the world, for the fate of India hung in the balance. Had Clive been defeated and his force annihilated, as it must have been if beaten, the English would have been swept out of Bengal. The loss of that presidency would have had a decided effect on the struggle in Madras, where the British were, with the greatest difficulty, maintaining themselves against the French. Henceforth, Bengal, the richest province in India, belonged to the English. For although for a time they were content to recognize Mir Hafier and his successors as its nominal rulers, these were but puppets in their hands, and they were virtual masters of the province. After the battle, Mir Hafier arrived. Conscious of his own double dealing, he by no means felt sure of the reception he should meet with. It suited Clive, however, to ignore the doubtful part he had played and he was saluted as the nabob of bengal it would have been far better for him had he remained one of the great chiefs of bengal the enormous debt with which clive and his colleagues had saddled him crushed him the sum was so vast that it was only by imposing the most onerous taxation upon his people that he was enabled to pay it and the discontent excited proved his destruction. Omichan had no great reason for satisfaction at the part which he had played in the ruin of his country. The fact that he had been deceived by the forged treaty was abruptly and brutally communicated to him, and the blow broke his heart. He shortly afterwards became insane and died before 18 months was over. Suraja Dalla fled to Moors Hedabad, where the remnants of his army followed him. At first, the Nabob endeavored to secure their fidelity by issuing a considerable amount of pay. Then, overpowered by his fears of treachery, he sent off the ladies of the Zenana and all his treasures on elephants, and a few hours afterwards, he himself, accompanied by his favorite wife and a slave with a casket of his most valuable jewels, fled in disguise. A boat had been prepared and lay in readiness at the wharf of the palace. Rowing day and night against the stream, the boat reached Rajmahal, ninety miles distant on the right of the fourth day following the flight. Here the rowers were so knocked up by their exertions that it was impossible to proceed further, and they took refuge in a deserted hut by the bank. The following morning, however, they were seen by a fakir whose ears the young tyrant had cut off. 
nineteen months previously. And this man, recognizing the nabob even in his disguise, at once took the news to Mir Javier's brother, who happened to reside in the town. The latter immediately sent a party of his retainers who captured the nabob without difficulty. He was again placed in the boat and taken back to Morshedabad, where he was led into the presence of Mir Hafia. The wretched young man implored the mercy of his triumphant successor, the man who owed station and rank and wealth to his grandfather, and who had nevertheless betrayed him to the English. His entreaties so far moved Mir Hafia that he was irresolute for a time as to the course that he should pursue. His son, however, Miraviv, a youth of about the same age as the deposed Nabob, insisted that it was folly to show mercy, as Mir Hafia would never be safe so long as the Zoraja Dalla remained alive and his father at last assigned the captive to his keeping, knowing well what the result would be. In the night, Suraja Dalla was murdered. His mangled remains were in the morning placed on an elephant and exposed to the gaze of the populace and soldiery. Suraja Dalin was undoubtedly a profligate and rapacious tyrant. In the course of a few months, he alienated his people and offended a great number of his most powerful chiefs. The war which he undertook against the English, although at the moment unprovoked, must still be regarded as a patriotic one, and had he not soiled his victory by the massacre of the prisoners, which he first permitted and then approved, the English would have had no just cause of complaint against him. From the day of the arrival of Clive at Calcutta, he was doomed. It is certain that the nabob would not have remained faithful to his engagements. When the danger which wrung the concessions from him had passed, nevertheless, the whole of the circumstances which followed the signature of the treaty, the manner in which the unhappy youth was alternately cajoled, cajoled and bullied to his ruin, the loathsome treachery in which those around him engaged with the connivance of the English, and lastly, the murder in cold blood which Mir Hafia, our creature, was allowed to perpetuate, rendered the whole transaction one of the blackest in the annals of English history. End of chapter 23「ジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパンクリーディングジャパ The governor there has been writing to me by every ship which has come up the coast, begging me to move down with the bulk of the force as soon as affairs are a little settled here. That is out of the question. There are innumerable matters to be arranged. Mir Jaffier must be sustained. The French, under law, must be driven entirely out of Bengal. The Dutch must be dealt with. Altogether, I have need of every moment of my time and of every man under my orders for at least two years. 
However, I shall at once raise a Bengal native army and so release the sepoys of Madras if there be any special and sore need. I must, of course, denude myself here of troops to succor Madras, but I hope it will not come to that. In the meantime, I propose that you shall take back two hundred of the Madras Europeans. Lawrence will be glad to have you, and your chances of fighting are greater there than they will be here. Bengal is over awed, and so long as I maintain the force I now have, it is unlikely in the extreme to rise, whereas battles and sieges, great and small, are the normal conditions of Madras. The next day, Charlie, with 200 European troops, marched down towards Calcutta. Clive had told him to select any officer he pleased to accompany him as second in command, and he chose Peters, who, seeing that there were likely to be far more exciting times in Madras than in Bengal at present, was very glad to accompany him. Three days after reaching Calcutta, Charlie and his party embarked on board a ship which conveyed them without adventure to Madras. The authorities were glad, indeed, of the reinforcement, for the country was disturbed from end to end. Since the departure of every available man for Calcutta, the company had been able to afford but little aid to Muhammad Ali, and the authority of the latter had dwindled to a mere shadow in the Carnatic. The Maharatas made incursions in all directions. The minor chiefs revolted and refused to pay tribute, and many of them entered into an alliance with the French. Disorder everywhere reigned in the Carnatic, and Trichinopoly was, again, the one place which Muhammad Ali held. The evening after landing, Charlie Marriott had a long chat with Colonel Lawrence who, after explaining to him exactly the condition of affairs in the country, asked him to tell him, frankly, what command he would like to receive. I have thought for some time, Charlie said, that the establishment of a small force of really efficient cavalry, trained to act as infantry, also would be invaluable. The Maharatta horsemen, by their rapid movements, set our infantry in defiance and the native horse of our allies are useless against them i am convinced that two hundred horsemen trained and drilled to take out cavalry at home would ride through any number of them in a country like this where every petty rajah has his castle cavalry alone could however do little they must be able to act as infantry and should have a couple of little four-pounders to take about with them. A force like this would do more to keep order in the Carnatic than one composed of infantry alone. Of ten times its strength, it would act as a police force, call upon petty chiefs who refuse to pay their share of the revenue, restore order in disturbed places, and permit the peasants to carry on their agricultural work, upon which the revenue of the company depends, and altogether render valuable services. Among the soldiers who came down with me is a sergeant who was at one time a trooper in an English regiment. He exchanged to come out with the 39th to India, and has again exchanged into the company's service. I would make him drill instructor if you will give him a commission as ensign. Peters I should like as my second in command, and if you approve of the plan, I should be very much obliged if you would get him his step as captain. He's a good officer and has not had such luck as I have. Colonel Lawrence was very much pleased at the idea and gave Charlie full authority to carry it out. The work of enlistment at once commenced. Hossein made an excellent recruiting sergeant. He went into the native bazaars, and by telling of the exploits of Charlie at Ambor and Suwan Drug, and holding out bright prospects of the plunder which such a force would be likely to obtain, 
he succeeded in recruiting a hundred and fifty of his co-religionists. In these days, fighting was a trade in India, and in addition to the restless spirits of the local community, great numbers of the hardy natives of northern India, Afghans, Pathans, and others were scattered over India, ever ready to enlist in the service of the highest bidder. Among such men as these, Hussein had no difficulty in obtaining a hundred and fifty picked horsemen. Charlie had determined that his force should consist of four troops, each of fifty strong. Of these, one would be composed of Europeans, and he was permitted to take this number from the party he had brought down. He had no difficulty in obtaining volunteers, for as soon as the nature of the force was known, the men were eager to engage in it. To this troop, the two little field pieces would be committed. A few days later, after the scheme had been sanctioned, Anste was at work drilling the recruits as cavalry. Charlie and Peters were instructed by him, also in the drill and words of command, and were soon able to assist. Two months were spent in severe work, and at the end of that time, the little regiment were able to execute all simple cavalry maneuvers with steadiness and regularity. The natives were all men who had lived on horseback from their youth and therefore required no teaching to ride. They were also, at the end of that time, able to act as infantry with as much regularity as the ordinary sepoys. When so engaged, four horses were held by one man, so that a hundred and fifty men were available for fighting on foot. The work had been unusually severe, but as the officers did not spare themselves, and Charlie had promised a present to each man of the troop when fit for service, they had worked with alacrity and had taken great interest in learning their few duties. At the end of two months, they were inspected by Colonel Lawrence and Governor Pigeot, and both expressed their highest gratification and surprise at their efficiency and anticipated great benefits would arise from the organization. So urgent indeed was the necessity that something should be done for the restoration of order that Charlie had with difficulty obtained the two months necessary to attain the degree of perfection which he deemed necessary. The day after the inspection, the troops marched out from Madras. Ensign Anstey commanded the white troop. The other three were led by native officers. Captain Peters commanded the squadron composed of the white troop and one of the others, a Lieutenant Hollows, whom Peter knew to be a hard-working and energetic officer, was, at Charlie's request, appointed to the command of the other squadron. He himself commanded the whole. So urgent, indeed, was the necessity that something should be done for the restoration of order that Charlie had, with difficulty, obtained the two months necessary to attain the degree of perfection which he deemed necessary. The day after the inspection, the troops marched out from Madras. Ensign Anstey commanded the white troop. The other three were led by native officers. Captain Peters commanded the squadron composed of the white troop and one of the others. A lieutenant, Hallows, whom Peters knew to be a hard-working and energetic officer, was at Charlie's request appointed to the command of the other squadron. He himself commanded the whole. They had been ordered, in the first place, to move to Arcot, which was held by a garrison of Muhammad Ali. The whole of the country around was greatly disturbed. French intrigued, and the sight of the diminished power of the English had caused most of the minor chiefs in that neighborhood to throw off their allegiance. A body of Maharatta horse were ravaging the country districts, 
and it was against these that Charlie determined, in the first place, to act. He had been permitted to have his own way in the clothing and arming of his force. Each man carried a musket, which had been shortened some six inches, and hung in slings from the saddle, the muzzle resting in a piece of leather, technically termed a bucket. The ammunition pouch was slung on the other side of the saddle and could be fastened in an instant by two straps to the belts which the troopers wore round their waists. The men were dressed in brown, thick cotton cloths called khaki. Round their black forage caps were wound a long length of blue and white cotton cloth, forming a turban with the ends hanging down to protect the back of the neck and spine from the sun. Having obtained news that the Mahratta horse, 2,000 strong, were pillaging at a distance of six miles from the town, Charlie set off the day following his arrival to meet them. The Mahratas had notice of his coming, but hearing that the force was consisted only of 200 horse, they regarded it with contempt. When Charlie first came upon them, they were in the open country, and seeing that they were prepared to attack him, he drew up his little force in two lines. The second line he ordered to dismount to act as infantry. The two guns were loaded with grape, and the men of the first line were drawn up at sufficient interviews to allow an infantryman to pass between each horse. With shouts of anticipated triumph, the Mahratta's horse swept down. The front line of English horsemen had screened the movements of those behind, and when the enemy were within fifty yards, Charlie gave the word. The troopers already sat, musket in hand, and between each horse, an infantry soldier now stepped forward, while towards each end the line opened and the two field pieces were advanced. The Mahratta's Horsemen were astonished at this sudden maneuver, but pressed by the mass from behind, they still continued their charge. When but fifteen yards from the English line, a stream of fire ran out along this from end to end. Every musket was emptied into the advancing force, while the guns on either flank swept them with grape. The effect was tremendous. Scarcely a man of the front line survived the fire, and the whole mass halted and recoiled in confusion. Before they could recover themselves, another volley of shot and grape was fired into them. Then Charlie's infantry ran back, and the cavalry, closing up, dashed upon the foe, followed half a minute afterwards by the lately dismounted man of the other two troops. Ten white soldiers alone remaining to work and guard by the guns. The effect of the charge of these two hundred disciplined horse upon the already disorganized mob of Mahratta horsemen was irresistible, and in a few minutes the Mahrattas were scattered in full flight over the plain, pursued by the British cavalry, now broken up into eight half troops. The rout was complete, and in a very short time the last Mahratta had fled leaving behind them three hundred dead upon the plain. Greatly gratified with their success and feeling confident now in their own powers, the British force returned to Arcut. Charlie now determined to attack the fort of Valor, which was regarded as impregnable. The town lay at the foot of some very steep and rugged hills, which were surmounted by three detached forts. The Raja, encouraged by the French, had renounced his allegiance to Muhammad Ali and had declared himself independent. As, however, it was certain that he was prepared to give assistance to the French when they took the field against the English, Charlie determined to attack the place. The French had received large reinforcements and had already captured many forts and strong places around Pondicherry. They were, however, awaiting the arrival of still larger forces, known to be on the way before they made a decisive and, as they hoped, final attack upon the English. The Rajah's army consisted of some 1,500 infantry and as many cavalry. 
these advanced to meet the english force charlie feigned a retreat as they came on and retired to a village some thirty miles distance the cavalry pursued at full speed leaving the infantry behind upon reaching the village charlie at once dismounted all his men lined with enclosures and received the enemy's cavalry as they galloped up with so heavy a fire that they speedily drew rein after trying for some time to force the position they began to fall back and the english force again mounted dashing upon them and completed their defeat the broken horsemen as they rode across the plain met their infantry advancing and those disheartened at the defeat of the cavalry fell back in great haste and abandoning the town which was without fortification retired at once to the forts commanding it charlie took possession of the town and spent the next two days in reconnoitering the forts the largest and nearest of these faced the right of town it was called suzaro the second on an even steeper hill was called guzaro the third which lay some distance behind this and was much smaller was called mortz azur charlie determined to attempt in the first place to carry guzaro as in this which was considered the most inaccessible the rajah himself had taken up his position having with him all his treasure charlie saw that it would be next to impossible with so small a force to carry it by a direct attack by the road which led to it as this was completely covered by its guns it appeared to him however that the rocks upon which it stood were by no means inaccessible he left twenty men to guard his guns placed a guard of ten upon the road leading up to the fort to prevent the inhabitants from sending up news of his intentions to the garrison who had with that of suzaro kept up a fire from their guns upon the town since his arrival there the moon was not to rise until eleven o'clock and at nine charlie marched with a hundred and seventy men from the town making a considerable detour he found himself at half past ten at the foot of the rocks rising almost sheer from the upper part of the hill he was well provided with ropes and ladders the most perfect silence he had been enjoined upon the men and in the darkness the march had been unseen by the enemy while waiting for the moon to rise the troopers all wound piece of cloth with which they were provided round their boots to prevent these from making a noise by slipping or stumbling on the rocks when the moon rose the ascent of the rocks began at the point which charlie had after a close inspection through a telescope judged to be the most accessible the toil was very severe one by one the men climbed ledge to ledge some of the most active hillmen from northern india leading the way and aiding their comrades to follow them by lowering ropes and placing ladders at the most inaccessible spots all this time they were completely hidden from the observation of the garrison above at last the leaders of the party stood at the foot of the walls which rose a few feet from the edge of the cliff the operation had been performed almost noiselessly the ammunition pouches had been left behind each man carrying ten rounds in his belt every piece of metal had been carefully removed from the uniform the very buttons having been cut off lest they should strike against the rocks and the muskets had been swathed up in thick covering the men as they gained the upper ridge spread along at the foot of the walls until the whole body had gathered there they could hear the voices of the sentries thirty feet above them but these having no idea of the vicinity of an enemy did not look over the edge of the wall indeed the parapets of the indian fortifications were always too high that it was only from projecting towers at the foot of the wall could be seen when the english force was assembled the ladders which like everything else had been muffled were placed against the walls and headed by their officers the troops ascended the surprise was complete not until the leaders of the storming party stood upon the parapet was their presence perceived the guards discharged their firelocks 
and fled hastily. As soon as twenty were collected on the wall, Charlie took the command of these and hurried forward towards the gate. Hallows was to lead the next party along the opposite direction. Peters was to form the rest up as they gained the wall and to follow Charlie with fifty more, while Anstey was to hold the remainder in reserve to be used as circumstances might demand. The resistance, however, was slight. Taken absolutely by surprise, the enemy rushed out from their sleeping places. They were immediately fired upon from the walls. The greater part ran back into shelter while some of the more determined gathering together made for the gate, but of this Charlie had already taken possession, and received them with so vigorous a fire that they speedily fell back. When the whole circuit of the wall was in its possession, Charlie took a hundred of his men and descended into the fort. Each building, as he reached it, was searched, and the garrison it contained made to come out and lay down their arms, and were then allowed to depart through the gate. Upon reaching the Rajah's quarters, he at once came out and surrendered himself. Two guns were discharged to inform the little body in the town of the complete success of the movement and the guard on the road then fell back and joined the party with the guns. Thus, without losing a man, the fort at Guzzaro, regarded by the natives as being impregnable, was carried. Fifteen lakhs of rupees were found in the treasury. Of these, in accordance with the rules of service, half was set aside for the company. The remainder became the property of the force. Of this, half fell to the officers, in proportion to their rank, and the rest was divided among the men. The share of each trooper amounted to nearly two hundred pounds. Knowing how demoralizing the possession of such a sum would be, Charlie assembled his force next morning. He pointed out to them that, as the greater part of the plunder was in silver, it would be impossible for them to carry it on their persons. He advised them then to allow the whole sum to remain in the treasury to be forwarded under an escort to Madras, each soldier to receive an order for the amount of his share upon the treasury there. This was agreed to unanimously, and Charlie then turned his attention to the other forts. The guns of Guzaro were turned against these, and a bombardment commenced. Suzero, which extended partly down the slope, was much exposed to the fire from Guzero, and although no damage could be done to the walls at so great a distance, the garrison, suffering from the fire and intimidated by the fall of Guzero, lost heart. Large numbers descended, and the governor, in the course of two days, thought it prudent to obey the orders which the Rajah had, upon being made captive, sent him to surrender. The next day, the governor of Mortz Azur followed his example and Valor, and its three strong forts were thus in the possession of the English. At Valor, Charlie nearly lost one of his faithful followers. Early in the morning, Hussein came into Charlie's room. Sahib, he said, something is the matter with Tim. What is the matter? Charlie said, sitting up in his bed. I do not know, Sahib. When I went to him, he did that move. He was wide awake, and his eyes were staring. When I went beside him, he shook his head a little and said, Shh, he seems quite rigid, and it is as pale as death. Charlie leaped out and hurried to Tim. The latter was lying on the ground in the next room. He had carried off three or four cushions from the Rajah's divan and had thrown these down and spread a rug over him. He lay on his back exactly as Hussein had described. As Charlie hurried up, Tim again gave vent to the warning. Shh! What is the matter, Tim? What is the matter, my poor fellow? Tim made a slight motion with his head for his master to bend towards him. Charlie leaned over, and he whispered, There is a serpent in bed with me. Are you quite sure, Tim? He woke me with his cold touch, Tim whispered. I felt him crawling against my foot, and now he is lying against my leg. 
Charlie drew back for a minute and consulted with Hussein. Lie quite still, Tim, he said, and don't be afraid. We will try to kill him without touching you. But even if he should bite you, with help ready at hand, there will be no danger. Charlie now procured two knives, the one a sharp surgical knife from a case which he had brought. The other he placed in the charcoal fire, which one of the men speedily fanned, until the blade had attained a white heat. Charlie had described that if the snake bit Tim, he would instantly make a deep cut through the line of the puncture of the fangs, cutting down as low as these could penetrate and immediately cauterizing it by placing the hot knife in the gash so made. Six men called in with orders to seize Tim on the instant and hold his leg firm to enable the operation to be performed. Two others were to occupy themselves with the snake. These were armed with sticks. Huzan now approached from the bed from which hitherto they had all kept well aloof. The snake, Tim said, lay against his leg between the knee and the ankle, and the spot was marked by a slight elevation of the rug. Huzan drew his tulwar, examined the edge to see that nothing had blunted its razor-like keenness, and then took his stand at the foot of the bed. Twice he raised his weapon, and then let it fall with a drawing motion. The keen blade cut through the rug as if it had been pasteboard, and at the same instant, Tim sprang from the other side of the bed and fainted in the arms of his men. Hussein threw off the rug, and there, severed in pieces, lay the writhing body of a huge cobra. Tim soon recovered under the administration of water sprinkled in his face and brandy poured down his throat but he was some time ere he thoroughly recovered from the effects of the trying ordeal through which he had passed. Many of the buildings in the fort were in very bad condition, and Charlie had several of the most dilapidated destroyed, finding in their walls several colonies of cobras, which were all killed by the troops. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of with Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Besieged in a Pagoda. A few days later, Charlie received a message from the Raja of Permacoil saying that he was besieged by a strong native force aided by the French. He had once moved his force to his assistance. He found that the besiegers, among whom were two hundred French troops, were too strong to be attacked. He therefore established himself in their rear, attacked and captured convoys, and prevented the country people from bringing in provisions. Several times the besieging infantry advanced against them, but before these he at once fell back, only to return as soon as they retired to their camp. Whenever their horse ventured out against him, he beat them back, with considerable loss. Ten days after his arrival, the enemy, finding it impossible to maintain themselves in the face of so active an enemy, and suffering greatly from want of provisions, raised the siege and fell back. As soon as they had drawn off, Charlie entered the port. The Raja received him with the greatest warmth, he was, however, much distressed at the capture of a hill fort at some distance from Permacoil. In this he had stowed his wives and treasure, thinking that it would be unmolested. The French, however, had, just before Charlie's arrival, detached a strong force with some guns, and these had captured the place. The force which had accomplished this had, he now heard, marched to Trinavodi, a fort and town thirty miles away upon the road by which the force which had besieged the town was retiring. The treasure was a considerable one, amounting to seven lakhs of rupees, and as the Raja stated his willingness that the troops should take possession of this, if they could but rescue his women, Charlie at once determined to attempt the feat. 
the main body of the enemy would not reach the place until the afternoon of the following day charlie soon collected his men and making a detour through the country arrived next morning within a mile of trinavody the town was a small one and the fort one of the ordinary native forts built in parallelogram with flanking towers the place however contained a very large and solidly built pagoda or temple it was surrounded by a wall forty feet high and at the gateway stood an immense tower with terraces rising one above the other capturing a native charlie learnt that the fort was tenanted only by the troops of the native rajah of the place the french detachment being encamped in the pagoda he at once rode forward with his troops dashed through the native town and in through the wide gateway of the tower into the courtyard within beyond two or three straggling shots from the sentries he had so far encountered no opposition and the native troops in the courtyard thrown into wild confusion by this sudden appearance of a hostile force threw down their arms and cried for mercy from the temple within however the french infantry a hundred strong opened a brisk fire charlie sent some of his men on to the tower whence their fire commanded the flat roof of the temple and these speedily drove the defenders from that post the field pieces were unlimbered and directed towards the gate of the inner temple while a musketry fire was kept up against every window and loophole in the building the gate gave way after a few shots had been fired and charlie led his party to the assault the french defended themselves bravely but they were outnumbered and were driven fighting from room to room until the survivors laid down their arms the assault however had cost the british a loss of twenty-five men the rajah of permacoil's treasure and his women fell into the hands of the captors charlie ordered the chests to be brought down and placed in bullock wagons just as he was about to order his men who were scattered through the temple looting to form up he heard a shout from the tower and looking up saw one of his men was gesticulating wildly he ran up the tower and on reaching the first terrace saw to his surprise the whole of the force which he believed to be fifty mile distance already entering the town the french officer in command knowing the activity and dash of his opponent and fearing that an attempt might be made to carry trinavati and recapture the rajah's treasure had marched all night when within a mile of the place he heard what had happened and at once pushed forward charlie saw that already his retreat was cut off and running to the edge of the terrace shouted to peters to hurry out with all the men already in the courtyard to occupy the houses outside the gate and to keep back the advancing enemy summoning another party to the tower four guns upon the terrace were at once loaded and these opened upon the head of the enemy's column as they entered the street leading to the temple in a short time a brisk fight began the enemy planted guns to bear upon the tower the cannon of the fort joined in the assault the infantry pressed forward through the houses and enclosures to the temple and was soon engaged with the men under captain peters while the guns and musketry from the tower also opened upon them having seen that the preparations to repulse an immediate attack were complete charlie again ran down to the courtyard the weak point of the defences was the gateway this was fifty feet wide and unprovided with gates and charlie at once set a strong party to work to form a barricade across it for some hours the party outside the gates maintained their position but they were gradually driven back and towards evening by charlie's orders they retired within the temple the barricade was now eight feet high the face was formed of large slabs of stone piled one upon another backed by a considerable thickness of earthwork this however although capable of resisting a sudden rush of infantry would charlie know be incapable of resisting artillery during the night he divided his men in two parties 
which alternately slept and worked at the inner defences which he had designed. These consisted of two walls running from each side of the gateway to the temple. They were placed a few feet further back than the edge of the gateway, so that an enemy advancing to the storm would not see them until within the gate. These walls he intended to be eight feet high and to be backed with earth four feet high, so as to form a bank on which the defenders could stand and fire into the space between them. To obtain materials, he pulled down several buildings forming a part of the temple. The distance from the gateway to the temple was fifty yards, and although the men worked without ceasing, the wall had made but little progress when daylight dawned. During the night, Charlie lowered one of his men from the wall furthest from the enemy with instructions to make his way as fast as possible to Madrez to ask for succor. In the morning, Charlie found that the enemy had on their side been also busy. A house which faced the end of the street leading to the temple had been pulled down and a battery of four guns erected there. As soon as it was light, the combat began. The enemy had 16 pieces of artillery beside those on the fort, and while the four guns in the front played unceasingly upon the barricade across the gateway, the others cannonaded the tower, whence the English guns kept up a fire on the battery in front. So well were these directed, and so heavy was the musketry that the enemy's guns were several times silenced and the artillerymen driven from them. Behind the barricade, a working party threw up fresh earth to strengthen the part most shaken by the enemy's fire, and then set to work to form a similar barricade in a line with the back of the gateway. This was completed by nightfall, by which time the enemy's guns had completely shattered the stone facing of the outer barricade, rendering it possible for it to be carried with a rush. As from the windows of the houses they could see the new work behind it, they would, Charlie judged, not attempt an assault until this also was destroyed. During the night, large quantities of fresh earth were piled on the outer barricade, which was now useful as forming a screen to that behind it from the guns. All night the work at the parallel walls continued, and by morning these had reached a height of three feet. During the next two days the fight continued without much advantage on either side. Each day the enemy's guns shattered the outer barricade, but this was as regularly repaired at night. In spite of the heavy artillery and matchlock fire which they kept up towards the spot. On the fourth day, the enemy pulled down a house standing just in the rear of their battery, and Charlie found that behind it they had erected another. It was a solidly built work of 15 feet in height, and the enemy must have labored continuously at it every night. It had a strong and high parapet of sandbags protecting the gunners from the musketry fire of the tower. The muzzles of four guns projected through the embrasures, which had been left for them, and these opened fire over the heads of the gunners in the lower battery. In spite of the efforts of the besieged, the enemy kept up so heavy a fire that, by the afternoon, the inner as well as the outer barricade was knocked to pieces. By this time, however, the inner walls were completed and the English waited the storm with confidence. The doorway of the temple had been closed and blocked up behind, but the doors had been shattered to pieces by the shot which had passed through the gateway, and the entrance now stood open. Inside the temple, out of the line of fire, Charlie had the two little field pieces, each crammed to the muzzle with bullets, placed in readiness to fire. The lower floor of the tower had been pierced above the gateway, and here two huge cauldrons filled with boiling lead stripped from the roof stood ready for action. At three in the afternoon, after a furious cannonade, the fire of the enemy's battery suddenly ceased. 
they had formed communication between the houses on either side of the street and at the signal the troops poured out from these in large bodies and rushed to the assault the guns from the tower which had been awaiting the moment poured showers of grapes among them but believing that the temple now lay at their mercy the enemy did not hesitate but rushed at the gateway not a shot was fired as they entered scrambling over the remains of the two barricades the enemy poured with exulting shouts into the courtyard then those in front hesitated on either hand as far as the doorway of the temple extended a massive wall eight feet high roughly built certainly but far too strong to be battered down too steep to be scaled they would have retreated but they were driven forward by the mass which poured in through the gateway behind them and seeing that their only safety was in victory they pressed forward again not a defender showed himself until the head of the column had reached the point two-thirds of the distance across the courtyard then suddenly on either side the wall was lined by british who had once opened a tremendous fire on the mass below at the same moment the guns were run into the doorway and poured their contents into the struggling mass pent up between the walls unable to return the fire poured down upon them with lanes torn through them by the discharge of the cannon the greater portion of the mass strove to turn and retire the officer in charge a gallant frenchman called upon the survivors of the fifty french infantry who had led the attack to follow him and rush forward upon the guns here however charlie had posted his europeans and these swarming out from the temple poured a volley into the advancing french and then charged them with the bayonet the pressure from behind had now ceased streams of boiling lead poured through the holes above the archway had effectively checked the advance and through this bolted shower the shattered remnants of the assaulting column now fled for their lives leaving two hundred and fifty of their best men dead behind them as the last of the column issued out the guns of the battery again angrily opened fire as charlie had anticipated the enemy finding how strong were the inner defences abandoned all further idea of attack by the gateway and leaving only two guns there to prevent a sortie placed their whole artillery on the western side of the pagoda and opened fire to prepare a beach there for a week the siege continued and then charlie determined to evacuate the place the rajah's treasure was made up into small sacks which were fashioned to the horses croups had it not been for these animals he would have defended the place to the last confident in his power to devise fresh means to repel fresh assaults the store of forage however collected by the enemy for their own use in the temple was now exhausted charlie directed peters with twenty men to sally out from the gate at midnight to enter the nearest house on the right hand side and to follow the communications made by the enemy before the assault until they came up to the end of the street lieutenant hallows with a similar party was to take the left side if they found any guards within the houses they would overpower these and rushing straight on to attack the battery and spike the guns should they find the houses deserted they would gather in the houses nearest the battery when peter was to fire his pistol as a signal to hallows and both parties were to attack the battery one of the inner walls had been pulled down and the main body of the force having the wounded and the ladies of the rajah's zanana in their center were to sally out the instant the guns were taken the plan was carried out with the greatest success the houses on both sides of the street were found to be deserted and as peters fired his gun the party dashed at the flanks of the battery the french gunners leaped to their feet and believing they were attacked in front discharged their cannon the grape shot swept along the empty street and through the gateway and charlie leading one of the troops at once dashed down the street 
At their first rush, Peters and Hallows had carried the battery, cutting down the gunners. Immediately behind, however, the enemy had posted a support, several hundred strong, and these speedily advanced to recover the battery. Leaving their horses in charge of a small party, Charlie dismounted his men and joined Peters, and, and his fire quickly checked the assault. In the meantime, the rest of the defenders of the temple rode down the street and, leaving a few men with the horses of Peters and Hollow's detachments, rode out into the open country. After driving back his assailants, Charlie led his party back to their horses, mounted them, and speedily rejoined their main body. An hour later, they were well on their way towards Permacoil, which they reached the next day. The Raja was delighted at recovering his family. The treasure was divided, and the portion belonging to the troops was, with the company's share, sent down under a strong escort to Madras. For a considerable time, Charlie's force was occupied with small undertakings. Lally had now arrived from France and had taken the command. He had, at his orders, a European force considerably exceeding any that had hitherto been gathered in India, and he boasted that he was going to capture Madras and drive the English out of India. Nothing could have been more unfortunate for the French than the choice of such a man, and his appointment was destined to give the last blow to French influence in India as the supersession of Duplex had given the first. Monsoir Lally had one virtue. He was personally brave, but he was arrogant, passionate, and jealous. He had no capacity whatever for either awning or conciliating those with whom he came in contact. He treated the natives with open contempt, and was soon as much hated by them as by his own soldiers. His first step had been to order Bussy down from Hyderabad with the whole of his force. Bussy, a man of great genius, of extreme tact, of perfect knowledge of the Indian character, had for eight years maintained influence supreme at that court and had acquired for France the northern Sirkars a splendid and most valuable province. On the sea course north of Madras, Salabut Jung, the ruler of Hyderabad, the protege of the French, heard with dismay the order which Bussy had received. To Bussy himself, the blow was a heavy one, and he saw that his departure would entail the ruin of the edifice of French influence, which he had built up by so many years of thought and toil. However, he obeyed at once and marched with 250 Europeans and 500 native troops into Sirkars. He made over the charge of this treaty to the Marquis de Conflans, who, although had just arrived from Europe and entirely new to Indian affairs, Count de Lally had sent to replace Monsieur Morrison, who had for years ably managed the province, he then marched with his troop to join the main army under Count de Lally. This force, having taken Fort St. David, had operated against Tanjore, where it had suffered a repulse. The news of this reached the northern Sirkars. Soon after the departure of Bussi and Anadaz, the most powerful chief of the country, rose in rebellion and sent a messenger to Calcutta, begging the assistance of the English to drive out the French. While the rest of the Bengal council, seeing that Bengal was, at the time, threatened with invasion from the north and menaced with troubles within, considered that it would be an act little short of madness to send troops at a time when they could be so little spared, to assist the chief who, even from his own accounts, was only able to raise 3,000 irregular followers. Olive thought otherwise. He saw the great value of the northern Sikars, whose possession would complete the line of British territory along the seacoast from Calcutta down to Madras. He saw, too, that a movement here could effect 
a diversion in favor of madras the situation there appeared very serious and he could spare no troops which would suffice to turn the scale but even should madras be lost the gain of the northern sirkars would almost compensate for the disaster having gained the council to his views he sent lieutenant colonel ford who commanded the company's troops in bengal with five hundred europeans two thousand natives and six six-pounders by sea to visit Gapachium, a port which anandras had seized this landed on the twentieth october seventeen fifty eight had Kernflans been an efficient officer, he could have crushed Anandras long before the arrival of the English. He had under his orders a force composed of 500 European troops, men trained by Bussy and accustomed to victory, 4,000 native troops and a brigade of artillery. Instead of marching at once to crush the rebellion, he sent messenger after messenger to Lally, begging for assistance. It was only when he heard from Lally that he had directed Morrison with 300 European troops to support him that he moved against Anandras. His opportunity had, however, slipped from his hands. He had thrown away six weeks, and when, upon the march, the news reached him of the landing of the English, he took up the very strong position within sight of Fort Petipur, and entrenched himself there. Clive had sent to Madras the news that he was dispatching Colonel Ford to the sick cars, and begged that anybody of troops who might be available might be forwarded. Charlie's corps had already been recalled towards Madras to keep the bodies of French who were converging in that direction at a distance as long as possible so as to allow the victualling of madras to go on uninterrupted mr pigeot now instructed charlie to hand over the command of that force to peters and with fifty men to make his way north and to effect a junction with ford who was entirely deficient in cavalry avoiding the french force charlie reached visgapatan upon the second of december and found that ford had marched on the previous day he started at once and on the evening of the third came up to ford who had arrived in sight of the french position charlie had already made the acquaintance of colonel ford in bengal and ford was glad to obtain the assistance and advice of an officer who had seen so much service an hour after arriving charlie rode out with his commander and reconnoitred the French position, which was, they concluded, too strong to be attacked in point of numbers. The forces were about even. Conflans had, in addition to his 500 Europeans, 6,000 native infantry, 500 native cavalry, and 30 guns. Ford had 470 Europeans, 1,900 sepoys, and six guns. Anandaz had 40 Europeans, 5,000 infantry, 500 horsemen, and four guns. These 5,000 men were, however, a mere ragged mob, of whom very few had firearms, and the rest were armed with bows and arrows. His horsemen was equally worthless and Ford could only rely upon the troops he had brought with him from Calcutta and the troops of fifty natives under Charlie Marriott. Finding that the French position was too strong to be attacked, Ford fell back to a strong position at Chambeau, a village nearly four miles from the French camp. Here for four days the two armies remained watching each other, the leaders of both sides considering that the position of the other was too strong to be attacked. End of chapter 25
Recording by Gary Ullman. The Siege of Madras. At last, weary of inactivity, the Marquis de Conflans and Colonel Ford arrived simultaneously on the 8th of December at a determination to bring matters to a crisis. Conflans had heard from a deserter that Ford had omitted to occupy a mound which, at a short distance from his camp, commanded the position. He determined to seize this during the night and to open fire with his guns and that his main army should take advantage of the confusion which the sudden attack would occasion to fall upon the English. Ford, on his part, had determined to march at four o'clock in the morning to a village named Condor, three miles distant, whence he could threaten the French flank. Ignorant of each other's intentions, the English and French left their camps at night. Ford marched at a quarter past four, as arranged with Anandage. But the Rajah and his people, with the usual native aversion to punctuality, remained quietly asleep, and a few minutes after daybreak they were roughly awakened by a deadly fire poured by six guns into the camp. The Rajah sent message after message to Ford, urging him to return, and he himself, with his frightened army, hurried towards Condor. Ford had indeed retraced his steps immediately. He heard the fire of the guns, and soon met the Rajah's rabble in full flight, and, uniting with them, marched back to Condor. Conflans supposed that the fire of his guns had driven the whole of his opponents in a panic from Chambon and determining to take advantage of the confusion marched with his force against them fought at once prepared for the battle in the center he placed the english including the rajah's forty europeans next to these on either side he placed the sepoys and posted the troops of anandras on the right and left flanks he then advanced towards the enemy the French guns opened fire. Ford halted in the position in which he found himself. His center occupied a field of Indian corn so high that they were concealed from the enemy. Conflans had moved towards the English left with the intention, apparently, of turning that flank, and after the artillery battle on both sides had continued for 40 minutes, he ordered his troops to advance. In Madras, both the English and French dressed their sepoys in white. In Bengal, however, since the raising of sepoy regiments after the recapture of Calcutta, the English had clothed them in red. Conflans, therefore, thought that the force he was about to attack was the English contingent, and that if he could defeat this, the rout of his enemy would be secured. The French advanced with great rapidity and attacked the sepoys in front and flank so vigorously that they broke in disorder. The Rajah's troops fled instantly, and in spite of the exhortations of Ford, the sepoys presently followed their example and fled with the Rajah's troops to Chambol, pursued by the enemy's horse. They would have suffered even more severely than they did in this pursuit had not Charlie Marriott launched his little squadron at the enemy's horse. Keeping his men well together, he made repeated charges, several times riding through and through them, until at last they desisted from the pursuit, and forming in a compact body, fell back towards the field of battle. Charlie, who had already lost twelve men, not thinking it prudent again to attack so strong a force. Conflans' easy success over the sepoys was fatal to him. Believing that he had defeated the English, he gave orders to several companies of the French troops to press on in pursuit without delay. They started off in hot speed, proceeding without much order or regularity, when they were suddenly confronted by the whole line of English troops in solid order, advancing from the high corn to take the place lately occupied by the sepoys. In vain, the scattered and surprised companies of the French endeavored to reform and make head against them. So heavy was the fire of musketry opened by the British line immediately they had taken up their position that the French broke their ranks 
and ran back as fast as they could to regain their guns which were fully half a mile in the rear in the meantime the french sepoys on their left had been gradually driving back the english right but ford disregarding this pressed forward in hot pursuit of the french with his english behind whom the greater portion of the beaten sepoys had already rallied keeping his men well together he advanced at the fullest speed following so closely upon the enemy that the latter had only time to fire one or two rounds with their thirteen guns before the english were upon them the french who had already lost heart by the serious check which had befallen them were unable to stand the shock and at once retreated leaving their guns behind them as ford had anticipated the french sepoys seeing their center and right defeated desisted from their attack on the english right and fell back upon their camp the english sepoys at once marched forward and joined force the rajah's troops however the whole of whom had fled remained cowering in the shelter of a large dry tank ford did not wait for them but leaving his guns behind him pressed forward an hour after the defeat of the french against their camp to reach this he had to pass along a narrow valley commanded by the french heavy guns these opened fire but the english pressed forward without wavering the defenders not yet recovered from the effects of their defeat in the plain at once gave way and retreated in the utmost confusion towards raja mahendra had the cavalry of anandras been at hand to follow up the advantage great numbers might have been captured as it was charlie marryat with his little force harassed them for some miles but was unable to effect any serious damage on so strong a body the english captured thirty-two pieces of cannon and all the stores ammunition and tents of the french fords at once dispatched a battalion of sepoys under captain knox in pursuit and this officer pressed on so vigorously that he approached raja mahendra the same evening two more native battalions reached knox during the night so thoroughly dispirited were the enemy that the sight of the red-coated sepoys of knox whom they could not distinguish from english induced them to abandon raja mahendra in all haste although it contained a strong mud fort with several guns the godavery is two miles wide and all night the passage of the river in boats continued and when at daybreak next morning knox broke into town he found fifteen europeans still on the banks expecting a returning boats these he captured and seeing upon the opposite bank a party about to disbark guns and stores from another boat he opened fire from the guns of the fort towards it and although the shot could scarcely reach halfway across the river such was the terror of the enemy that they forsake the boat and fled knox at once sent a boat across and brought back the containing guns the french retreated to masulapatan the capital of the province a port which rivals madras in its commerce ford determined to follow them there but he was hindered by want of money to pay his troops this the rajah anandras who had promised supply money now exited and arrogant by the victory which he had done nothing towards gaining refused to supply and many weeks were spent in negotiations before ford was able to move forward charlie was no longer with him the very day before the fight of condor letters had arrived from madras stating the urgency of the position there and upon the night after the battle colonel ford ordered charlie to return to aid in the defense of that city before which the french had appeared on the twenty ninth of november several skirmishes took place outside the city and the english then retired within the fort the force consisted of sixteen hundred white troops and two thousand three hundred sepoys the nabob who had also retired into the town had two hundred horse and a huge retinue of attendants 
On the morning of the 14th, the French occupied the town, and the next day the English made a sortie with 600 men. These, for a while, drove the French before them through the streets of Madras. But as the French gradually rallied, the fire upon the English was so heavy that the sortie was repulsed with a loss of 200 soldiers and six officers killed, wounded, and prisoners. The French loss had been about the same. Had not a large quantity of the French troops broken into the wine stores on their arrival and drunk to a point of intoxication, it is probable that none of the British party would have returned to the fort. The sortie had, however, the effect that Sorbonnet, one of the best of the French officers, was killed and Count d'Estain, an able general, taken prisoner. For some time, the siege proceeded slowly. The French, waiting for the arrival of their siege artillery by ship from Pondicherry. The fort of Madras was now a far more formidable post than it had been when the French before captured it. In the year 1743, Mr. Smith, an engineer, had marked out the lines for a considerable increase in the fortification. The ditch was dug and faced with brick, but on account of the expense, nothing further had been done. The French had added somewhat to the fortification during their stay there in 1750. Nothing had been done by the English when they recovered the town until the news of the preparations which the French were making for the siege of the place had been received. Four thousand natives were then set to work, and these in eighteen months had completed the fortifications as designed by Mr. Smith just before the arrival of the French. The latter determined to attack from the northern side. Here the fort was protected by a demi-bastion next to the sea and by the royal bastion the wall between the two being covered by a work known as the North Ravelin. The defense was also strengthened by the fire of the Northwest Lunette and Pigeot's Bastion. Against these, the French threw up four batteries. Lally's battery, erected by the regiment of that name, was on the seashore directly facing the demi-bastion. To its right was the burying ground battery, facing the royal bastion. Against the western face of this position, the French regiment of Lorraine erected a strong work, while farther round to the west, on a rising ground, they threw up a battery called the Hospital Battery, which kept up a crossfire on the English position. To prevent the French from pressing forward along the strip of shore between the fort and the sea, the English erected a strong stockade behind which was a battery called the Fascine Battery. A few days after the siege began, it was found that the numbers crowded up in the fort could scarcely be accommodated, and the Rajah was, therefore, invited to leave by sea on board a ship which would land him at the Dutch settlement of Negapatam, whence he might journey through the Tanjore country to Trichinopoly. This proposal... He willingly accepted and embarked with his wife, women, and children. His other followers, leaving by the land side, opposite to that invested by the French. Thus, the garrison was relieved of the embarrassment and consumption of food caused by 400 men and 200 horse. Charlie rode with his troop without interruption, through the country, avoiding all the bodies of the enemy until he reached the sea, fifteen miles north of Madras. Here he hired a native boat, and, leaving the troops under the command of Ensign Anstey, sailed from Madras in order to inform the garrison of Ford's victory over the French, and to concert with the governor as to the measures which he wished him to carry out to harass the enemy. He was accompanied only by Tim and Hossein. The wind was fair, and, starting an hour before sunset, the boat ran into Madras Roads two hours later. 
The Harlem, which had that day arrived with artillery for the French from Pondicherry, fired at the little craft, and the native boatmen were about to turn the head of the craft northward again. Charlie, however, drew his pistol, and Hossein took his place with his drawn tulwar by the helmsman. The boatsmen thereupon again continued their course, and though several shots fell near them, they escaped untouched and anchored just outside the surf abreast of the fort. The English had taken the precaution of erecting a number of huts under the walls of the fort for the boatmen, in order to be able to communicate with any ship arriving or to send messages in or out. As soon as the boat anchored, a catamaran put out and brought Charlie and his followers to shore. There was a great joy at the receipt of his news, and the guns of the fort fired twenty-one shots towards the enemy in honor of the victory. Governor Pigeot was in general command of the defense, having under him Colonel Lawrence in command of the troops. The latter, after inquiring from Charlie the character of the officer he had left in command of his troop, and finding that he was able and energetic, requested Charlie to send orders to him to join either the force under Captain Preston at Chingalaprat or that of a native leader, Mohammed Isuf, both of whom were ravaging and destroying the country about Conjuvarium whence the French besieging Madras drew most of their provisions. Charlie himself was requested to remain in the fort where his experience in sieges would render him of great value. At daybreak on the 2nd of January, the Lorraine and Lolly batteries opened fire. The English guns, however, proved superior in weight and number, dismounted two of the cannon, and silenced the others. The French mortars continued to throw heavy shell into the fort, and that night most of the European women and children were sent away in native boats. The French batteries, finding the superiority of the English fire, ceased fire until the 6th, when seven guns and six large mortars from Lally's battery and eight guns and two mortars from the Lorraine battery opened upon the town. The cannonade now continued without intermission, but the enemy gained but little advantage. Every day, however, added to their strength as fresh vessels with artillery continued to arrive from Pondicherry. They were now pushing their approaches from Lally's battery towards the Demi Bastion. The loss on the part of the besieged were considerable many being killed and wounded each day. This continued to the end of the month, in spite of many gallant sorties by parties of the besiegers, who repeatedly killed and drove out the working parties in the head of the French trenches. These progressed steadily and reached to the outworks of the demi bastion On the 25th, the Shaftesbury, one of the company's trading vessels, commanded by Captain Inglis, was seen approaching. The five French ships hoisted English color. A catamaran was sent out to water, and at nine o'clock in the evening, she came to anchor. She had on board only some invalids, but brought the welcome news that three other ships with troops would soon be up. She had on board, too, 37 chests of silver and many military stores among them hand grenades and large shell, which were most welcome to the garrison who had nearly expanded their supply. The native boats went off from the fort and brought on shore the ammunition and stores. In the afternoon, the Shaftesbury was attacked by the two French ships, the Bristol and the Harlem. She fought them for two hours and then sailed in and anchored again near the fort. The French ships lay off at a distance, and these and one of their batteries played upon the Shaftesbury after she had anchored, and continued to do so for the next three days. Many of the guns of the fort were dismounted by the artillery fire, which had continued with scarcely any intermission for a month. 
the parapets of the ramparts were in many places beaten down and the walls exposed to the enemy's fire greatly damaged the enemy now opened their breaching battery close to the works and on the seventh two breaches had been effected and lally ordered his principal engineer and artillery officers to give their opinion as to the practicability of an assault these however considered that the assault would have no prospect of success as the guns commanding the ditch were still uninjured and the palisades which stormers must climb over before reaching the breach untouched so heavy a crossfire could be brought to bear by the besieged upon an assaulted column that it would be swept away before it could mount the breach these officers added their opinion that considering the number of men defending the fort in comparison with those attacking it final success could not be looked for and further prosecution of the works would only entail a useless loss of life on the ninth of february the french attacked mahomed isoff's men and those of the captain preston the whole under the command of major calliard who had come up from trichinopoly and had taken station three miles in the rear of the french position the greater part of the natives as usual behaved badly but the calliard with the artillery and a few sepoys defended himself till nightfall and then drew off for the next week the french continued to fire and their approaches were pushed on several sorties were made but the matters remained unchanged until the fourteenth when six english ships were seen standing into the roads and that night the french drew out from their trenches and retreated the next morning six hundred troops landed from the ships and the garrison who had so stoutly resisted the assaults made upon them for forty-two days sallied out to inspect the enemy's works fifty-two cannon were left in them and so great was the hurry with which the french retreated that they left forty-four sick in the hospital behind the fort fired during the siege twenty-six thousand five hundred and fifty-four rounds from their cannon seven thousand five hundred and two shells through one thousand nine hundred and ninety hand grenades and expended two hundred thousand musket cartridges thirty pieces of cannon and five mortars had been dismounted during the siege of the europeans the loss in killed wounded and prisoners was five hundred and seventy nine three hundred and twenty two sepoys were killed and wounded and four hundred and forty deserted during the siege in spite of the resolution with which the french had pushed the siege it was from the first destined to failure the garrison were well provisioned had great stores of ammunition and plenty of spare cannon to replace those disabled or dismounted the works were strong and the garrison not greatly inferior in number to the besiegers the french on the other hand had to bring their artillery ammunition and stores by water from pondicherry and the activity of the english parties in their rear rendered it extremely difficult for them to receive supplies of food by land lally had disgusted even the french officers and soldiers by his arrogance and passionate temper while by the sepoys he was absolutely hated during the siege charlie had been most active in the defence colonel lawrence had assigned no special post to him but used him as what would now be called his chief of staff he was ever where the fire was thickest encouraging the men and during the interval of comparative cessation of fire he went about the fort seeing to the comforts of the men in their quarters to the issue of stores and other matters upon the very morning after the french had withdrawn he asked to be allowed to rejoin his troop 
which was with Major Calliard, and at once started to rejoin Colonel Fort. He wished to take the whole of his corps with him, but Colonel Lawrence considered that these would be of extreme use in following up the French, and in subsequent operations, as cavalry was an arm in which the English were greatly deficient. Colonel Ford had been terribly delayed by the conduct of Raja Alindraz, and the delay enabled the French again to recover heart. He was not able to move forward until the 1st of March. On the 6th, he arrived before Masulapatam, and the following day, Charlie joined him with his troop. The fort of Masulapatam stood in an extremely defensible position. It was surrounded by a swamp on three sides. The other face rested on the river. From the land side, it was only approachable by a causeway across the swamp, and this was guarded by a strong ravelin, which is the military name for an outwork erected beyond the ditch of a fortress. It was, in all respects, capable of a prolonged defense. In form, it was an irregular parallelogram, about 800 yards in length and 600 yards wide, and on the walls were 11 strong bastions. The morass which surrounded it was of from three to eighteen feet in depth on the approach of ford conflans evacuated the town which also surrounded by swamps and lying two miles to the northwest of the fort was itself a most defensible position and retired across the narrow causeway more than a mile long to the fort end of chapter twenty six Chapter 27 of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Masulapatam. I am heartily glad that you have come, Marriott, Colonel Ford said, as Charlie rode up. I have got here at last, as you see, but that is a very different thing from getting in. An uglier place to attack I never saw, and in other respects manners are not bright. And in dress is a constant worry and trouble to me. He has everything to gain by our success, and yet will do nothing to aid it. His men are worse than useless in fight. And the only thing which we want, and he could give us money, he will not let us have. Will you ride with me to the spot where I am erecting my batteries, and you will see the prospects for yourself? The prospect was, as Charlie found when he saw it, the reverse of cheerful. The point which Ford had selected to erect his batteries was on some sandbanks, 800 yards from the eastern face of the force. It would be impossible to construct approaches against the walls, and should a breach be made, there still remained a wide creek to be crossed beyond which lay the deep and in most parts absolutely impassable swamp. Charlie and his men were employed in bringing in provisions from the surrounding country, but a short distance in the rear, a French column under Du Rocher, with 200 European and 2,000 native troops, with four field pieces, watched the British and rendered the collection of provisions difficult. Du Rocher had several strong places with European and sepoy garrisons near him, in which to retire in case Ford should advance against him. Well, Mr. Charles, Tim said one morning, this is altogether a queer sort of a siege. Here we are with a place in front of us with ten times as many guns as we have got, and a force well nigh twice as large. Even if there were no walls and no guns, I don't see how we could get at them, barring with wings, for this bog is worse than anything in the old country. Then behind us we got another army, which is, they say, with the garrisons of the forts, as strong as we are. We got little food and less money, and the troops are grumbling mightily, I can tell you. On the 18th of March, while his batteries were still incomplete, Ford received certain news that the Nizam of the Deccan, the old ally of the French, was advancing with an army of 40,000 men to attack him. No British commander ever stood in a position of more imminent peril. 
This completed the terror of Anadras. Du Rocher had caused reports to be circulated that he intended to march against that chief's territories, and the news of the approach of the Nizan, who was his suzerain lord, completed his dismay. He refused to advance another penny. Colonel Ford had already expended the prize money gained by the troops, his own private funds and those of his officers, in buying food for his troops, and the men were several months in arrears of their pay. I'm afraid, Your Honor, Tim said, that evening to Jolly that there's going to be a little shindy. What do you mean by a shindy, Tim? I mean, Your Honor, that the men are cursing and swearing and saying the devil a bit will they fight any longer. It's rank and mutiny and rebellion, Your Honor, but there's something to be said for the poor boys. They have seen all the prize money they have taken spent. Not a thranine have they touched for months. Their clothes are in rags, and here they are before a place where there's no more chance of their taking than there is of their flying up to the clouds. And now they hear that beside the French behind us, there's the Nissan with 40,000 of his men marching against us. It's pretty kettle of fish altogether, Your Honor. It isn't for myself I care, Mr. Charles. Haven't I got an order in my pocket on the Treasury of Madras for 300 pounds and over? But it's mighty hard, Your Honor, just when one has become a wealthy man to be shut up in a French prison. Well, Tin, I hope there will be no trouble, but I own that things look bad. Hussein has been saying, Your Honor, that he thinks that the best way would be for him and me to go out and chop off the heads of a half a dozen of the chief ringleaders. But I thought I'd better be asking Your Honor's pleasure in the affair before I set about it. To Tim's great disappointment, Charlie told him that the step was one to which he could hardly assent at present. The next morning, the troops turned out with their arms and threatened to march away. Ford spoke to them gently but firmly. He told them that he could not believe that men who had behaved so gallantly at Condor would fail now in their duty. He begged them to return to their tents and to send two of their numbers as deputies to him. This they did. The deputies came to the colonel's tent and told him that all were resolved to fight no more unless they were immediately paid the amount of prize money due them, and were assured of the whole booty, in case Mosulapatam should be taken. Colonel Ford promised that they would receive their prize money out of the very first funds which reached them. As to the booty which might be taken to Mosulapatam, he said he had no power to change the regulations of the company, but that he would beg them, under consideration of the hardship which the troops had endured and their great services, to forego their half of the plunder. Directly Mosulapatan was taken, he said, he would divide one half among them and hold the other until he obtained the company's answer to his request. Then he would distribute it at once. With this answer, the troops were satisfied and returned at once to their duty. On the 25th, the guns of the battery opened fire upon the fort, but the damage which they did was inconsiderable. On the 27th, news came that the French army of observation had retaken Raja Mahadri, and that the Nisam with his army had arrived at Bayswara, 40 miles distant. Letters came in from the Nizam to Anadras, ordering him instantly to quit the English camp and join him. The Raja was so terrified that, that night, he started with his troops without giving any information of his intentions to Colonel Ford, and dilatory as were his motions in general, he, on this occasion, marched sixteen miles before daybreak. The instant Colonel Ford heard that he had left, he sent for Charlie Marriott. I suppose you have heard, Marianne, that that scoundrel Anandras has bolted. Ride off to him with your troop, and do your best to persuade him to return. I will do so, sir, Charlie said, but really it seems to me that we are better without him than with him. His men only consume our provisions and cause trouble, and they are no more good fighting than so many sheep. That is so, Colonel Ford said, but in the first place, his 5,000 men, 
absolutely worthless as they are, swell our forces to a respectable size. If Conflans and Du Rocher saw how small is our really fighting body, they would fall upon us together and annihilate us. In the second place, if Anandras goes to the Nisim, he will at once, of course, declare for the French and will give up Visibatam and the rest of the ground we won by the Battle of Condor. The whole of the fruits of the campaign would be lost, and we should only hold that portion of the northern sick cars on which our troops here are encamped. I beg your pardon, Colonel Charlie said. You are wreck, and I am wrong, and I will start at once. Putting himself at the head of his five and twenty men, Charlie rode off at once in pursuit of the Rajah. He found them encamped in a village. Charlie had already instructed his men as to the course which they were to pursue, and halted them at a distance of fifty yards from the Rajah's tent. Then, dismounting and followed by Tim as his orderly and Hosanna as his body servant, he walked to the tent. He found Anandras surrounded by his chief officers. The Rajah received him coldly, but Charlie, paying no attention to this, took a seat close to him. I am come, Roger, he said, from Colonel Ford, to point out to you the folly of the course which you have pursued. By the line which you have taken so far, it is evident that your intention to cross the God Daveri and retire to your own country. What chance have you of accomplishing this? By this time, the cavalry of the Nizam will be scattered over the whole country between this and the God Daveri. At Roger de Mendry is Du Rocher with his army, who will take you in flank. Even supposing that you reach your own country, what is the future open to you? If the English are finally successful, they will deprive you of your rank and possessions for deserting them now. If the French are victorious, they and the Nissan will then turn their attention to you, and you cannot hope to escape with life. When your treason has brought such troubles upon them, the Rajah looked for a minute, doubtful, and then encouraged by the murmurs of the officers around him, who were weary of the expedition and its labors, although the troops had not fired a single shot, he said obstinately, No more words are needed. I have made up my mind. And so have I, Charlie said, and with a sudden spring, he leaped upon the Riaja, seized him by his throat, and placed his pistol to his ear. Hussan drew his sword and rushed to his side. Tim ran outside and held up his arm, and the little body of cavalry at once rode up, and half of them dismounting, and they entered the tent with drawn swords. So astounded were the officers of the Rajar, Charlie's sudden attack, that for a moment they knew not what to do, and before they could recover from their surprise, Charlie's troopers entered. Take this man, Charlie said, pointing to the Rajah, to that tree and hang him at once. Cut down any of those fellows who move a finger. The Rajah was dragged to the tree, almost lifeless with terror. Now, Rajah, Charlie said, you either give instant orders for your army to march back to Masulipatan, or up you go on that branch above there. The terrified Raja instantly promised to carry out Charlie's orders and to remain faithful to the English. The officers were brought out from the tent and received orders from the Raja to set his troops instantly in motion on their way back. The Raja was led to his tent and there kept under guard until the army was in motion. When the whole of it was well on its way, Charlie said, now, Roger, we will ride on. We will say no more about this little affair, and I will ask Colonel Ford to forgive your ill behavior in leaving him. But mind, if at any future time you attempt to disobey his orders or to retire from the camp, I will blow out your brains, even if I have to follow you with my men into the heart of your own palace. Upon their return to the British camp, Charlie explained to Colonel Ford the measures which he was obliged to take to convince the Rajah of the soundness of his arguments, and of these Colonel Ford entirely approved. He told Charlie that he had sent off to open negotiations with 
Salabut Jung, so as to detain him as long as possible at Bayezawara. Without any intermission, the batteries continued to play on the fort from the 25th of March to the 6th of April. Several houses had been destroyed and some breaches effected, but these the French repaired in the night. As fast as they were made, they were aware of the position of the English and regarded the siege with contempt. On the morning of the 7th, news came that the Nixon was advancing from by his water to attack the English, and that Du Rocher was hurrying from Raja Mahidrid to effect a junction with him. The same morning, the senior artillery officer reported to Colonel Ford that only two days' ammunition for the batteries remained in store. He learned, too, that a ship with 300 French soldiers would arrive in the course of a day or two. The position was indeed a desperate one and there remained only the alternatives of success against the fort or total destruction. He determined to attack. All day his batteries kept up a heavier fire than ever, maintaining an equal fire against all the bastions in order that if the enemy should obtain any information of the projected attack, they would not know against which point it was directed. Colonel Ford had ascertained that fishermen were in the habit of making their way across the swamp to the southwest angle of the fort that on the sea face opposite to the British frontiers. He determined to effect a diversion by an attack upon that side and therefore ordered Captain Knox with several hundred sea boys to make a detour to cross the swamp and to attack upon that side. Still further to distract the attention of the garrison, he instructed and addressed to advance with his men along the causeway and to open fire against the ravelin. The main attack, which consisted of the rest of the force, composed of 320 European infantry, 30 gunners, 30 sailors, and 700 sepoys, was to be delivered against the breach in the bastion, mounting 10 guns in the northeast angle of the fort. At ten o'clock, the force drew up under arms. The fire of the batteries was kept up much later than usual in order that the enemy should have no time to repair the breaches. The hour of midnight was fixed for the attack. As at that time the tide was at its lowest and the water in the ditches around the ramparts not more than three feet deep, Captain Knox and his party started first. The main body should have set out half an hour later, but were detained, owing to the unaccountable absence of Captain Callender, the officer who was to command it. As this officer was afterwards killed, the cause of his absence was never explained. The party started without him, and before they could reach the ditch, they heard the sound of firing from the farther corner of the fort, telling that Knox was already at work. Sure, Your Honor, muttered Tim, as he made his way through the swamp, knee-deep beside his master. This is worse than the day before Plassey. It was water then, but this thick mud holds one leg fast at every step, and I've lost one of my boots already. It was indeed hard work, but at last the head of the column reached the ditch, just as a fresh burst of firing told that the Raja Anandras was attacking the Revelin. The French, in their belief in the absolute security of the place, had taken but few precautions against an attack, and it was not until the leading party had waded nearly breast-high through the ditch and began to break down the palisades beyond it that they were discovered. Then a heavy artillery and musketry fire from the bastions on the right and left were open upon the assailants. Captain Fisher with the 1st Division attacked the breach. Captain McLean with the 2nd covered them by opening fire upon the bastion on their right, while the 3rd, led by Captain York, replied to that on their left. 
Charlie, although superior in rank to any of these officers, had no specific command, but accompanied the party as a simple volunteer. The storming party soon mounted the breach, and York's division joined it on the top. York, turning to the left, seized the bastion which was firing on McLean, while Fisher turned along the ramparts to the right to secure the bastions in that direction. Just as York was setting out, he saw a strong body of French sea boys advancing between the foot of the rampart and the building of the town. These had been sent, directly the firing was heard, to reinforce the bastion just carried. Without a moment's hesitation, York ran down the rampart, seized the French officer who commanded, and ordered him to surrender at once. As the place was already taken, confused and bewildered, the officer gave up his sword and ordered the sepoys to lay down their arms. They were then sent as prisoners into the bastion. York now pushed forward with his men at the foot of the rampart and carried two out of three of the bastions on that side. The men, however, separated from the rest and alone in the unknown town were beginning to lose heart. Suddenly they came upon a small magazine, and some of the men called out, I'm on! Seized with sudden panic, the whole division ran back, leaving York alone with two naval drummer boys, who continued to beat the advance. The soldiers, however, did not stop running until they reached the bastion. Captain York went back and found that many of the soldiers were proposing to leave the fort altogether. He swore that he would cut down the first man who moved and some of the men who had served with him in the 39th. Ashamed of their conduct, said they would follow him. Heading the 36 men who had now come to their senses, Captain York again advanced with the drummer boys. Just as he was setting out, Charlie, who had at first gone with Fisher's division, hearing an entire cessation of fire on the other side, ran up to see what was going on. Major Marriott, Captain York said, will you rally these fellows and bring them after me? They've been frightened with a false alarm of a mine and have lost their heads altogether. Charlie, aided by Tim, exerted himself to the utmost to encourage and command the soldiers, shaming them by telling them that while they, European soldiers, were cowering in the bastion, their sepoy comrades were winning the town. Unless, he said, in one minute the whole of you are formed up ready to advance, I will take care that not one of you shall have a share in the prize money that will be won tonight. The men now fell in, and Charlie led them after Captain York. The first retreat of the latter's division had given the French time to rally a little and as he now made along the rampart towards the bastion on the river, the French officer in command there, having turned the gun and loaded it with grape, discharged it when the English were within a few yards. Captain York fell badly wounded. The two black drummer boys were killed, as were several of the men, and sixteen others were wounded. Charlie, hurrying along with the rest of the party, met the survivors of Captain York's little band coming back, carrying their wounded officer. There, Charlie shouted to his men, that is your doing. Now retrieve yourselves. Show you are worthy of the name of British soldiers. With a shout, the men rushed forward and carried the bastion, and this completed the capture of the whole of the wall from the northeast angle to the river. In the meantime, Captain Fisher, with his division, was advancing to the right along the rampart. McLean's men had joined him, and they were pushing steadily forward. Colonel Ford continued with the reserve at the bastion first taken, receiving reports from both divisions as they advanced and sending the necessary orders as fast as the prisoners were brought in. They were sent down the breach into the ditch, where they were guarded by sepoys who threatened to shoot any that tried to climb up. 
Meanwhile, all was disorder in the town. Greatly superior as were the besieged to their assailants in number, they could, if properly handled, have easily driven them back. Instead, however, of disregarding the attack by Knox at the southwest angle, which was clearly only a feint, and that of Anandraz on the Ravelin, which might have been disregarded with equal safety, and concentrating all their forces against the main attack, they made no sustained effort against either of the columns, which were rapidly carrying bastion after bastion. Conflans appeared to have completely lost his head as messenger after messenger arrived at his house by the river with news of the progress of the English columns. As Fisher's division advanced towards the bastion, in which was the great gate, the French who had gathered there again attempted to check his progress. But his men reserved their fire until close to the enemy, and then, discharging a volley at a few yards distance, they rapidly cleared the bastion. Fisher at once closed the great gates and thus cut off all the defenders of the ravelin and prevented any of the troops within from joining these and cutting their way through the rajah's troops, which would have been no difficult matter. Just as the division were again advancing, Captain Callender, to the astonishment of everyone, appeared and took his place at its head. Few shots only were fired after this, and the last discharge killed Captain Callender. By this time, Conflans, bewildered and terrified, had sent a message to Colonel Ford, offering to surrender on honorable terms. Colonel Ford sent back to say that he would give no terms whatever, that the town was in his power, and further resistance hopeless, and that, if it continued longer, he would put all who did not surrender to the sword. On the receipt of this message, Conflans immediately sent round orders that all his men were to lay down their arms and to fall in the open space by the water. The English assembled on the parade by the bastion of the gateway. Captain Knox's column was marched round from the southwest into town. Strong body of artillery kept guard over the prisoners till morning. Then the gate was opened and the French in the ravelin entered the fort and became prisoners with the rest of the garrison. The whole number of prisoners exceeded 3,000, of whom 500 were Europeans, and the rest sepoy. The loss of the English was 22 Europeans killed and 62 wounded. The sepoys had 50 killed and 150 wounded. The Rajah's people, who had kept up their false attack upon the ravelin with much more bravery and resolution than had been expected, also lost a good many men. Considering the troop strength of the position that the garrison was, both in European troops and sepoys, considerably stronger than the besiegers, that the fort mounted 120 guns, and that a relieving army, enormously superior to that of the besiegers, was within 15 miles at the time the assault was made, the capture of the Marcella Pitanium may claim to rank among the very highest deeds ever performed by British arms. End of chapter 27。Chapter 28 of With Clive in India. This LibriVox according to promise, and the other half retained until the permission applied for by Colonel Ford was received from Madras for its division among them. The morning after the capture of the town, the Maratha horse of Salabut Jung appeared. The Nizam was furious when he found that he had arrived too late, but he resolved that when the 300 French troops, daily expected by sea, arrived, he would besiege Fort in his turn. As with new arrivals, de Rochier's force would alone be superior to that of Ford, and there would be, in addition, his own army of 40,000 men. The ships arrived off the port three days later and sent a message on shore to Conflans. Finding that no answer was returned and that the fire had entirely ceased, 
they came to the conclusion that the place was captured by the English and sailed away to Pondicherry again. Had Duracker taken the precaution of having boats in readiness to communicate with them, inform them of the real state of affairs, and order them to land further along the coast and join him, Ford would have been besieged in his turn, although certainly the siege would have been ineffectual. Raja Anandras, greatly terrified at the approach of the Nizam, had two days after the capture of the place received a portion of the plunder as his share and marched away to his own country. Ford, disgusted with his conduct throughout the campaign, making no efforts whatever to retain him. When Salabut Jung heard that the French had sailed away to Pondicherry, he felt that his prospects of retaking the town were small and at the same time receiving news that his own dominions were threatened by an enemy, he concluded a treaty with Ford, granting Masulipatan and the northern Circus to the English, and agreeing never again to allow any French troops to enter his dominions. He then marched back to his own country. Colonel Ford sailed with a portion of the force to Calcutta, where he shortly afterwards commanded at the Battle of Chinsura, where the Dutch, who had made vast preparations to dispute the supremacy of the English, were completely defeated, and thenceforth they, as well as the French, sunk to the rank of a small training colonies under British protection in Bengal. Charlie returned to Madras, and journeying up the country, he joined the main body of his troops, under peters they had been engaged in several dashing expeditions and had rendered great service but they had been reduced in numbers by action and sickness and the whole force when reunited only numbered eighty sabres lieutenant hollows being killed peters had been twice wounded the two friends were greatly pleased to meet again and had much to tell each other of their adventures since they parted the next morning a deputation of four of the men waited upon Charlie. They said that from their share of the booty of the various places they had taken, all were now possessed of sums sufficient in India to enable them to live in comfort for the rest of their lives. They hoped, therefore, that Charlie would ask the authorities at Madras to disband the corps and allow them to return home. Their commander, however, pointed out to them that the position was still a critical one, that the French possessed a very powerful army at Pondicherry, which would shortly take the field, and that the English would need every one of their soldiers to meet the storm. If victorious, there could be no doubt that a final blow would be dealt to French influence, and that the company would then be able to reduce its forces. A few months would settle the event, and it would he knew, be useless to apply for their discharge before that time. He thought he could promise them, however, that by the end of the year, at latest, their services would be dispensed with. The men, although rather disappointed, retired, content to make the best of the circumstances. Desertions were very frequent in the Sepoy force of the company, as the men returning to their native villages and resuming their former dress and occupation were in no danger whatever of discovery. But in Charlie's force, not a single desertion had taken place since it was raised, as the men knew that, by leaving the colors, they would forfeit their share of the prize money held for them in the Madras treasury. Have you heard from home lately? Peters asked. Yes, Charlie said. There was a large batch of letters lying for me at Madras. My eldest sister, who had now been married three years, had just presented me with a second nephew. Katie and my mother are well. Your sister is not engaged yet? Peters asked. No, Katie says she's quite whole at present. Let me see how old is she now. It is just eight years and a half since we left England, and she was twelve years old then. She is now past twenty. She would do nicely for you, Peters, when you go back. It would be awful jolly if you two to fall in love with each other. I feel quite disposed to do so, Peter said laughingly, from your descriptions of her. I've heard so much of her in all the time we've been together, and she writes such bright, merry letters that I seem to know her quite well. 
for charlie during the long evenings by the campfires had often read to his friend the lively letters which he received from his sisters peters had no sisters of his own and he had more than once sent home presents from the many articles of jewelry which fell to his share of the loot of captured fortresses to his friend's sister saying to charlie that he had no one in england to send things to and that it kept up his tie with the old country for he had been left an orphan as a child the day after the deputation from his men had spoken to charlie tim said i hope your honor that when the troops disbanded you will be going home for a bit yourself i intend to do so tim i have been waiting to get away for the last two years but i did not like to ask for leave until everything was settled here and what is more when i once get back i don't think they will ever see me in india again i have sufficient means to live as a wealthy man in england and i've seen enough fighting to last a lifetime hooray shouted tim that's the best word i've heard for a long time i shall settle down as your honor's butler and look after the grand house and see that you're comfortable you must never leave me tim that's certain charlie said at least till you marry and set up an establishment of your own if i can't marry without leaving your honor deal of a wife will tim kelly ever take wait till you see the right woman tim there is no saying what the strongest of us will do when he once caught in a woman's net however we'll talk about that when the time comes and there's hussein your honor fire and water wouldn't keep him away from you though what he'll do in the coals of the winter at home is more than i know it makes me laugh to see how his teeth chatter and how the creature shivers of a cold morning here but cold or no cold he'd follow you to the north pole and climb up it if your honor told him charlie laughed he is safe not to be put to the test there him however you may be sure that if hossein is willing to go to england with me he shall go he has saved my life more than once and you and he shall never part from me so long as you are disposed to stay by my side for some months no great undertaking was attempted on either side many petty sieges and skirmishes took place each party preparing for the great struggle which was to decide the fate of southern india at last in january seventeen sixty the rival armies approached each other captain sherlock with thirty europeans and three hundred sepoys were besieged by the french in the fort of van de Vich, which had shortly before been captured by them from the french lally was himself commanding the siege having as a second in command monsieur Bussy of whom however he was more jealous than ever lally's own incapacity was so marked that the whole army and even lally's own regiment recognized the superior talents of Bussy. but although lally constantly asked the advice of his subordinate his jealousy of that officer generally impelled him to neglect it when the english under colonel coote who now commanded their forces in Madras, were known to be advancing against him, Bussy strongly advised that the siege should be abandoned and a strong position taken up for the battle. The advice was unquestionably good, but Lally neglected it and remained in front of Van de Vash until the English were seen approaching. The French cavalry, among whom were three hundred European dragoons and a cloud of Mahratta horse, moved forward against the English, whose troops were scattered on the line of march. Colonel Coote brought up two guns, and these being kept concealed from the enemy until they came within two hundred yards, opened suddenly upon them, while the sepoys fired heavily with their muskets. The Mahrattis rapidly turned and rode off and the french cavalry finding themselves alone retired in good order colonel coote now drew up his army in order of battle and marched his troops so as to take up a position in front of some gardens and other enclosures which extended for some distance from the foot of the mountains out on to the plain these enclosures would serve as a defense in case the army should be forced to retire from the open 
The French remained immovable in their camp. Seeing this, Colonel Coote marched his troops to the right, the infantry taking up their post in the stony ground at the foot of the mountain and a mile and a half from the French camp. Some of the French cavalry came out to reconnoitre, but being fired upon, returned. Finding that the French would not come out to attack, Colonel Coote again advanced until he reached a point where, swinging round his right, he faced the enemy in a position of great strength. His right was now covered by the fire of the fort, his left by the broken ground at the foot of the hills. As soon as the English had taken up their position, the French sallied out from their camp and formed in line of battle. The French cavalry were on their right. Next to these was the regiment of Lorraine, 400 strong. In the center, the battalion of India, 700 strong. Next to these was Lally's regiment, 400 strong, its left resting upon an entrenched tank, which was held by 300 marines and sailors from their fleet with four guns. Twelve other guns were in line, three between each regiment. 400 sepoys were in reserve and a tank in the rear of that held by the marines. 900 sepoys held a ridge behind the position but in front of the camp, and at each end of this ridge was an entrenchment guarded by 50 Europeans. 150 Europeans and 300 sepoys remained in the batteries, facing Van der Vosch. The whole force consisted of 2,400 Europeans and 1,600 sepoys. The Marathas, 3,000 strong, remained in their own camp, and did not advance to the assistance of their allies. The English army consisted of 1,900 Europeans, of whom 80 were cavalry, 2,100 sepoys, 1,250 irregular horse, and 26 field guns. The sepoys were on the flanks, the company's two battalions in the center, with Coote's regiment on their right, and drapers on their left. The four grenadier companies of the white regiments were withdrawn from the fighting line, and with 200 sepoys on each flank were held as a reserve. Ten field pieces were in line with the troops. Two with two companies of sepoys were posted a little on the left. The rest were in reserve. The English line was placed somewhat obliquely across that of the French their left being the nearest to the enemy. As the English took up their position, Lally let out his cavalry, made a wide sweep round the plain, and then advanced against the English horse, who were drawn up some little distance behind the reserve. Upon seeing their approach, the whole of the irregular horse fled at once, leaving only Jolly's troop remaining. The sepoys with the two guns on the left were ordered to turn these round so as to take the advancing French in the flank. But the flight of their horse had shaken the natives, and the French cavalry would have fallen unchecked on Charlie's little troop, which was already moving forward to meet them, had not Captain Barlow, who commanded the British artillery, turned two of his guns and opened fire on them. Fifteen men and horses fell at the first discharge, throwing the rest into some confusion, and at the next deadly discharge the whole turned and rode off. Seeing the enemy retreating, many of the irregular horse rode back, and, joining Charlie's troop, pursued them round to the rear of their own camp. For a short time a cannonade was kept up by the guns on both sides, the English fire being better directed causing some damage. Upon Lally's return to his camp with the cavalry, he at once gave the orders to advance. Coote ordered the Europeans of his force to do the same, the sepoys to remain on their ground. The musketry fire began at one o'clock. The English, according to Coote's orders, retained theirs until the enemy came close at hand, following the tactics which were afterwards repeated many times in the peninsula. The Lorraine regiment, forming a column twelve deep, advanced against that of Coote, which received them in line. The French came on at the double, 
when within a distance of fifty yards cooch regiment poured a volley into the front and flanks of the column although they suffered heavily from this fire the french bravely pressed on with leveled bayonets and the head of the column by sheer weight broke through the english line the flanks of the english however closed in on the sides of the french column and a desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight ensued in this the english had all the advantage attacking the french fiercely on either side until the latter broke and ran back to their camp colonel coote who was with his regiment ordered it to form in regular order again before it advanced and rode off to see what was going on in the rest of the line as he was passing on a shot struck an ammunition wagon in the entrenched tank held by the french this exploded killing and wounding eighty men among whom was the commander of the post the rest of its occupants panic-stricken by the explosion ran back to the next rank their panic communicated itself to the sepoys there and all ran back together to the camp colonel coote at once sent orders to major Brereton, who commanded Draper's regiment, to take possession of the tank. Before the enemy recovered from the confusion, which the explosion would be sure to cause, the ground opposite that which Draper's regiment occupied was held by Lally's regiment, and in order to prevent his men being exposed to a flanking fire from these, Draper ordered them to file off to the right. Boosey, who commanded at this wing, endeavored to rally the fugitives, and gathered fifty or sixty together, added two companies of Lally's regiments to them, and posted them in the tank. He then returned to the regiment. As Major Brereton, moving up his men, reached the entrenchment, a heavy fire was poured upon him. Major Brereton fell, mortally wounded, and many of his men were killed. The rest, however, with a rush, carried the entrenchment and firing down from the parapet on the guns on Lally's left, drove the gunners from them. Two companies held the entrenchment, and the rest formed in the plain on its left to prevent Lally's regiment attacking on this side. Bussy wheeled Lally's regiment, detached a portion of it to recover the entrenchment, and with the rest marched against Draper's troops in the plain. A heavy musketry fire was kept up on both sides until the two guns posted by Draper's regiment and left behind. When they attacked, the entrenchment came up and opened on the French. These began to waver. Boussy, as the only chance of gaining the day, put himself at their head and endeavored to lead them forward to attack the English with the bayonet. His horse, however, was struck with a ball and soon fell. The English fire was redoubled, and but twenty of Lally's men kept round him. Two companies of the English rushed forward and surrounded the little party, who had once surrendered. Boosie was led a prisoner to the rear, and as he went, was surprised at the sight of the three hundred grenadiers, the best troops in the English army, remaining quietly in reserve. While on either flank the French were now beaten, the fight in the center between the European troops of the English and the French companies had continued, but had been confined to a hot musketry and artillery fire. But upon seeing the defeat of their flanks, the enemy center likewise fell back to the camp. From the moment when the Lorraine regiment had been routed, four field pieces kept up an incessant fire into their camp to prevent them from rallying the three english regiments now advanced in line and entered the enemy's camp without the least opposition the lorraine regiment had passed through it a mass of fugitives the india regiment and lally's went through rapidly but in good order Lally had in vain endeavored to bring the sepoys forward to the attack to restore the day. The French cavalry, seeing the defeat of Lorraine's regiment, advanced to cover it, their appearance completely intimidating the English irregular horse. Charlie's troop was too weak to charge them single-handed. Reanimated by the attitude of their cavalry, the men of the Lorraine regiment rallied, yoked up four 
field pieces which were standing in the rear of the camp and moved off in fair order they were joined in the plain by lally's regiment and the india battalion and the whole setting fire to their tents moved off in good order the four field pieces kept in the rear and behind these moved the cavalry as they retired they were joined by the four hundred and fifty men from the batteries opposite Vandevash. Colonel Coote sent orders to his cavalry to harass the enemy. These followed them for five miles. But as the native horse would not venture within range of the enemy's field guns, Charlie, to his great disappointment, was able to do nothing. Upon neither side did the sepoys take any part in the Battle of Vandevash. It was fought entirely between the two thousand two hundred and fifty French, not including those in their battery, and sixteen hundred English, excluding the grenadiers, who never fired a shot. Twenty-four pieces of cannon were taken, and eleven wagons of ammunition, and all the tents, stores, and baggage that were not burned. The French left two hundred dead upon the field. A hundred and sixty were taken prisoners, of whom thirty died of their wounds before the next morning. Large numbers dropped upon the watch and were afterwards captured. The English had 63 killed and 124 wounded. The news of this victory reached Madras on the following morning and excited as much enthusiastic joy as that of Plassey had done at Calcutta and the event was almost as important a one. There was no longer the slightest fear of danger, and the Madras authorities began to mediate an attack about Pondicherry, so long as the great French settlement remained intact. So long would Madras be exposed to fresh invasions, and it was certain that France, driven now from Bengal, would make a desperate effort to regain her shaken supremacy in Madras. The force, however, at the disposal of the Madras authorities was still far too weak to enable them to undertake an enterprise like the siege of Pondicherry, for their army did not exceed in numbers that which Lally possessed for its defense. Accordingly, urgent letters were sent to Clive to ask him to send down in the summer as many troops as he could spare, other reinforcements being expected from England at that time. The intervening time was spent in the reduction of Chittapet, Caracal, and many other forts which held out for the French. After the Battle of Vandevash, Charlie kept his promise to his men. He represented to Mr. Pigeot that they had already served some months over the time for which they were enlisted, that they had gone through great hardships and performed great services and that they were now anxious to retire to enjoy the prize money they had earned he added that he had given his own promise that they should be allowed to retire if they would extend their services until after a decisive battle with the french mr pujo at once assented to charlie's request and ordered that a batter of six months pay be given to each man upon leaving the troop joined by many of their comrades who had been at different times sent down sick and wounded to Madras, formed up there on parade for the last time. They responded with three hearty cheers to the address which Charlie gave them, thanking them for their services, bidding them farewell, and hoping that they would long enjoy the prize money which they had gallantly won. Then they delivered over their horses to the authorities, drew their prize money from the treasury, and started for their respective homes. The English portion taken up their quarters in barracks until the next ship should sail for England. I am sorry to leave them, Charlie said to Peters, as they stood alone upon the parade. We have gone through a lot of stirring work together, and no fellows could have behaved better. No, Peters agreed. It is singular that, contemptible as are these natives of India when officered by men of their own race and religion, they will fight to the death when led by us. End of chapter 28。Chapter 29 of With Clive in India。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Gary Ullman. The Siege of Pondicherry. 
As the health of the two officers was shaken by their long and arduous work, and their services were not for the moment needed, they obtained leave for three months and went down in a coasting ship to Colombo, where several English trading stations had been established. Here they spent two months, residing for the most part among the hills at the town of a Raja very friendly to the English, and with him they saw an elephant hunt, the herd being driven into a great enclosure formed by a large number of natives who had for weeks been employed upon it. Here the animals were fastened to trees by natives who cut through the thick grass unobserved and were one by one reduced to submission, first by hunger and then by being lustily belabored by the trunks of tamed elephants. Tim highly appreciated the hunt and declared the tiger shooting was not to be compared to it. Their residence in the brisk air of the hills completely restored their health, and they returned to Madras perfectly ready to take part in the great operations which were pending. Charlie on his return was appointed to serve as chief of staff to Colonel Coote, Captain Peters being given the command of a small body of European horse who were with a large body of irregulars to aid in bringing in supplies to the British Army and to prevent the enemy from receiving food from the surrounding country. Early in June, the British squadron off the coast was joined by two ships of the line, the Norfolk and Panther, from England, and a hundred Europeans and a detachment of European and native artillery came down from Bombay. Around Pondicherry ran a strong cactus hedge, strengthened with palisades, and the French retired into this at the beginning of July. They were too strongly posted there to be attacked by the fourth with which the English had first approached them, and they were expecting the arrival of a large body of troops from Mysore with a great convoy of provisions. On the 17th, these approached. Major Moore, who was guarding the English rear, had a hundred and eighty European infantry, fifty English horse under Peters, sixteen hundred irregular horse, and eleven hundred sepoys. The Mysoreans had four thousand good horses, a thousand sepoys, and two hundred Europeans with eight pieces of cannon. The fight lasted but a few minutes. The British native horse and sepoys at once gave way, and the English infantry retreated in great disorder to the fort at Trivadi, which they gained with the loss of 15 killed and 40 wounded. Peter's horse alone behaved well. Several times they charged right through the masses of my Sorarian horse, but when five and twenty were killed and most of the rest, including their commander, severely wounded, they also fell back into the fort. Colonel Coote, when the news of the disaster reached him, determined, if possible, to get possession of the fort at Velenor, which stood on the river Arangapang, some three miles from Pondicherry, and covered the approaches of the town from that side. The English encampment was at Parimba, on the main road leading through an avenue of trees to Pondicherry. Colonel Coote threw up a redoubt on the hill behind Parimba and another on the avenue to check any French force advancing from Pondicherry. These works were finished on the morning of the 19th of July. The next morning, the French army advanced along the river Ariangopang, but Coote marched half his force to meet them, while he moved the rest as if to attack the redoubts, interspersed along the line of hedge. As the fall of these would have placed the attacking force in his rear, Lally at once returned to the town. The same evening, the Mysoreans, with 3,000 bullocks, carrying their artillery and drawing their baggage, and 3,000 more laden with rice and other provisions, arrived on the other bank of the Arangopang River, crossed under the guns of the redoubt of that name, and entered the town. The fort of Velenor was strong, but the road had been cut straight through the glacis to the gate, and the French had neglected to erect works to cover this passage. Coote took advantage of the oversight and laid his two 18-pounders to play upon the gate, while two others were placed to fire upon the parapet. The English batteries opened at daybreak. 
on the 16th, and at 9 o'clock the whole of the French army with the Mysoreans advanced along the bank of the river. Coot at once got his troops under arms and advanced towards the French, sending a small detachment of Europeans to reinforce the sepoys firing at the fort of Velenor. By this time, the batteries had beaten down the parapet and silenced the enemy's fire. Two companies of sepoys set forward, at full run, up to the very crest of the glacis. The French commander of the place had really nothing to fear, as the sepoys had a ditch to pass and a very imperfect breach to mount, and the fort might have held out for two days before the English could have been in a position to storm it. The French army was in sight, and in ten minutes a general engagement would have begun. In spite of all this, the coward at once hoisted a flag of truce and surrendered. The Europeans and sepoys ran in through the gate, and the former instantly turned the guns of the fort upon the French army. This halted, struck with abasement and anger, and Lally at once ordered it to retire upon the town. A week afterwards, six ships with 600 fresh troops from England arrived. The Mysoreans, who had brought food into Pondicherry, made many excursions in the country, but were sharply checked. They were unable to supply themselves with food, and none could be spared them from the stores in the magazine. Great distress set in among them, and this was heightened by the failure of a party with 2,000 bullocks with rice to enter the town. The party, escorted by the greater portion of the Mysorean horse from Pondicherry, was attacked and defeated, and 900 bullocks, laden with baggage, captured. Shortly afterwards, the rest of the Mysorean troops left Pondicherry and marched to attack Trinomany. Seeing that there was little fear of their returning to succor Pondicherry, the English now determined to complete the blockade of that place. In order to have any chance of reducing it by famine, it was necessary to obtain possession of the country within the hedge, which, with its redoubts, extended in the arc of a circle from the river Aranigopang to the sea. The space thus included contained an area of nearly seven square miles, affording pasture for the bullocks, of which there were sufficient to supply the troops and inhabitants for many months. Therefore, although the army was not yet strong enough to open trenches against the town, and indeed the siege artillery had not yet sailed from Madras, it was determined to get possession of the hedge and its redoubts. Before doing this, however, it was necessary to capture the fort of Orangobank. This was a difficult undertaking. The whole European force was but 2,000 strong, and if 800 of these were detached across the river to attack the fort, the main body would be scarcely a match for the enemy, should he march out against them. If, on the other hand, the whole army moved around to attack the fort, the enemy would be able to send out and fetch in a great convoy of provisions collected at Jinji. Mr. Pujo, therefore, requested Admiral Stevens to land the marines of the fleet. Although seeing that a large French fleet was expected, the admiral was unwilling to weaken his squadron. He complied with the request, seeing the urgency of the case, and 420 marines were landed. On the 2nd of September, two more men of war, the America and the Medway, arrived, raising the fleet before Pondicherry to 17 ships of the line. They convoyed several company ships who had brought with them the wing of a Highland regiment. The same evening, Coote ordered 400 men to march to invest in the fort of Orangopang. But Colonel Monson, second in command, was so strongly against the step that, at the last moment, he countermanded his orders. The change was fortunate, for Lally, who had heard from his spies of the English intention, moved his whole army out to attack, as he supposed, weakened force. At ten at night, 1,400 French infantry, 100 French horse, 900 sepoys marched out to attack the English, 
who had no suspicion of their intent. Two hundred marines and five hundred sepoys proceeded in two columns, marching from the Val d'Or Redoubt. One party turned to the right to attack the Tamarin Redoubt, which the English had erected on the Red Hill. Having taken this, they were to turn to the left and join the other column. This skirted the foot of the Red Hill to attack the redoubt erected on a hillock at its foot on the 18th July. 400 sepoys and a company of Portuguese were to take post at the junction of the Valdor and Yulgari avenues. The regiments of Lorraine and Lally were to attack the battery in this avenue. Lorraine's from the front, while Lally, marching outwards in the fields, was to fall on its right flank. The Indian battalion, with the Bourbon volunteers, 300 strong, were to march from the fort of Orangopang across the river to the villages under the fort of Valinor, and as soon as the fire became general, were to fall upon the right rear of the English encampment. At midnight, a rocket gave the signal, and the attack immediately commenced. The attack on the Tamarind Redoubt was repulsed, but the redoubt on the hillock was captured, and the guns spiked. At the entrenchment on the old Gary Road, the fight was fierce, and Colonel Coote himself brought down his troops to its defense. The attack was continued, but as, owing to some mistake, the column intended to fall upon the English rear had halted and did not arrive in time. The regiments of Lorraine and Lally drew off, and the whole force retired to the town. The ships arriving from England brought a commission appointing Monsoon to the rank of Colonel with a date prior to that of Colonel Coote, ordering him, however, not to assert his seniority so long as Coote became general, were to fall upon the right rear of the English encampment. At midnight, a rocket gave the signal, and the attack immediately commenced. The attack on the Tamaran Redoubt was repulsed, but the redoubt on the hillock was captured, and the guns spiked. At the entrenchment on the old Gary Road, the fight was fierce, and Colonel Coote himself brought down his troops to its defense. The attack was continued, but as, owing to some mistake, the column intended to fall upon the English rear had halted and did not arrive in time, the regiments of Lorraine and Lally drew off and the whole force retired to the town. The ships arriving from England brought a commission appointing Monson to the rank of colonel with a date prior to that of Colonel Coote, ordering him, however, not to assert his seniority so long as Coote remained at Madras. Coote, however, considered that it was intended that he should return to Bengal, and so, handing over the command to Monson, he went back to Madras. Colonel Monson at once prepared to attack the hedge and its redoubts, leaving sufficient guards for the camp. He advanced at midnight with his troops divided into two brigades, the one commanded by himself, the other by Major Smith. Major Smith's division was first to attack the enemy outside the hedge in the village of O'Garry, and, driving them hence, to carry the Velenor redoubt, while the main body were to make a sweep round the Red Hill and come down to the attack of the Valdor Redoubt. Smith, moving to the right of the old Gary Avenue, attacked that position on the left, and the advance led by Captain Myers carried by storm a redoubt in front of the village and sized four pieces of cannon. Major Smith, heading his grenadiers, then charged the village, tore down all obstacles, and carried the place. The day had begun to dawn when Colonel Monson approached the Valdor Redoubt, but at the last moment, making a mistake in their way, the head of the column halted. At this moment, the enemy perceived them and discharged a 24-pounder loaded with small shot into the column. Eleven men were killed and 26 wounded by this terrible discharge. Among the latter, Colonel Monson himself, his leg being broken. The grenadiers now rushed furiously to the attack, swarmed round the redoubt, and although several towns repulsed 
at last forced their way through the embrasures and captured their position. The defenders of the village of Old Gary had halted outside the Velenor Redoubt, but upon hearing the firing to their route, retreated hastily within it. Major Smith pressed them hotly with his brigade and followed so closely upon their heels that they did not stop to defend the position, but retreated to the town. Major Smith was soon joined by the Highlanders under Major Scott, who had forced a way through the heads between the two captured redoubts. Thus the whole line of the outer defense fell into the hands of the English, with the exception of the Arangopang redoubt on the left, which was held by the India Regiment. Major Gordon, who now took the command, placed a Bombay detachment of 350 men in the captured redoubts and encamped the whole of the force in the fields to the right of Ulgari. Major Smith advised that at least a thousand men should be left near at hand to succor the garrisons of the redoubts, which, being open at the rear, were liable to an attack. Major Gordon foolishly refused to follow his advice, and the same night the French attacked the redoubts. The Bombay troops, however, defended themselves with extreme bravery until assistance arrived. Three days later, the French evacuated and blew up the fort of Orangobang, which the English were preparing to attack, and the India regiment retired into the town, leaving, however, the usual guard in the Orangobang redoubt. Colonel Coote had scarcely arrived at Madras when he received a letter from Colonel Monson saying that he was likely to be incapacitated by his wound for some months and requesting that he would resume the command of the army. The authorities of Madras strongly urged Coote to return, representing the extreme importance of the struggle in which they were engaged. He consented and reached camp on the night of the 20th. He had once ordered the captured redoubts to be fortified to prevent the enemy again taking the offensive, and erected a strong work called the North Redoubt near the seashore and facing the Madras Redoubt. A few days later, on a party of Savoys approaching the Orangobang Redoubt, the occupants of that place were seized with a panic, abandoned the place, and went into town. The English had now possession of the whole of the outward defenses of Pondicherry, with the exception of the two redoubts by the seashore. A day or two later, Colonel Coote, Advancing along the sea beach as if with a view of merely making a reconnaissance, pushed on suddenly, entered the village called Blancherry, as it was principally inhabited by washerwomen, and attacked the Madras Redoubt. This was carried, but the same night the garrison sallied out again and fell upon a party of sepoys posted there. Ensign McMahon was killed, but the sepoys although driven out from the redoubt, bravely returned and again attacked the French, who, thinking that the sepoy must have received large reinforcements, fell back into the village, from which a day or two later they retired into town. The whole of the ground outside the fort, between the river Orangobang and the sea, was now in the hands of the English. The French still maintained their communications with the south, by the sandy line of coast. By this time, the attacks which the English from Trichinople and Madura had made upon Mysorians had compelled the latter to make peace and recall their army, which was still hovering in the neighborhood of Pondicherry. Charlie, who had been suffering from a slight attack of fever, had for some time been staying on board ship for change. In the road of Pondicherry, three of the French Indiamen, the Harmony, the Baleen, and the Campagne des Indies, were at anchor, near the edge of the surf, under the cover of a hundred guns mounted on the sea face of the fort. These ships were awaiting the stormy weather at the breaking of the monsoon, when it would be difficult for the English fleet to maintain their position 
off the town. They then intended to sail away to the south, fill up with provisions, and return to Pondicherry. Admiral Stevens, in order to prevent this contingency, which would have greatly delayed the reduction of the place, determined to cut them out. Charlie's health being much restored by the sea breezes, he asked leave of the admiral to accompany the expedition as a volunteer. On the evening of the 6th, six and twenty of the boats of the fleet, manned by four hundred sailors, were lowered and rowed to the Tiger, which was at anchor, within two miles of Pondicherry, the rest of the fleet lying some distance further away. When at midnight the cabin lights of the Hermione were extinguished, the expedition started. The boats moved in two divisions, one of which which was to attack the Hermione and the other the Baleen. The third vessel lay nearer in shore and was to be attacked if the others were captured. The night was a very dark one, and the boats of each division moved in line, with ropes stretched from boat to boat to ensure their keeping together in the right direction. Charlie was in one of the boats intended to attack the Hermine. Tim accompanied him, but the Admiral had refused permission for Hoysen to do so, as there were many more white volunteers for the service than boats would accommodate. They were within fifty yards of the Hermione before they were discovered, and a scattering musket fire was at once opened upon them. The crews gave a mighty cheer, and casting off the ropes, separated five, making for each side of the ship, while two rowed forward to cut the cable and her bows. The Compagnie des Indies opened fire upon the boats, but these were already alongside the ship, and the sailors swarmed over the sides at ten points. The combat was a short one. The seventy men on board fought bravely for a minute or two, but they were speedily driven below. The hatches were closed over them, and the cables being already cut, the mizzen topsail and the only sail bent was hoisted, and the boats, taking tow ropes, began to row her away from shore. The instant, however, that the cessation of fire informed the garrison in the ship was captured, a tremendous cannonade was opened by the guns of the fortress. The lightning was flashing vividly, and this enabled the gunners to direct their aim upon the ship. Over and over again she was struck. One shot destroyed the steering wheel, cut the tiller rope, killed two men who were steering. The single sail was not sufficient to assist in steering her, and the men in the boats rowed with such energy that the ropes continually snapped. The fire continued from the shore, doing considerable damage, and the men in the boats who could not see that the ships were moving through the water concluded that she was anchored by a concealed cable and anchor. The officer in command therefore called up the French from below, telling them he was about to fire the ship. They came on deck and took their places in the boats, which rowed back to the Tiger. Upon arriving there, Captain Dent, who commanded her, Stanley reduced the officer and said that unless the boats returned instantly and brought the Hermione out, he should send his old crew in their boats to fetch her. The division thereupon returned and met the ship half a mile offshore, the land wind having now sprung up. The baleen had been easily captured, and having several sails bent, she was brought out without difficulty. No attempt was made to capture the third vessel. The rains had now set in, but the English labored steadily at their batteries. The French were becoming pressed for provisions, and Lally turned the whole of the natives remaining in the town to the number of 1,400 men and women outside the fortification. On their arrival at the English line, they were refused permission to pass. As Colonel Coote did not wish to relieve the garrison of the consumption of food caused by them, they returned to the French lines and begged to be again received. But they were, by Lally's orders, fired upon and several killed. For seven days, the unhappy wrenches remained without food, save the roots they can gather in the field. Then Colonel Coote, seeing that Lally was inflexible, allowed them to pass. On the 10th of November, 
the batteries opened and every day added to the strength of the fire upon the town the fortifications however were strong and the siege progressed but slowly on the thirtieth of december a tremendous storm burst and committed the greatest havoc both at land and sea the newcastle man of war the queensborough frigate and the protector fire ship were driven ashore and dashed to pieces but the crews with the exception of seven were saved the duke of aquitaine the sunderland and the duke's storeship were sunk and eleven hundred sailors drowned most of the other ships were dismasted end of chapter twenty nine Chapter Thirty of With Clive in India. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gary Ullman. Home. The fire of the batteries increased, and by the thirteenth of January, the enemy's fire was completely silenced. The provisions in the town were wholly exhausted, and on the sixteenth, the town surrendered. And the next morning, the English took possession. Three days afterwards. Lally was embarked on a board ship to be taken a prisoner to Madras, and so much was he hated that the French officers and civilians assembled and hissed and hooted him, and had he not been protected by his guard, would have torn him to pieces. After his return to France, he was tried for having, by his conduct, caused the loss of the French possessions in India, and being found guilty of the offense, was beheaded. At Pondicherry, 2,072 military prisoners were taken, and 381 civilians, 500 cannon and 100 mortars, fit for service, and immense quantities of ammunition, arms, and military stores fell into the hands of the captors. Pondicherry was handed over to the company, who, a short time afterwards, entirely demolished both the fortress and town. This hard measure was the consequence of a letter which had been intercepted from the French governor to Lally, ordering him to raise Madras to the ground when it fell into his hands. Charlie, after the siege in which he had rendered great services, received from the company, at Colonel Coote's earnest recommendation, his promotion to the step of lieutenant colonel, while Peters was raised to that of a major. A fortnight after the fall of Pondicherry, they returned to Madras, and thence took the first ship for England. It was now just ten years since they had sailed, and in that time they had seen Madras and Calcutta rise from the rank of two trading stations in constant danger of destruction by their powerful neighbors to that of virtual capitals of great provinces. Not as yet, indeed, had they openly assumed the sovereignty of these territories, but Madras was, in fact, the absolute master of the broad tract of land extending from the foot of the mountains to the sea, from Cape Comorin to Bengal, while Calcutta was master of Bengal and Oressa, and her power already threatened to extend recommendation itself as far as Delhi. The conquest of these vast tracts of country had been achieved by mere handfuls of men and by a display of heroic valor and constantly scarce to be rivaled in the history of the world. The voyage was a pleasant one and was for the times quick, occupying only five months, but to the young men longing for home after so long an absence it seemed tedious in the extreme. Tim and Hussein were well content with their quiet, easy life after their long toils. They had nothing whatever to do except that they insisted upon waiting upon Charlie and Peters at meals. The ship carried a large number of sick and wounded officers and men, and as these gained health and strength, their life on board ship became livelier and more jovial. Singing and cards occupied the evening, while in the daytime they played quoits rings of rope being used for that purpose, and other gains with which passengers usually while away the monotony of long voyages. It was late in June when the Madras sailed up the Thames, and as soon as she came to anchor, the two officers and their followers landed. 
The din and bustle of the streets seemed almost as strange to Charlie as they had done when he came up a boy from Yarmouth. Hussein was astonished at the multitude of white people and inquired of Charlie why, when there were so many men, England had sent so few soldiers to fight for her in India, and for once Charlie was unable to give a satisfactory reply. It does seem strange, he said to Peters, that when such mighty interests were at stake, a body of even 10,000 troops could not have been raised and sent out. Such a force would have decided the struggle at once, and in three months the great possessions which have cost the company twelve years' war would have been at their feet. It would not have cost them more, indeed nothing like as much as it now has done, nor one tithe of the loss in life. However, somehow England always seems to make war in driblets. Charlie knew that his mother and Kate had for some years been residing at a house which their uncle had taken in the fashionable quarter of Chelsea. They looked in at the office, however, to see if Charlie's uncle was there, but found that he was not in the city, and indeed had now almost retired from business. They therefore took a coach, placed the small articles of luggage which they had brought with them from the ship, on the front seats, and then Hussein and Tim taking their places on the broad seat beside the driver, they entered the coach and drove to Chelsea. Charlie had invited Peters, who had no home of his own, to stay with him, at least for a while. Both were now rich men from their shares of the prize money of the various forts and towns in whose capture they had taken part. Although Charlie possessed some 20,000 pounds more than his friend, this being the amount of the presents he had received from the Raja of Ambor. Alighting from the carriage, Charlie ran up to the door and knocked, inquiring for Mrs. Marriott. He was shown into a room in which a lady, somewhat past middle age, and three younger ones were sitting. They looked up in surprise as the young men entered. Ten years had changed them almost beyond recognition one of the younger ones at once leaped to her feet and exclaimed, Charlie! His mother rose with a cry of joy, threw herself into his arms. After rapturously kissing her, he turned to the others. Their faces were changed, yet all seemed equally familiar to him. And in his delight, he equally embraced them all. Hello, he explained, when he freed himself from his arms. Why, there are three of you. What on earth am I doing? I have somebody's pardon to beg. And yet, although your faces are changed, they seem equally familiar to me. Which is it? But I need not ask, he said, as a cloud of color flowed over the face of one of the girls, while the others smiled mischievously. You are Katie, he said, and you are Lizzie. Certainly, and this is why... It's Ada. This is a surprise, indeed, but I shan't beg your pardon, Ada, for I kissed you at parting, and quite intended to do so when I met again, at least if you had offered no violent objection. How you are all grown and changed, while you, mother, look scarcely older than when I left you. But there, I have quite forgotten Peters. He has come home with me, and will stay till he has formed his own plans. He hurried out and brought in Peters, who, not wishing to be present at the family meeting, had been paying the coachman and seeing to the things being brought into the house. He was warmly received by the ladies as the friends and companion of Charlie in his adventures, scarcely a letter having been received from the latter without mention having been made of his comrade. In a minute or two, Mr. Tufton, who had been in the large garden behind the house, hurried in. He was now quite an old man, and under the influence of age, and the cheerful society of Mrs. Marion and her daughters, he had lost much of the pomposity which had before distinguished him. Ah, nephew, he said, when the happy party had sat down to dinner, their number increased by the arrival of Mrs. Haynes, who had a house close by. Wilful lads will go their own way. I wanted to make a rich merchant of you, and you have made of yourself a famous soldier. But you've not done badly for yourself. After all, for you have in your letters often talked about prize money. 
Yes, Uncle, I have earned in my way close upon a hundred thousand pounds, and I certainly shouldn't have made that if I had stuck to the office at Madras. Even with the aid of the capital you offered to lend me to trade with on my own account. There was a general exclamation of surprise and pleasure at the mention of the sum although this amount was small in comparison to that which money acquired in those days in india and you're not thinking of going back again charlie his mother said anxiously there can be no longer any reason for your exposing yourself to that horrible climate and that constant fighting the climate is not so bad mother and the danger and excitement of a soldier's life there at present rendered it very fascinating but i have done with it. Peters and I intend, on the expiration of our leave, to resign our commissions in the company's service and to settle down under our own vines and fig trees. Tim has already elected himself to the post of my butler, and Hussein intends to be my valet and body servant. Immediately after their arrival, Charlie had brought in his faithful followers and introduced them to the ladies, who, having often heard of their devotion and faithful services, had received them with a kindness and cordiality which had delighted them. Lizzie, whose appearance at home had been unexpected by Charlie, for her husband was a landed gentleman at Seven Oaks in Kent, was, it appeared, paying a visit of a week to her mother and her three children, two boys and a little girl, were duly brought down to be shown to and admired by their Uncle Charles. And how is it you haven't married, Katie? With such a pretty face as yours, it is scandalous that the men have allowed you to reach the mature age of twenty-two unmarried. It is the fault of the hussy herself, Mr. Tufton said. It is not from want of office, for she has had a dozen, and among them some of the nobility at court, for it is well known that John Tufton's niece will have a dowry such as many of the nobles cannot give to their daughters. This is too bad, Kate, Charlie said, laughing. What excuse have you to make for yourself for remaining single with all these advantages of face and fortune? Simply that I didn't like any of them, Katie said. The beau of the present day are contemptible. I would as soon think of marrying a wax doll. When I do marry, that is, if ever I do, it shall be a man and not a mere tailor's dummy. You are pert, miss, her uncle said. Do what I will, Charlie. I cannot teach the hussy to order her tongue. Katie's quite right, uncle, Charlie laughed, and I must make it my duty to find a man who will suit her taste though according to your account of her, he will find it a hard task to keep such a Xanthippe in order. Katie tossed her head. He better not try, she said saucily, or will be worse fam. Two days later, Charlie's elder sister returned with her family to her house at Seven Oaks, where Charlie promised before long to pay her a visit. After she had gone, Charlie and Peters with Katie made a series of excursions to all the points of interest around London, and on these occasions, Ader usually accompanied them. The natural consequences follow. Charlie had for years been the hero of Ada's thoughts, while Katie had heard so frequently of Peters that she was from the first to dispose to regard him in the most favorable light. Before the end of two months, both couples were engaged, and as both the young officers possessed ample means and the ladies were heiresses, there was no obstacle to an early union. The wedding took place a month later, and Tim was, in the exorbitance of his delight, hilariously drunk for the first and only time during his service with Charlie. Both gentlemen bought estates in the country, and later took their seats in Parliament, where they vigorously defended their former commander, Lord Clive, in the assaults which were made upon him. Tim married seven or eight years after his master, and settled down in a nice little house upon the estate. Although henceforth he did no work whatever, he insisted to the end of his life that he was still in Colonel Marriott's service. 
Hussan, to the great amusement of his master and mistress, followed Tim's example. The pretty cook of Charlie's establishment made no objection to his swarthy you. Charlie built a snug cottage for them close to the house where they took up their residence. But Hosan, though a happy father of a large family, continued to the end of a long life to discharge the duties of valet to his master. Both he and Tim were immense favorites with the children of Charlie and Peters, who were never tired of listening to their tales of the exploits of their fathers when with Clive in India. End of chapter 30 Recording by Gary Ullman End of With Clive in India or The Beginnings of an Empire by G. A. Henty